Yes, Harriet Mikwa is uh, is the is the head of my office. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, yes. Um, but um, um, we're trying to have as many gadgets as possible in the in the boardroom. So, so that we can uh, make sure that we. Yeah. Oh, I work for. Problem, but under my short notice. Can other colleagues can mute? Can can um Shash Africa? Can you mute yourself, please? Good morning, uh, Che. Uh, uh, how are you, Advocate Kosana? I'm che, I'm fine, Che. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I last saw you at the JSC. Yes, yeah, no, it was quite interesting. And yeah, we've <laughs> learned so much this time. It was yes. for the first time, yes. <laughs> no, that's great. Yes, Che. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Che. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, uh, we are left with two minutes before we start. Uh, DM. Good morning, members of the portfolio committee. Good morning, and everybody. Good morning, chair. Good morning. Chair. Morning, morning, chair and as well. Part, who are you? Uh, how are you, morning. dear? Morning. 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 We are left with two minutes. Less than two minutes. You can finish your tea or coffee. Then we can start. I hope the slides are ready. Morning, Chairperson. Uh, morning, morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair. Uh, good morning, colleagues. I just want Uh, once again, uh, good morning to everybody who is on the platform and those who are watching us at home. Uh, welcome, Deputy Minister and uh, DJ and your team. Uh, we will now hand over to the Deputy Minister uh, to lead the delegation from the Department of Justice and Correctional Services on their 2021-2022 annual performance plans and their budget. Uh, over to you, DM. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Chair. Um, good morning to to everybody, um, to all members of the committee. Chair, just maybe the NDPP, uh, as you probably heard, started saying something and then got got frozen. So I'm, I don't think she's. I think she's gone off the platform. But maybe when she comes back, she can say what she wanted to say um, because she seemed to be wanting to say something up up, up front um, as a preliminary issue. 
But uh, look, this is for the department to present the, the annual performance plan and the strategic plan. Um, so I'll be handing over to, to the DG. Oh, oh, I see there is the NDPP um, through you, Chair. I don't know if we can ask her what she wanted to say before I, I start in case it's, it's something preliminary to this meeting. Okay, thank you, NDPP. No, thank you, Chair. We're still uh, trying to get our data connection because we are slipping in and out of this. But apart from that, uh, I'm in your hands, Chair. Okay. Should the department finish earlier? Uh, uh, since you are around, we can start connecting you immediately. If, if it's before two, if they finish on time. I think she's frozen again. I think she's frozen again, yeah. Um, anyway, Chair, thanks. Thanks very much. I'd be handing it over to the DG, um, Advocate uh, Doc Mashabane. Um, just to say that he started um, his term on the 1st of, of March, which was sort of right at the time when the APP and strategic plan had to be finalized. Uh, so, and, and obviously needed to make an input. So uh, to some extent, there was a bit of a, a rush uh, this time. And um, there may be some issues in the APP and strategic plan that are uh, not well that 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 um, need to be relooked at, but uh, let me hand over through you, Chair, to to the DG uh, and to um, ask him to introduce the delegation from the department and then to start with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, DJ. Chairperson, uh, good morning. We have an echo here. I'm sorry, Tichi. You might have um, connected, as you've indicated, you might have um, a number of gadgets in the same room. So can the other gadgets switch off their volume? Yes, yes, it has been switched off. We were trying to have as many gadgets as possible to avoid any possible cut. But I was saying thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services, and Honorable Members of the Committee. Uh, we're grateful to the Deputy Minister who's here providing us uh, political support and guidance. It is a great honor for me to be given this opportunity to address the, this August Committee on the Performance Plan of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development for the year 2021-2022. As the DM has already indicated, I assume duty as the sixth director general of the department post 1994 on the 1st of March, 2021. And I'm grateful to the executive of the Republic, the minister, the deputy minister for the confidence on me and the, appoint and the appointment as the administrative head of the department. I'm honored to lead a team of experienced, skilled and highly talented senior management. And I'm grateful to the directors, acting directors general who held the fort before my appointment, in particular, Advocate J. Bisco Sana and Kalei Pillay, who led the administrative arm of the department during a challenging time in our nation's history due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The senior management of the department went on the retreat in October 2020 after a meeting with the portfolio committee to develop a turnaround plan in order to improve the performance of the department. After my appointment, we organized a strategic planning session in order to refine the strategic plan and the APP of the department. We emerged from the two and a half days of the strategic planning session with a clear, bold and ambitious strategy and APP. We are convinced that the plan we have, we have devised in the form of an APP 2021-2022 captures all the elements of a turnaround plan that will improve the performance of the department and place it on a trajectory, on a trajectory to an outstanding performance. Our performance in the first six months of 2020-2021 was in the low 50s, but in the last six months, ending 31st of March, the performance increased to above 60%. This clearly demonstrated that the unabated regression and downward spiral has been halted 
We are grateful to the guidance and the chastisement we received from this committee. We are convinced that the department is turning the corner and should be out of the woods by the end of the first six months of the performance cycle. Since my appointment, I've met with all the senior managers, middle management, and lower management of the department, who are all committed to the endeavors to turn around the department. Through these engagements, I've come face to face with the great challenges facing the department, but they are, in, they are not insurmountable. With the support of the minister, the deputy minister, and indeed the entire senior management of the department, we will continue with our endeavors to make sure that the department becomes one of the best performing departments in government. Chair, our performance, annual performance plan that we are presenting to this committee today comes at the backdrop of the celebration and the observation of the 25th anniversary since the adoption of our constitution. As honorable chair and honorable members are aware, tomorrow the 8th of May marks exactly 25 years since our world-renowned constitution was adopted by the Constitutional Assembly. In this respect, as the senior management of the department, we have agreed amongst ourselves that the 25th anniversary will serve as an inspiration for us and as a department to try and reclaim the center stage, stage as a very critical and important department in the micromanagement of the entire state. Part of what we have done in the APP, our APP is not just a normal APP, but it captures all the elements and hallmarks of an attempt to turn around the department. We have emerged from the strategic planning session with 10 bold and clearly identified strategic outcomes, which my colleagues, the head of the strategy of the department will present to you. Out of those, we have devised a new, I mean, in the main focused on the two new strategic outcomes, one being the modernization of the department, though previously it was in the APP, but this time it has been elevated and clearly captured to make sure that our focus is on the modernization of the justice services. So we have committed ourselves to the modernization of all the justice services across the different uh, strategic outcomes. The second outcome that we have devised, which will, is prominently reflected as well, is public education around the constitution and all the services of the department. And all of that then makes the 10 strategic outcomes of the department. And as you will see, these 10 strategic outcomes, uh, on top amongst them, is the modernization and increasing access to justice services. So we are committed to modernizing the services of the department. And the second of the 10 is our commitment to building and deepening constitutionalism, respect for human rights and the rule of law. And third, the review of all the colonial and apartheid era legislation with the aim of aligning all these legislations with the constitution. And fourth, which is public education, the implementation of the national action plan the implementation of the National Action Plan to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerances in order to advance respect for human rights and the rule of law. And we'll also, part amongst those, is the addressing of the scourge of the GBV and femicide. Most importantly, again, is the transformation of the state legal services with the rapid implementation of the State Attorney's Amendment Act of 2014 which later my colleague, the Solicitor General, will speak to some of the developments in that respect. But we are also committed to the transformation of the legal profession, which is an important work that the department does through the state legal services. We have also committed in the APP to build a capable, professional, and ethical organization. So those are some of the salient points that you will see throughout our APP. There are a few steps that we have committed to take Chairperson in the first three months of the performance year, which is the first quarter. One is the finalization of the review of the macro structure of the department, which had not been reviewed in the more than five years as required by the GPSA. We have committed to finalize that so that we can immediately move into placement of senior managers. Key to that as well, 
is our commitment to stabilize senior management by filling the key strategic positions. We have given ourselves clear deadlines that by the end of June, we must be done with the process of filling of the key strategic vacancies. As this portfolio committee had identified in its previous meeting with the department, that uh, the destabilization of senior management had a direct impact on the performance of the department. Over and above that, we have taken into account the need to build our human resource. And in this regard, we have developed a strategy which will be implemented as well to reposition the Justice College to ensure that we build the much required skills for the cadership that must lead the Department of Justice. We will be conducting a skills audit to identify the gaps and the interventions that will be required to improve our performance. But over and above that as well, we have committed ourselves for the first three months to conduct a culture and, and climate survey in the department to get a sense of what do the employees of this department think about the department and all the challenges that they may be facing with respect to performance of the department. So with those few words, Chair, I would like to invite my colleague, Terence Rasroke, who is the head of our strategy to take us through this APP, in particular, the 10 strategic outcomes. Chair, you will note that uh, we have developed 77 indicators for the 10 strategic outcomes. I'm, I'm no, I know that uh, from the previous year, the indicators were slightly more than that. We have not dropped anything from last year. What we have done, we have realigned in cases where one indicator was unnecessarily broken into five using the SMART principle. We have tried to integrate them into a crisp and, and concise uh, indicators. So therefore, we, we didn't lose anything from last year, but we're continuing to build from last year with an improved and SMART driven APP. Chair, with your permission, I have the honor to invite Mr. Rasroke to take this portfolio committee through the APP of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. I thank you. Thank you very much. May Mr. Rasroke proceed. Chair, if I may, my apologies for interrupting, um, but we seem to be getting a message um, that the NPA should be here at 2 p.m. We're not sure. We may have missed you if that was indeed the case. If you could please advise what the position is, Chair, we'd appreciate that. Okay. The time was set for 2 p.m., but I said that since you are around, um, if we finish earlier, uh, it would not hurt if you can just start with yourselves. All right, thank, thank you, Chair. So we'll be on standby. Yes, yeah, so that uh, because uh, you are part of the Justice Department in a way, um, so it would not hurt you to listen uh, so that you understand where they come from. Um, but immediately if we are done with them, then we will just invite you. Provided sure. everybody is around. But if it's not around, then we'll speak to the two people. Thank you, Chair. We'll at least make sure that some of our people are online um, and, and will advise us accordingly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I think we have been able to give justice a cover uh, as they are struggling to connect. So we're busy with something else. Mr. Soroka? DJ? Yeah, yes, yeah, Chair, yes, can, yeah, can, yeah, can yeah, you hear yeah, Mr. Rasaroka? Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, 
remote connected. Yes, I'll I'll, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll my mic. Um, Honorable Chairperson, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm proceeding. I was saying, uh, Honorable Chairperson and members of the committee, and the presentation is focused on number of parts, but for the purpose of this engagement, I will straight go to part C, which is measuring performance. And as I was saying that DG in his introduction has actually uh, captured our strategic focus for the current financial year. So if we go to, to slide number, that is part B, sorry, part C of the slide in terms of the performance or measuring performance. Um, the outcome that the DG was talking about that we have committed to modernize and digitize our services as justice department. The intention here at Jefferson is to increase access to our services, which is a priority that minister has actually uh, been um, talking about since his, his deployment to the department. The second issue is to roll out the solutions for those services on our internet pl uh, platform, as well as ensuring that our services are provided online so that we increase the quality of our services. So we have committed to achieve this outcome through a number of uh, indicators. The first one being maintenance services uh, available on the department portal by the 30th of December. Um, also the trust services that must be available on our portal by the 30th, as well as disease estate services available on the departmental portal by the 30th of, of, of September, 2021. And in terms of the issues around uh, accessibility via our digital channels, we are saying that in this current financial year, Chairperson, the protection order services must be available on our internet portal by the 31st of March. 2022, uh, expungement of criminal record services must be available or accessible via digital platforms by the 1st of March of this current financial year. The NRSO integration with SAPS for NRSO removal application will be available by the 31st of, of March, 2022. Uh, we are also saying that 45 sites will be rolled out with the court uh, audio visual solutions and 400 sites uh, where cashless court uh, solution through point of sale device will be deployed. In terms of the outcome number two, the purpose of this outcome, Chairperson, is to ensure that we improve our organizational capability as well as good governance. So we have identified that we need to improve the department's audit outcomes. So we have identified interventions that will would do, that will be uh, that will assist us to achieve this, out, uh, this outcome. And we have also identified about three um, APPs, I mean, sorry, three indicators that will assist us to achieve this outcome. Uh, also we've identified the skills gap as one of the critical areas that we need to focus on so that we can be able to build capacity within the department. Now, in terms of this, um, we have put together a number of indicators around uh, making sure that we transform our organizational capacity. One, Chairperson, we are planning to uh, ensure that 10% of the vacant positions at SMS level is maintained and 50% of women occupying senior management positions is achieved. Uh, six initiatives to complete and implement reconfigured macrostructure is what we agreed upon in terms of uh, the current financial year. And we are also intending to train 3,000 uh, officials in line with the work skills, uh, workplace skills plan through our Justice College and our HRD unit. In terms of issues of uh, corruption cases, we are saying that 70% of the reported corruption cases must be investigated uh, for officials and they have to be finalized in the current financial year and 60% of disciplinary hearing must be finalized within uh, 90 days. 60% of uh, grievances must be resolved within uh, 90 days. And 45% um, uh, I mean 45 disciplinary hearings for misconduct backlog uh, cases must be finalized in the current financial year. 
Uh, in terms of um, number of grievance uh, backlog resolved within 90 days, we have identified uh, 50 of them that must be dealt with, and 50% of significant findings must be resolved in the current financial year. 70% of fruitless and wasteful expenditure must be reduced. 55% of irregular expenditure also must be reduced in the current financial year. In terms of the undisputed, undisputed and valid invoices paid within 30 days from the date of receipt, we are saying this financial year, we need 100% of those to be uh, processed. And we're also saying chairperson that 40% of the percentage of the rent value of discretionary procurement uh, allocated to ex exempted macro micro enterprises um, and qualifying SMEs, SQEs, uh, will be uh, allocated 40% of that, as well as 10% of the rent value of discretionary procurement allocated to women. Um, in terms of the funding model for the implementation of NEP, we are planning to ensure that the executive authority approves by the 31st of March, 2022, the funding model. And we are also planning that 85% of expungements must be finalized within three months since receipt of complete application. Uh, in terms of the outcome number three, Chairperson, this is a new outcome that um, we have put in place and it's actually focusing on the implementation of the departmental communication strategy. Uh, it focuses majority on awareness uh, campaigns uh, and indicators that will, all, that will be monitored under our communications unit. And these indicators are the following. In the current financial year, we are saying that we will have to ensure that we conduct 145 public education activities on the 25th anniversary of the Constitution and constitutional rights education. And we're also planning that 200 of public education activities must be conducted on justice services, meaning criminal, civil, family law services. And we're also planning that four uh, trafficking in persons awareness campaigns will be conducted in the current financial year. In terms of the number of sustained and visible anti-xenophobia campaigns conducted in collaboration with other departments and role players, we're targeting six of them in the current financial year. And we're also targeting that nine uh, awareness sessions on LGBTIQ rights be conducted in the current financial year. We're also planning, Chairperson, that we need to develop a report on the implementation of the programs to celebrate the 25th and 25th year, 25 years anniversary of the constitution that might be submitted to the minister for approval in the current financial year. So that is in essence what is uh, predominantly activities and indicators that will assist us to achieve uh, program one of our strategic and uh, annual performance plan. Now program two, uh, Chairperson, that is court services. The, the, in, the purpose of this program two in terms of outcome four is to ensure that we increase access to justice. And for us to, to increase this access to justice, we have identified key areas that we need to focus on. The first one, Chairperson, is the fight against gender-based violence. So as a department, we'll implement interventions that will address the scourge of GBV, GBVF against women and children. And we'll also play a role in implementation of the 2019 Presidential Summit Declaration on gender-based violence and femicide and its national strategic plan. So for us to do this, we've identified a number of uh, uh, indicators. First being that in the current financial year, we'll have a phase four functional femicide watch dashboard which, with available data that must be finalized. And we also want to decrease uh, the percentage of criminal cases that are postponed due to unavailability of court administration to less than 0.3%. Uh, in terms of the child justice preliminary inquiries that must be finalized within 90 days after the, day, the date of first appearance, we're targeting 90% of that and 65% of the NR, NRS old clearance certificate issues within uh, 10 days. We're also saying that we want to ensure that number of additional courts 
that are designated in terms of section 55 capital letter A of the criminal law, sexual offenses and related matters amendment act 2007 of sexual uh, offenses. We're targeting to ensure that we, uh, we make sure that we designate 100 of those courts in the current financial year. Uh, we're also chairperson targeting that 75% of courts compliant with the strategy on universal access for persons with uh, disabilities, as well as 80% 80, 80 of family advocate litigation matters that must be finalized within 12 months from the date of opening the matter, and 80% of family advocate non-litigation matters that must be finalized within six months from the date of opening the matter. Uh, we're also targeting chairperson 80% of maintenance matters that must be finalized within 90 days from the date of proper service process, as well as ensuring that we have a social compact discussion document that must be submitted to cabinet by the end of, the, uh, by the end of December uh, 2021. We're also targeting chairperson that uh, six branch courts must be converted into full court services as well as the case backlog reduction uh, framework must be adopted by 31st of March, 2022. In terms of maintenance, uh, we are saying that maintenance improvement framework submitted to the minister for approval by the 31st of March, 2022. Now, this uh, program also chairperson is supporting outcome number 10, which is the outcome that is focusing on crime and corruption that must be reduced through effective prosecution. So the fight against crime and corruption chairperson will continue to be on the departmental radar over the midterm period. Now in enhancing the fight against corruption, we as a department has an indicator that deals with the establishment of the special, uh, specialized commercial crimes court. So we have identified targets, uh, so we have identified targets to establish two specialized commercial crime courts during this current financial year. And we'll also develop a, pay, a position paper on the review of the existing anti-corruption legislation and institutional arrangement. Now, Chairperson, in terms of our targets for the current financial year that supports that, uh, this outcome, as I said, we have identified two um, dedicated specialized commercial courts to be established in the five provinces, as well as um, and ensuring that the position paper that must be signed by submitted to the minister by the end of the financial year. Now, in terms of the program three, which is our state legal services, this program is actually supporting outcome number five. Uh, and part of outcome number five is improving master's uh, services. And the indicators under this outcomes are improving and transforming the master's services. So we've identified a number of indicators that talks to this. The first one, uh, Chairperson, is that by this current financial year, we want to achieve 75% of liquidation and distribution accounts in large estates that are more than 250,000. That must be examined within 15 days from receipt of all required documents. We're also targeting 75% of letters of appointment issued in deceased estates within 15 days from receipt of all required documents. And we're also targeting 80% of beneficiaries in receipt of services within 40 days from the receipt of all required uh, documents that is in or under guardians fund. Uh, Chairperson, we're also saying that 75% 75, 75 of certificates of appointments must be issued in all bankruptcy matters within 10, 10 days from receipt of all required documents and also 75% of liquidation and distribution accounts in bankruptcy matters that must be examined within 15 days from receipt of all required documents. And lastly, Chairperson, the 70% that we want to achieve of letters of authority that must be issued in trust within 14 days from receipt of all required documents. Or the last one is 75% uh, of letters of appointment issued in curatorship estates within 15 days from receipt of all required documents. Now, the next pro, uh, outcome chairperson is outcome number six, which is the colonial stroke apart eight era justice related legislative reviewed and replaced. Uh, that is a legislation. So we are saying chairperson that we, 
the review and the replacement of the colonial and apartheid era justice related legislation is one of our priority for this strategic plan circle. So this uh, apartheid and colonial justice related legislation will be reviewed and replaced with the aim of align them, aligning them with the constitution of the Republic. So the measure of this outcome is to have less than 2% of legislative instruments that is developed that failed to withstand constitutional court challenges. And only pieces of legislation that are not in sync with this constitution must be reviewed and replaced. So to show commitment to this chairperson, we've included in our APP an indicator that deals with number of apartheid and colonial era justice related legislation that is submitted to the minister for repeal and replace, replacement. But also over the MTF period, we have about 12 justice related apartheid and colonial era pieces of legislation that will be considered for repeal or replacement. For example, the Trespass Act, the Righteous Assemblies Act, and the Prevention of Public Violence and Intimidation Act. Now, in terms of the actual APP and the time frames, we are saying that we want to ensure that four bills and regulations must be submitted to the minister for approval in the current financial year, and also four colonial apartheid era justice related legislation must be approved by the minister for submission to cabinet. We are also planning and targeting 30% of rules of court submitted to the board and approval, as well as 12 research papers that must be submitted to the commission for approval. <clears throat> Now, in terms of our outcome number seven, that is the transformed legal state services, uh, we are saying as a department chairperson that the transformation of the state legal services is prioritized through the implementation of the State Attorney Amendment Act 2014, Act number 13 of 2014. Now, the focus on this one is the finalization of policies that will culminate in lowering of cost of litigation and the building of capacity as well as establishing well-run state attorney's offices. So during this current financial year, Chairperson, we are planning to ensure that three policies will be, de be developed and submitted to cabinet in September in the current financial year, while the two remaining policies will be completed and submitted to cabinet for investment before the end of the financial year. So at a strategic level, we're planning to achieve 5% annual reduction in state legal uh, liabilities. So other indicators that are aimed to achieving this are going to be the following, Chairperson. Um, we are saying that in the current financial year, we will have two briefing and outsourcing of legal work, initiating, defending, and opposing of matters. Also, we are saying that we will have to ensure that we develop policy on the management of state litigation contingent liabilities and submit that to the minister for approval. We're also saying Chairperson, 50% of litigation cases must be settled in the current financial year. 70% of legal opinions that must be finalized within 30 days from the date of receipt of the instruction, as well as 70% of suggested bills and subordinate legislation must be finalized within 30 days from the date of receipt of the instruction. Uh, in terms of the outcome aid, Chairperson, that is the outcome that is aimed at transforming the legal profession. So we are saying that the transformation of the legal profession is our priority for this strategic planning cycle. And at a strategic level, Chair, we are saying that we want to achieve 10% of the annual increase of previously disadvantaged individuals, legal practitioners, conferred as senior counsels, as well as increasing the number of previously disadvantaged practitioners that are briefed by 5% on an annual basis. So we have identified specific indicators that talks to this. The first one is that we are targeting in the current financial year, 82% of value of briefs that must be allocated to the PDI legal practitioners, 29% of value of briefs that must be allocated to the female legal practitioners, and 41% of briefs allocated to female legal practitioners. Um, in terms of issues around the policy guideline, we are saying that in the current financial year, Honorable Chairperson, that will develop a policy guideline on the confer conferral of the senior council status, and that must be submitted to the president by 31st of um, March, 2022, as well as the policy framework that must be submitted to the minister 
for his consideration by 31st of March, 2022. Now, the second last outcome, um, Honorable Chairperson, it's on the advancement of constitutionalism, human rights, and the rule of law. We, as a department, we held our strategic planning session as the Deputy Minister has outlined in his opening remarks about the session that we had on the 13th to the 15th of March after the appointment of the DG. We themed our strategic planning session celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Constitution to advance constitutionalism, human rights, and the rule of law. And this was the beginning, uh, Chairperson, of putting uh, the adv advancements of the constitutionalism and human rights of the law on the radar of the department. So given the scourge of racism, xenophobia, and general intolerances in the country, the effective implementation of NAP will in turn contribute to us building a more equal and just society with a particular focus on vulnerable, marginalized, and other priority groups, thus advancing constitutionalism, human rights, and the rule of law. We have identified three, three indicators, Chairperson, that talks to this aspect. The first one is that we want to, um, Honorable Chairperson, ensure that we develop a rapid uh, response mechanisms, and that must be established by the 31st of March of the current financial year. Also, we are planning to ensure that there are data sets that we identify for the development of the virtual repository by the end of the financial year. And we are also planning to have one country report submitted to DECO for onward submission to treaty bodies. And 80% of valid requests for extradition and mutual legal assistance in criminal matters processed and submitted to the Director General within 20 days from the date of receipt, as well as uh, the framework approved and implemented. And in, in addition, uh, Honorable Chairperson, the plan is to increase the number of departments and entities from nine to 11 that are connected to the transversal hub and are able to exchange information amongst themselves. So for us to achieve this, Honorable Chairperson, we have identified indicators that will assist us to achieve this outcome. Uh, the first one is to ensure that by the end of the financial year, we have I, four IJS governance framework structures that are approved by the 31st of March. And we're also planning that um, in the current financial year, we want to connect uh, one government department, that is the remaining one, because the previous eight were done in the previous financial year, that must be connected to a transversal platform and exchange information electronically. Also, Honorable Chairperson, we were planning to ensure that the seven of the IJS DPMA assessment report recommendation is implemented. Uh, I will hand over, Honorable Chairperson, to my colleague, who will just speak to the issues around the risks. Thank you. Chairperson, with your permission, I will introduce Mr. Venile Mashangu, who is the Chief Risk Officer of the Department, to take us through the, the apex uh, risk of the Department and the mitigating uh, factors that are being uh, implemented. Mr. Mashangu, you, you have the floor, sir. Mr. Mashangu, if you could please unmute yourself. Can someone call me? Uh, hello, hello, thank you, DG. Uh, I am here. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Please proceed. Okay. Yes, DG. Uh, thanks, Chairperson. Uh, in line with the outcomes, come again. Can you see your picture? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had a, a network problem in, in the house, and uh, we don't have electricity in the house. So I decided to come in, connect from the car because the, uh, the view or the network is clear here. So okay. in line with outcomes that has already been indicated, the department has identified 10 risks that are in line or talking to the outcomes of the department. 
One is aging and in, uh, unstable ICT infrastructure resulting in disruption of systems. Uh, here, as the department, we are talking modernization. Now, the modernization revolves around ICT. The ICT is a sector for the modernization to be, to be realized. So until such time, our ICT is in good state, we're going to have difficulties. So we have identified that as a risk, which we have a plan in place to go in as far as uh, making the situation better so that modernization can be uh, 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 realized. Second one, poor contract management leading to uh, irregular expenditure. Uh, in most of the time, the department was found in a position whereby contracts come to expire and where, whereas the new process of coming up with a new contract have not started, resulting into extension of the contracts uh, 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 and then coming to the irregular expenditure. So we have uh, made uh, some uh, uh, plans, uh, put mitigation plans in place to ensure that at least six months or more before any contract expires in the department, the process of renewing the contract is kick-started. Uh, three, non-compliance departmental uh, supply chain management policies and procedures in relation to procuring of legal services. Uh, number four, inadequate management of people. The corporate services, through corporate services, the department is going to come up with a, or is going to uh, put in place, implement the plan that is there in terms of HR uh, a plan, the, the HR development plan. Number six, chairperson, it's, uh, no, number five, I beg my pardon. Number five is a compromise physical and inf uh, information security. We also have a plan that we have put in place as a department to uh, better the space. Number six, delays in, in uh, delivering infrastructure projects. We also have got a challenge because we've got a dependence element here. We work in partnership with the uh, TPW. We are not 100% in control of all the projects that we need to deliver in, 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 in the department. However, we are doing uh, our best and our putting uh, measures in place as a department to ensure that our part in this space is uh, attended to. Uh, number seven, inadequate disclosure processes of contingency liabilities in state attorneys. Uh, I, 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 I'm, 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 I think if the Solicitor General can be given some space in this uh, uh, sitting, we'll talk more about the issues around the, uh, uh, the contingency and uh, state uh, attorney's liabilities. Number eight, inability to implement COVID-19 risk adjusted plan for the effect management of COVID-19 resurgence. The department uh, has got a, a JOSC uh, committee that manage this process. We are now have identified a team as a department to deploy in the regions to all our um, service points to ensure that uh, for the looming uh, COVID-19 uh, coming, the third wave coming, the, our service points are close to be 100% compliant with the, uh, the, 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 the controls in line with COVID-19. Uh, the last one, Chairperson, is the vacancy in key positions in the department. I think earlier on in his opening remarks, the DG touched on the issue. So it's one of our risks. However, through corporate services, uh, HR component, the department has uh, moved uh, some uh, steps in line to attend to the key positions areas in terms of recruitment. recruitment. Uh, we are at a satisfactory level in the, the DG has indicated in this first quarter, we should uh, at least move to a, a, a situation or a level whereby this will be a, a less of a concern uh, for us as a department. Thank you, Chairperson, and thanks, colleagues.
Thank you. Jefferson, with your permission again, I would like to invite uh, the acting chief financial officer to take us through the budget resources of the department. And is represented by Mr. Johan Johnson. Okay. Mr. Johan Johnson, if you can, if you can hear us, uh, please. So, so, chair, so, chair, there is another JJ in the department. There is a JJ called uh, Johan Johnson. <laughs> Good morning, colleagues, honorable members. This is Joanne Johnson speaking. I'm the Chief Director of Finance. Um, um, I'm assisting the Chief Financial Officer on the budget presentation. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Um, I'll first see if I can quickly just zoom in the presentation. Honourable members, uh, you might have received um, two presentations, um, but the, basically the, 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 the format is the same. Um, I would just want to highlight uh, to you um, in some major features of our budget presentation. Um, when we planned and started planning for this new medium term, uh, we had a particular budget as a baseline. And then we were confronted uh, with, um, with further budget cuts. And those budget cuts surely will affect our planning going forward. For us, honorable members, uh, when we did our planning, we our baseline expectations was around about 23 billion. And now we can confirm after the treasury budget cuts that our growth on average is between one and 2%. Limited capacity, uh, budgetary capacity, and it will challenge us over the medium term to, to see how we can optimize I mean, you know, the, the, this budget. And I will reflect to me to you uh, the impact on our operational budget, uh, the impact on our, I mean, our personnel budget, but also honorable members, uh, the impact on the, in, I mean, on the entities uh, that is part of the justice vote, Legal Aid South Africa, the Human Rights Commission. So the basic point is, um, you know, whilst, uh, there is cost pressures in excess of five or six percent in certain I mean, I mean, areas. Justice now has a you know, budget for 2021, um, you know, of around about 21.5 billion, and it will in essence remain in the 21 billion rand range for the next three years. The important question is when the portfolio committee will have a look at our appropriation and, and need to pronounce on our appropriation is to look at, you know, we were at 23 billion rand as a baseline. And then we've had some, uh, you know, additional money that will give me that it came in, that will give us some capacity. But then also there has been the massive budget cuts. Now, if the, the, the positive part of this budget allocation is that for the information regulator, uh, for the next uh, three years, an additional 105 million rand is, is, is put in, or should be allocated for expansion of capacity. So 30 million rand, 35 million, and 40 million over the next three years. <clears throat> The big challenge for us as we plan all these outcomes and, and, and deliverables is the budget cuts. Now for us, um, you know, we want to confirm to you, you know, that as a department, we will plan within the context of the budget cuts. 
Now, do we just want to confirm that over the next three years, over 7 billion rand um, you know, budget reductions will be effected. 2.3 in the first year, the current financial year, 2.3 billion, 3.1 billion in 2022, 2023, and another 2.3 billion rand over in 2023. Now, for us, the big challenge is, I mean, if we, if we can primarily look I mean, in the, in the current financial year, the first year of this MTF cycle, we are having across our entities and divisions a 1.6 billion rand budget cut on compensation of employees. And it, I mean, it affects various programs, administration, court services, state legal services, national prosecuting authority, and even the magistrate's salaries. Now, 1.6 billion is a, will have a substantial impact. I mean, even in our court service environment, 634 million rand um, you know, budget reduction. In essence, uh, honorable members, uh, we are currently the space where we can only fund the warm bodies. Furthermore, we will have uh, budget cuts on goods and services. 175 million. Um, on the ICS program, there will be also budget cuts of 100 million. Buildings and fixed structures, 220 million. Now, surely that will affect our, you know, the maintenance in our build, you know, building program. Our constitutional institutions uh, you know, in, in, in public entities that is reporting to the minister is, will also receive a mino, mino budget cuts. Legal Aid South Africa, 182 million. SIU, 41 million. The Public Protector, um, 28 million. And 16 million in the current financial year for the South African Human Rights Commission. The important point you know, and challenge for all these entities and for justice is how do we sustain quality of service? How do we ensure quality of spend with this? Uh, many reduced budget. For us, uh, human resource planning, uh, effective human resource planning, quality procurement spending will be you know, the key considerations you know, going forward. If I can go to the, you know, the budget allocations uh, that this committee should um, you know, consider, the, the committee normally looks in the Appropriation Act um, you know, and approve budget allocations per program and sub-programs. Um, the slide that I'm just reflecting, you know, slide six, gives an indication of the respective justice programs. And, you know, what this, you know, again confirms over the MTF period and over the four, period, four years, the previous financial in the next three years, that overall our budget increase will be 1%. Uh, some areas possibly 2%, but surely court services a 0% increase. Now, in this, you know, a portion of our, of our services, uh, you know, for which we are also responsible is a magistrate salaries. And the appropriations surely confirm that there's a 0% increase in budget, a 0% increase in capability to appoint or in improve conditions you know, you know, you know, of service over the MTF period. So the direct charges component of the magistrate salaries, uh, meaning the magistrate salaries confirm um, you know, the impact of these budget cuts across our respective programs. If I can share with you, I mean, again, your focus and, and your researchers focus honorable members, what is happening with our budget allocations per economic classification? Again, a different view of the same challenge, not a problem, but I mean a challenge. Basically, over the MTF period, uh, budgets for personnel will, I mean, uh, will stabilize and will be on average 9.8, 9.9 billion rand, with no additional budgets coming, I mean, coming in. Uh, surely also our goods and services 
will on average be just over five, uh, you know, you know, five billion. An area of, um, you know, of concern, um, you know, relates to our buildings and fixed structures, where you can see, um, you know, the, you know, where we previously used to come to the portfolio committee with 1.2 or 1.5 billion rand in buildings and fixed structures, budget allocations. Now it is around about 700 million. And we surely really need to, to, to see how we can optimize that I mean, available budget. Chairperson, um, your oversight also, and honorable members, your oversight also focuses on, on divisions. Um, I do give an indication, or the CFO do give an indication on the branch allocations. Um, the one, the brands or subdivision allocations, it confirms, you know, possibly two things. Um, one, um, uh, the, the increase in the budget of the information regulator on slide 10, where the budget somewhere in the middle will increase with 33% from 45 million to 106 million. It's an important, um, you know, feature of the branch allocation. Then on the IGS program, from the current 494 million, uh, it will increase over the MTF period with about 11% to 684 million. This again confirms linked to justice modernization, um, you know, the efforts of the department to, to conclude investments in IT infrastructure. Um, one area, and the CFO or DJ possibly will, you know, will reflect on that. You, know, you might see there is a line item for the commissions. Uh, for the previous financial year, the budget was 213 million. And the CFO will possibly reflect on a new money uh, to, that, that will be reprioritized over the, for the current financial year to ensure the conclusion of the work of the and of the commissions. We, we also indicate you just for completeness sake, I mean, the budgets for the respective regions. Um, and then there we can proportionally see, um, you know, how, I mean, the size of Gauteng and KZN in and Eastern Cape. But all of these budget allocations for a region is informed by, by the number of courts, the number of service points, and it truly, you know, guides the respective budget, you know, I mean, allocations. A portion of our oversight, of the oversight of this portfolio committee is surely also the independent bodies, the public entities, and, um, you know, and the constitutional institutions. Uh, slide 12 gives you an indication of the proportional allocations and the growth, you know, you know in budgets. We can see legal aid on average uh, is now between 2 billion and 2.1 billion with a limited growth of around about 2%. SIU, um, you know, a little bit of a bit more, around about a 3% increase of, you know, from 421 million to 454 million. Public protector on average around about 320 to 340 million over the medium term. In the Human Rights Commission, also around about 200 million rand over, over the medium term. The one area that we, that I may know did, did, did impress, no, or what may know did it assist us in our, in our planning is earmarked amounts. Um, here we are fortunate, and, 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 and I surely would want to share you know, this with you. Earmarked amounts is with national treasury has substantial oversight. Um, and, 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 and normally we can't serve this money to any other area. But why, why we have wanted to share with you the earmarked amount is just to highlight to you on office accommodation, an increase of around about 6%. But um, a subline item under office accommodation is municipal services, where the increase overall is around about 7%. The basic 
uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, idea here is, or comfort here is that uh, it seems that uh, I mean, if local authorities keep their municipal charges uh, within inflation range, that we will be in a position to service all our commitments in terms of municipal rates and charges mean, I mean, I mean, and service fees, because the budget, you mean, know, the growth is I mean, substantial. The big challenge for us is, I mean, is, 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 on, is on facilities management. Um, on the facilities management side, you can see um, the property management relates to the leases portion. The capital works relates, as I've explained to you previously, the building of new infrastructure. So um, there is, uh, from the current or the previous years, 1.8 billion. Uh, we, we, you know, we do have an increase of 19% year on year. If, you know, you know, that will make our current facilities management portfolio around about 2.2 billion rand. I surely would, you know, that's I mean, a CFO surely would want to share with you the impact on the budget cuts. Um, now that our capital budgets are constrained, you know, the core question is how do we optimize planned maintenance, but also day-to-day -day maintenance? You know, for, you know, and there was, I mean, you know, there was this material budget cut from 121 million down to 68 million. Now, our challenge is, um, you know, whilst our courts, I mean, I had challenges in terms of maintenance, that we did 68 million for the current financial aid, that we surely look at proper planning and, and execution of day-to-day -day maintenance to ensure that our courts are in an appropriate state. Um, surely the 68 million on average will, will give our regions around about 5 million rent. Um, you know, uh, in order for them to have the capacity to ensure, you know, the day-to-day -day maintenance of our facilities. Um, the budget cuts, um, again, uh, we don't want to, 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 uh, to deal with this extensively, but, um, you know, what, since 2015 and until the end of this, uh, you know, MTF cycle, we just want to confirm to you that um, you know the total reductions uh, surely is close to 15 billion rand, and we've got a work cut out as a department to ensure that we deliver our services. There is also a slide, the slide 17, which gives an indication over the next uh, three years what is the respective uh, you know cuts across programs. Uh, slide 18 indicates to, to you, you know, how we, uh, when we did the budget cuts, try to protect to the best of our ability, the core function of the department, the primary function, and you know, most of the cuts directed you know, to, 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 um, to support services. One of, the, one of the big issues will be capacity. We do have a, you know, I mean, a vacancy rate in our department, which HR I mean, I mean, I can confirm. Uh, over the next year, the accounting officer and, and, and the corporate services team must look attentively to our personnel budget and how to what extent we capacitate our core, our core units. What we've done is what the CFO did, I mean, we did a costing of what is the, our, I mean, our, I mean, our, our warm bodies. And if all warm bodies is paid, what is left for us for prioritization and you know, for, for expansion of capacity? At this stage on slide 19, we confirm to you, um, if we pay the warm bodies, um, you know, what will we have left? Now we are saying uh, possibly 114 million rand in the first year. 116 and then 117 million that we will have now. From that 114, um, we need to fill now critical minimum positions. It's quite obvious that it is surely not enough to fund all other minimum and other positions. And the organization must acutely look at how we're going to prioritize this. But 
get 114 million rand is at risk in the current year because any salary determinations or increases in personnel costs uh, which Treasury Direct we must absorb ourselves my, will encroach on the available 114 million rand. Uh, Chairperson, um, the other slides um, you know, give, give, give you an indication of you know, what is our discretionary budget. If people say to us, go and reprioritize, uh, surely we do have, uh, we, we, we've seen the benefit of, uh, you know, you know, of, of certain operations now. We've seen a reduction in certain costs, um, you know, travel and subsistence. And it's our, it's our job to ensure, as a budget plan is under the CFO, to ensure how we can realize those savings and direct it you know, to, to areas of need. And as we introduce new IT uh, systems and automate certain processes, we need to generate, you know, you know, quantify those savings so that we can take it back to, to, to our core functions. Um, slides 21 and 22, um, you know, as a finance pack, you know, practitioners, uh, we just want to share with you uh, the implementation, I mean, the implementation risk, and and and, 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 and it's really what we advise internally, in, you know, in the organization, what needs to happen. We possibly will advise on uh, efficiency in, 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 in filling of posts. The time is just there off but also dealing with implementation plans, proper procurement plans, um, you know, uh, we, we surely need to look at uh, the challenges of an unfunded mandate. It is in, it's taking certain uh, budgets away from us. We must ensure proper alignment. It's no use presenting an APP or a strategic plan. And, 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 and we don't ensure from the office of the CFO appropriate resource allocation. We do, I mean, as a risk manager has indicated, we do foresee, uh, we do have challenges with our systems, but we, are, we I mean, we're working I mean, around this. So Chairperson, uh, thank you. Uh, this is the end of the budget presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairperson, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, in the main, I think this is, uh, the, the presentation we're making to this two, I mean, to the portfolio committee. Just two issues I thought I must flag that we may have missed. One, it just relates to facilities in general. I have been to two to three provinces, Western Cape, Free State, and the Northwest. And in my engagement with the officials in those regional offices and the stakeholders, the issue of facilities is a major challenge. Our facilities, are in serious uh, state of disrepair, dilapidation, collapse due to aging and other related challenges. In most of the cases, you are told about leaking roofs, sewage blockages, lack of reliable water supply, regular and constant uh, load shedding and lack of uh, power generators. These are issues that uh, the judiciary raises with the department and they've raised with me as well for the few days that I've been here, at least in those three provinces. And, and I know that those challenges resonate across the country. Now, the biggest challenge here is the dependence of the department on the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. However, we have decided that we need to develop a proposal to Public Works and I'll be meeting with the Director General uh, of, in the next uh, two weeks to try and find a solution that can allow us as a department to develop a framework that will seek to address these challenges without having to wait for the processes of public works and infrastructure that seem to take a long period of time. So, so this one area that I needed to flag. The second one relates to the general uh, personnel in the department. Uh, I think our maiden age generally is, is higher. Uh, in terms of our records, we only have 25% of people that are under the age of 35. 23%, I'm corrected, 23% out of the staff complement of 16,000. So this is a matter that we are taking seriously. 
and in the vacancies that uh, we will identify with a few resources that are there, we'll try to improve that situation so that we build capacity that will be available in the next 10 years. In the next five years, we will be losing through attrition a lot of the most skilled and experienced uh, officials, particularly at the senior management level. I thought Chair should reflect on those two issues and uh, with the permission of the Deputy Minister, this will be the end of our presentation. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, TJ. Uh, Deputy Minister, do you want to say something? Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Minister. Thanks, DG. No, um, I think let's. I'll, I'll respond. Um, we'll help respond to questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, members. Uh, do you want to pose any questions? Let me note hands. Question or comments? I have Honourable Charlie, uh, Honourable Nola. I'm using a new device, so I can't see where should I raise my hand. <laughs> okay. Where are you under the tree? <laughs> yes, he he is under the tree. So it will be Honorable Nomatemba Jale, Honorable Nola, Honorable Glenis Breitenbach, Honorable Nibot Jessens, Honorable Swart in that order. Honorable Jale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And also, good morning to the uh, DM and the team. Uh, Chairperson, I'm sure I'm just, I was just looking, Chairperson, uh, uh, the slow, <laughs> slow uh, responding to your, your, your call for us to raise hands. I'm sure it is one of the it can be also if I might be wrong, but also you know, uh, one of the 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 things that uh, one when was listening to <clears throat> the presentation, uh, uh, whereby one got the feeling that it's like we are starting afresh, everything we are starting afresh. We are planning now because we've got the new DG. Uh, <clears throat> everything, it's like it's new, but without being unfair to our 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 DG. And I think he, he made the last uh, comment that uh, their staff complement is aging, which is one of the things that maybe uh, worries him, uh, giving us that 23% of uh, those who are under 35. Uh, this gave me the impression that uh, indeed we have an experience. We have uh, officials who are very much experienced within the department that have, have been holding this department for quite some time, but uh, without also getting the results that uh, maybe the committee would be happy to say, at least when we get now the new DG, we are this far and uh, uh, this is maybe the progress that we have been, we have, we have been we have gone far with up to this time. One gets very worried, Chairperson, when I just uh, get the impression that we 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 don't even have anything that has been uh, done when it comes to uh, modernization uh, of this department. Uh, I, 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 I heard the presenter, the other presenter saying that uh, they are having an, an aging infrastructure in, when it comes to IT, which we all agree, but I don't think that up to this far, we are still going to talk about uh, the issue of modernization without having at least, at least a sign of saying, this is the direction where we are going. Ah, I don't think that one is happy person to hear that because I was expecting that maybe we would hear uh, saying uh, even if we are planning but if we can get more one of the things that has been identified it is the poor contract management and obviously there are officials those those who were responsible there one will request the DG to give us maybe 
and information as to uh, how far are we in terms of um, those officials maybe who are responsible, who could not do their part that we find ourselves in this place. And then the issue of non-compliance is still coming as a, as a risk. The issue of uh, Chaperson is still coming. The issue of, of uh, uh, the wasteful expenditure as a risk also is still coming. So I think the DG must, must be having a plan uh, going forward as to how are we going to deal with those issues precisely? Because they're still going to hamper us. I appreciate that he has given us uh, some dates uh, where we would see the results of some of the plans that she, he came with. And I think we're going to, from now onwards, we're going to have the very same presentation. We want to tick, 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 tick. When you come back, DG, we want to tick and say, this we have, you have done, and it is done. We are no longer, our patient is really a, a, a low when it comes to this, because we want progress. Uh, we might seem like we are becoming harsher to you. Apology for that. But unfortunately, our patient is really warning out when it comes to these issues. A plan like this will make us feel like uh, we are really not going anywhere. So that, uh, I, don't, I, 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 didn't, I don't want to say a, a way to that maybe would show disrespect to our officials. Let me say that those uh, officials that has been in that department, that if you check our budget, most of our budget goes to the compensation of these officials. I think we have to be very, very, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say harsh. We have to be very strict when coming to making sure that if somebody has been given a responsibility, he does that and he does it efficiently and there's accountability. So my, my uh, uh, the comment, this comment that I'm making, I think I would expect a response that you are saying, what are you doing as a new person? And also give us your experience up to this far, even if you, you came here much, you just came in. But I think the plans that you came up with today, they are, they are the reflection of what you have discovered in that department. So maybe if in your response you can come, I can't even point out most of the things that uh, I would want you to respond to, but if you can give us a picture as to, these are the problems that you have found that led you to come with this plan that we have today, so that when we come next time, DG, we are ticking, 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 and get responses and get progress. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Honorable Mora. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, uh, indeed, let us uh, welcome the presentation of the APP and the budget from the department. Uh, my, my, my first question, Chair, is on the awareness campaigns. Do they take the form of uh, media interviews, workshops, and in those interviews? I'm asking this chair because the form they take will determine how cost effective will they be. The second issue, chair, I want to uh, say something on is on the on the GBV plan. I want to make highlight of two things things on the GBV plan. One, uh, Parliament is finalizing uh, the three GBV, GBV bills. Uh, the department prepared itself in terms of uh, the rollout uh, of what is provisioned in those bills. And uh, in particular, there is a very important uh, matter there of the sexual offenders register. Uh, the second issue with the GPV matter would be, are there any 
because in the last financial year, the minister and the deputy minister were busy uh, establishing or launching uh, sexual offenses courts. Uh, is the department planning to continue with the, the launching of the, of the sexual offenses courts in this uh, financial year? If the answer is in the affirmative, how many are they planning to launch this, year, this financial year? The, 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 there is something that uh, the department is reporting in terms of the time frames on the execution of estates. They, 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 they speak on the improving and transforming the master's services. They speak particularly on as it relates to large estates. I want to check that uh, 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 when they speak of the transformation of the master's office, the first thing that comes to my mind is that there's been uh, allegations that uh, the master's office uh, allocates large estates uh, for execution to white males in particular and allocates the smaller estates to the black practitioners and the, and the, and the females in particular. If that is, is, is something to go for, has there been a progress that has been done to that effect? And what is the plan going forward with regard to that matter? There's an issue, Chair, of uh, repealing or, or, or dealing with the apartheid era justice related legislation. I saw, Chair, that in the attendance here, yeah, there is also the South African, South African Law Reform Commission. Uh, I would request, Chair, maybe uh, that uh, we, we, we get a report in writing as Parliament on the work that has been done. Uh, I mean, Chair, it's 27 years into democracy. In the ideal situation, wouldn't be still talking about repealing apartheid and colonial legislations until now. It's a burden that is not only of the department, uh, which, which include the parliament as well. Now, for us to get a better advice in, in this regard, so as parliament with the obligation for uh, making uh, laws, we get that particular briefing and writing on the progress that has been made in terms of repealing and replacing uh, uh, apartheid statutes. The last chair is the, uh, the, the online court system. Are they planning to continue? I think uh, when, when Corona was uh, rife in the country, which is uh, mostly the, the last financial year, uh, 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 the online uh, court system uh, proved to be a bit uh, effective. Uh, are they, are they, is, 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 it, is it progressing very well? Are they continuing with the online uh, hearings and all that and all that? Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, Honorable Mola. Honorable Dennis Petenbach. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to everybody. Uh, Mr. Chair, I must uh, align myself very seriously with the views of uh, the Honorable Maseka Jele. Um, the presentation is full of what, uh, what's going to happen and um, nothing about what has happened. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I expected a much more can-do kind of presentation given the state the department finds itself in. Uh, and given the, inter the last interaction we had with the department, I would have expected uh, some sort of implementation already, and not just um, an, uh, a, a really nicely set out what we hope to achieve in the future. So, um, yeah, the less said about that, the better, but uh, I find that uh, aspect very disappointing. Now, in November 2020, the minister addressed the portfolio committee and uh, along with the committee expressed his alarm about the decline in the Department of Justice performance. This has been an ongoing issue. And it's now reached a point where it's, uh, it's, it's very critical. Uh, the minister stated that there was a process in place to rebuild the administration. So uh, the identified root causes were, he listed as follows, 
high levels of leadership instability, lack of capacity, lack of performance management, lack of decision, decisive decision making, no defined um, organizational culture leading to a culture of non-performance and the lack of an ethical tone. I would like to know today what has been done to address those issues, not what will be done, not what they plan to do to address them. We're six, seven months down the line here, and I want to know what has been done to address those six critical issues. Uh, that, that is something that I would like to hear today. Uh, and then, Mr. Chair, the SMS vacancy rate is high. Uh, and I'd like to know what has been done to address that. How many of those vacancies have been filled? Not when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, one day when they get to do it. What has actually been done? Has a skills audit been done? Do they understand the skill set of the middle and senior management? And if they have done it, tell us the results, please. If they haven't done it, I'd like to know why. Again, the performance management system, it's uh, appalling. Well, it's non-existent. So how has that been remedied? Uh, the Auditor General made a range of uh, recommendations. Uh, which of those have been uh, attended to and what are the outcomes of that attention? If they haven't been attended to, why not? I don't believe that it's necessary for me to mention them. I'm sure that everybody's aware of them. Then the uh, DG uh, mentioned in his closing remarks the attrition rate. Well, yes, the attrition rate is something of a problem, but it's a, it's a problem everywhere. What I want to know from the DG is what he's going to do, what plans has he put in place to retain those skills in some sort of mentorship program so that the people who are appointed have proper induction, proper mentorship, uh, learn how to do the job most efficiently from those people who've got 20 and 30 years of experience in the department. You can't have it walking out the door on the day of retirement, replace it with a 20 year old and expect the department to run. What, what plans are in place to retain those skills so that they can be, uh, that they can be passed on to the new generation of officials? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Nilbert, Russian. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Chair. I would like to go to slide 50. Oh, sorry, interpreter's mistake, 70. Slide 70, uh, the department's top risks. Uh, many of my colleagues have already alluded to these risks um, and I would like to join them um, in expressing the disappointment um, because this is all presented as if it's, you know, the first time that you're all presenting to us. So we, what has been happening in the previous years? Um, I haven't heard anything about the improvements um, take from advice from the previous years. And then... Um, still under the still under slide seventy, the inability. Oh, you don't have to put up the slide, um, but I'm just quoting from the slide: the inability to implement COVID nineteen um, amendment plan or adjusted plan to effectively manage. Um, to effectively manage the risks with the coming wave, so the third wave. So it means the first wave, we went through it and we succeeded. Second wave, we went through it and succeeded. Why is the department still saying the inability to manage um, the COVID? Because, I mean, by now we should be really familiar with how to handle COVID. We should be familiar with all the protocols by now. So I would like to understand what do you mean by this inability to manage 
um, to manage the COVID risks, COVID risk suggested plan uh, for the third wave. I'm concerned about that. We all need to be protecting ourselves from COVID and you are now saying the department is unable to do that. I mean, we've been with this pandemic for over a year. You really should know how to deal with it already. Uh, My colleagues have covered other matters. Uh, So what I would like to know in relation to universal access for people with disabilities. Um, I took note of, of what the department said, but I would like to know how is the department going to do or going to provide universal access for people with disabilities in in the service points and courts, um, if the department can explain how they're going to do it. I am extremely concerned about the surge of hate speech and hate crimes and the killing of people um, who are from the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, you know, these the department, has there been an outcry condemning of these killings of people from the LGBTQIA plus community? Um, if there have been, it's not very audible. It's not seen. Um, has there been a, a, a kind of a statement from the, from the departments condemning the, the, these kind of actions? And then for years, we've been hearing about youth interns um, in different from in different departments, different entities. From this department, I don't believe we've ever heard anything about youth interns. So where are your your interns? Are they being absorbed into the department or not? And then I would like to add, I think one of the few of the other colleagues, the uh, mentioned the concerns with the master's office um, and the problems of the master's office. Two months ago, there was a little boy who wrote to the president um, about his lack of access to get funding for school and for meals for accommodation from the master's office. Yeah, you know, I would like to know what happened with that particular case. What is the situation now? Have the funds been released to him? Um, yes, and he wrote specifically to the president. And let me just check. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, applications for protection orders, online applications for protection orders that has been implemented. How are you letting the public know that this facility is now available and how they go about doing it? Um, I don't believe I've seen anything. So how is the department giving out that information? And I will stop there. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Honorable Stephen Sorat. Um, Thank you, Chair, and greetings to everyone. And may I also congratulate the DG on his appointment. He obviously realizes there are many challenges. And I also, from our perspective, wish to uh, join the Honorable Maseka Jele, Honorable Breitenbach, who have expressed deep concerns about the state of the department and the lack of progress and let's really grapple with this chair we need to spend time about this we need to really look into this yes there are wonderful plans going forward yes we understand the curveball of COVID-19 but we need to engage robustly because this as we know this department is at the heart of justice it is the heart of the constitutional democracy and so we need to find a way of grappling with the hard questions, but also understanding the very important budgetary constraints that the department is offering, operating under. And this is across the board with all departments. So with your permission, I'd like to spend a bit of time going through some of the issues and then speaking about the budget as well. Firstly, Chair, I would like to ask about the master's office, the progress with the SIU report that has been tabled where a number of 
recommendations were made as to systemic problems with the master's office. I'd like to ask about the operation of the complaints management mechanism at the master's office. The vacancy rate, I appreciate again, that is a problem relating to budget, but it could be that there are funded vacancies there. And of course, the issue I would ask, when last was the small estate amount adjusted? We understand that is the amount of 250,000 Rand. If that is adjusted upwards, it could release a lot of pressure on the master's office because those processes are much easier to finalize. The second issue is the Solicitor General. It was touched on. I would like to ask whether the acting position, the position is only for two years acting capacity, whether that is going to be extended, given the fact that we received a very positive briefing from the Solicitor General at one stage. The third aspect relates to the supply chain management and in particular, the issues relating to Basasa, the security contracts and the global technology systems forensic investigations. There were three forensic investigations relating to justice. What is the progress in that regard? The fourth matter is the appointment of the legal services ombud, Judge Siraj Desai. Is that office operational at all? And can we get an update on that? Chairperson, we had a very good meeting with the judiciary on the 28th of February. I would like the department or the deputy minister to give us an indication of the court administration model. Progress that is being made on a political level or departmental level with the institutional independence of the judiciary. That's an ongoing issue. And we gave the undertaking that we would look as a portfolio committee very urgently at that issue. I also raised the issue of the funding for the Zondo commissions. When with the minister, he gave a indication that funding would be found from the department, but now from Mr. Johnson, and I appreciate his candor, Mr. Johnson's candor, we've known him for many years, in, in laying out the budgetary constraints. My concern is where will the funds come from where the Minister of Finance indicated there will be no more funds for the completion of the Zondo Commission. I need to know where that additional funding will come to ensure that the Zondo Commission completes its work. Chair, so can I just then touch on the issue relating to the budgetary constraints? Now, I think it's time for us as Members of Parliament to step forward and so a lot of this has resulted, and it has been mentioned by the President of this nation, of the state capture and corruption and looting that has taken place. You're fully aware that I served on the ESCOM inquiry, the tens of billions of rands that have been stolen. And so it is for me absolutely disgraceful that units that are able to collect these stolen funds and lock away people have their funds depleted and reduced. It makes no sense to me, Chairperson. The SIU that is able to use the special tribunals to cancel contracts to collect money has a reduction in funding. We will hear from the MPA later, the Asset Forfeiture Unit, the Investigative Directorate, and of course, the Justice Department that has to run the courts. Chair, how can we allow this to take place when there are tens of billions of rands sitting that can be collected, that need to be collected, but our entities do not have the funds to do it? And in fact, the funds are being reduced. I feel very strongly about this. And I think, Chair, we need to start looking at solutions to this. One of the ways is looking at the CARA fund. Criminal Asset Recovery Account. The Minister has jurisdiction over that account. It is, I understand, for the compensation of victims of crime. But surely, a portion of those funds can go towards the funding shortfalls of the Department, 
the SIU, the NPA, the Asset Forfeiture Unit, and the Investigative Director. This is something we need to look into. We cannot lose more warm bodies in these entities and more forensic capacities in these entities. Chair, I would also then like us to seriously consider the issue of our powers in terms of the Monetary Bills Amendment Act. And I would ask our researchers to again look into that. I know it was amended, but surely we cannot continue to go with a begging bowl, the department going with a begging bowl to National Treasury, understanding the fiscal constraints across the nation, but there is a case to be made out that the department and these entities need their funding, and at least that we cannot afford to have this funding reduced. Chair, you have indicated the impact that this has on crime, the impact that it has on the economics. One of the biggest constraints of investors coming to South Africa is their perception of corruption and that it is not being dealt with adequately. And we saw when certain steps were taken recently, how the RAND strengthened. So it is critical that we understand that this department is at the heart of the access to justice and a lot revolves around this. And I feel very strongly about this, that we need to be robust, we need to hold accountable, but at the same time, we as parliament, we allocate the funds. We, it's us, ourselves. So at a certain stage, we've got to stop wringing our hands and understand that we appropriate funds within the fiscal constraints that the Minister of Finance has set up. Thank you, Chair. I hope you didn't take anything I said personally, but I think we are all in this together. And it's no uh, aspersion on any member of this portfolio committee, but just in general, how strong I feel about these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Janja. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Slalo, for your, for your leadership and uh, guiding us. I first want to welcome and thank the DG. Um, this is probably his first uh, presentation to this committee, if I'm not mistaken, as a new DG. So I think that's proper that uh, we indicate that you are welcome, DG. Um, and, and there's an expectation on him, Chair, uh, on, on having to um, to fly whilst he's fixing uh, this aircraft. I also want to appreciate and welcome what under his leadership they have presented um, to us uh, today. I want Chair to, to appeal to your leadership to guide us um, in the discussion of this very presentation, because Chair, it is my understanding uh, that today we are dealing with uh, your strategic plan, even though it's not presented, it's taken as read, as well as listening to the annual performance plan being presented in front of us, which indicates where the what are the plans? What the department is planning? It, it is a forward-looking discussion. I want to appeal to you for your guidance. It's a forward-looking discussion as opposed to a backward assessing in terms of the annual report. Today is not the annual report. Today is the annual performance plan. We need to, when we conclude this meeting, we need to rise knowing that they, they have the plans that they have put forward and our role is to judge the effectiveness, the, the, the integrity of the plans they are putting in front of us, whether these plans mean anything. I thought I, I, I really want to, to, to get, so that I don't get lost, in, so that the expectation is a proper one. I also, at the same time, given what other members have said, want to suggest, Chair, that uh, I think it's, a, it's the right of this committee. If there are issues that we want 
more information on in terms of progress on quite a number of issues, we can always set a specific meeting for that to attend to those issues so that we don't mix uh, many of these issues. I'm saying that, Chair, because in, in October or November, I can't remember the actual date, I think it was October, I mean November, when the department came in front of us, Chair, our, 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 our diagnosis and conclusion of that, and our, it's important that we remember that, we concluded in saying this department is, is dysfunctional, Chair, that this department does not even need a turnaround, it needs a rescue plan. I, I, it's important that we, we, we remind ourselves about that. It needs a rescue plan and, and that everything else, I remember you in your conclusion saying it, it, it is demonstrating a decline and, and we counted about three, four years of that decline and that something needed to be done. Even before you go to the specific of the programs, whether it is the, the, the guardian funding, it is the solicitor general or the state uh, attorney's office or any of the programs, we're able to say each of these programs, there is a challenge. And so today, Chair, if then the department comes in front of us and says, after that, after listening to you as a portfolio committee in October or in November, the deputy minister and the minister summoned us. They pulled us together. We had a planning session in response to our, our harsh criticism as this committee, if you remember. So they said they had that. And after that, once a new DG was appointed, we we're being told here that they also had another session where the new DG was putting things in place. And so what is it coming in front of us? And this is the, the first question I wanted to pose to the DG because I'm, 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 I'm very happy chair from where I'm sitting. If they are presenting things to us as a result of responding to fixing the department, if, if this is about fixing the department, I'm very happy to hear what the new plans are. Um, so I, I connect with that. Otherwise, I'm never going to sit here and then want to listen to continuation of the old problems that don't give any results. And so my, my, my first general question to the DG and the, and the deputy minister was going to be, is what you're presenting to us here today, does this APP respond to the need to rescue this department? As we said to you that we need the rescue. Is what you presenting today, before I go to the specifics, a, a reflection of you planning this turnaround? Uh, because you don't have any other opportunity. You had more than five months since October, November. And I'm, 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 I'm happy if you are indicating to us that the 10 points that you are presenting are a beginning of a journey to rescue and to turn around this department. If you say that, I'll be very happy whether it indicates how you want to change things and sometimes it can reflect as new things, I'll be very happy with that. I thought Chair, I, I needed to, uh, to make that. With that having been said, Chair, I want to focus because I've been given a particular work and task uh, by my own party. Uh, and that task is that when it comes to this Department of Justice, my focus is on court services. I want to stay on court services. I'm not going to go anywhere else. I've been given that duty. Um, and and, and I, I want the DG to know that every time we meet, I'm going to be in that space. And in relation to that chair, uh, in terms of those court services, I just want to raise the following issues in relation to that, because I'm really confining myself to that program uh, of court services, uh, Mr. J.P. Skosana. Uh, firstly, within the court services, if you could indicate to me that, uh, and I'm beginning to see a few of those things. I think uh, I, I, I like this issue of modernization outcome, uh, which aims to increase access to justice and a lot of the, the, the other things that, that you have raised there. Um, if you can confirm, because it does seem that you, 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 you're making a forward leap in relation to this.
But secondly, on the specifics, you're saying that you have identified in this APP 45 sites um, for audiovisual in the court. I know you can bring that to slide, but I happen to miss what is the medium to long term because you've got hundreds and thousands of courts in the country. Sorry, Honorable drop in the ocean. Sorry, Honorable Chancha. There is this Galaxy 9. Um, can the person rename that Galaxy 9 so that you can know who he, who he is or who she is? And after that, you must meet that Galaxy 9. You are disturbing our meeting. I proceed, Honorable Chanji. Thank you, Chair. So I was making the point that I, I if you bring back that slides on the, on the court services, where you indicate you're planning to do 45 sites in terms of audiovisual in courts. And my interest, I wanted to see the entire journey of that. If you have to have a three year plan beyond the 45, what are the other plans in your medium to long? Uh, I missed that. You might have heard that, given the fact that there's so much that needs to happen. That is going to be insignificant. We're only going to uh, do that. Secondly, Chair, I in the APP, one of the issues, uh, we have a report from the, the, the Democratic Governance and Rights Unit uh, from the Judges Matter as an NGO that produced a report about the state of infrastructure, the work environment, security in courts. And it, it, it is painting a very gloomy picture that we all know. And I'm interested to see in the APP, as you've also said, you, in terms of court infrastructure, you as yourself are alarmed. I mean, I want to see whether, because they relate to issues of security in many of these courts that is almost non-existent, which affect the administration of, of, of justice. I hear you speaking about the maintenance and, and I'll come to their risk issues because number one in your risk, register is, 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 is this issue of uh, uh, infrastructure, aging and so on. But I don't think it's only aging infrastructure. If I may take you to Platinberg Bay, a place called Beto today, you've got a new court in Platinberg Bay. It's not old. You've got a new court you, where you use the IDT. Um, I picked up, I mean, just last year, and it's now going to be raining season. That, that court could not operate, and it just been built in the last three or four years. And it, it, was, it was flooded. So it has nothing to do with it being an aging infrastructure or maintenance. It was a new court. And, and, and therefore, I don't know how you, you, you attend to those kind of issues. The, if you go to the, the issue of the risk, I like that slide, but six out of 10 of the risks that you have identified are a combination of high risk and extreme risk, which means that uh, we are more on the side of many of these issues you're putting on the plans not being realized, not being implemented. If you put what is in the red, as well as the one that says it's high, was the red is your extreme uh, kind of risk. I also would have loved Chair, to see uh, Mr. Skosana, maybe I missed it, the, the issue of the magistracy bill. I, I missed whether it, it is reflected in your APP uh, because that is the work that uh, one is expecting will soon come to parliament. And I, I couldn't pick that up where it is as part of your, your activities of, of, of your APP. So, the, so you can see where that slide is. Your, your top three, which is in red, and then the rest, the second top three, it's, it's, it's also in, in that area of your um, a, 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 a high risk. So basically six out of that says to us, what you are presenting has have got high risk and I, I have missed the mitigating factors as to how you're going to, to mitigate this kind of high risk that you have identified. So Chair, I just wanted to, 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 to make those comments. I think many of these one would want to interact 
through the type of questions in parliament or to indicate that we might want to have specific sessions to drill into certain sections uh, of, of, of the APP. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Janchi. Uh, can you remove the slide? Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Janchi. Indeed, it is a presentation of your annual plan, annual performance plan and budget that we are dealing with uh, today, uh, not the, uh, the BRRR where we deal with the performance of the department. Um, but at the same time, I think you talked about the integrity of the annual plans. So members would look at the past, past, past performance to check uh, whether what has been put in the plan is realistic. And I think the frustration of the members is based on some of those issues, which for instance, on my side, and because uh, I'm still going to be asking questions before we close so that they can also be answered. How do you say we must approve an annual performance plan and budget that says it aims to reduce wasteful and fruitless expenditure by 70%. Now we are talking generally a budget of about 21 billion. And you say you are aiming to reduce irregular expenditure by 55%. These two for me are, are too low a target. Too low a target. They don't correspond to the issue that Honorable Janji said you must look at the integrity of your, your, your strategy. At the same time, you have you were told that you must invest in financial administration and internal auditing as well as professionalizing supply chain management. Up to now, I am not aware that you have been able to appoint an audit committee. And the audit committee would assist us in ensuring that there is reduction in wasteful and fruitless expenditure there is a reduction in irregular expenditure that the monies and the programs talk to each other. And, and, but to the last, to, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it has not yet been appointed. Uh, by December uh, of 2020, which is the third, third quarter, the end of third quarter, you had only spent 13.8 billion, which is about 65% of your budget. Now, how do I say you will be able to spend this whole budget, even if there are budget cuts? Um, because we must be able to face South Africans and to say South Africans indeed, these cuts are too deep uh, the department is able to spend what it has been given. Uh, but now, by end of December, you had only spent 65%. And you promised last time, and we don't, I don't really see it, you promised last time that there is going to be a gender-based budgeting. I don't see it uh, reflected in your APPs properly. There are snippets of it, but I don't see it as a, as a thread that cuts across. So it's important that we must have these issues clarified, uh, DG and Deputy Minister, um, so that we can be able indeed to fight 
for uh, to fight the fight that uh, Honorable Swart has said we must do, but we must be convinced of your ability to spend and spend carefully and efficiently the money that the taxpayers have given you. And you have been non-compliant uh, in as far as 676 million, which is about 42%, which was spent without following your procurement processes. So this is money that is not well spent during the time when our people are experiencing serious hardship. So it's important that we must get an assurance that these annual performance plans indeed are going to deal with these issues. And that is why uh, in October when you come, um, because we can't promise that we will be able to meet you before that time, um, because of the local government election, we must be able to see drastic change. We must be able to see drastic change or else you will always run into serious problems where your plans are not going to be believable. Uh, over to you, Deputy Minister. Uh, Chairperson, thanks. Um, I would ask the, um, the DG to, to start the responses and I'll come in at the end. Uh, Deputy Minister, thank you very much. And, and thanks, Honorable Chair and the Honorable Members. I, I have on the platform in attendance with me Deputies, Directors General and, and Head of uh, uh, Entities in the Department who are part of uh, this annual performance plan. And uh, I'll, I'll call them, each one of them, to deal with uh, specific areas uh, that relates to the areas of their work. And, and once they are done, then I'll deal with specific areas. Before I identify them, I'll ask the Solicitor, Solicitor General briefly just to speak on some of the issues and, and uh, the Chief Master Advocate Mafojane will deal with all the matters that have been raised around the master's issues. And uh, Advocates Kosana as well will deal with the court uh, services related matters. And uh, the DDG corporate services will deal with all the corporate services facilities, you know, court se I mean, corporate services and HR related matters. And uh, Mr. Matibe, who's acting Deputy Director General for Ms. Kale Pile, who's not here, will deal with the matters relating to legislative development. As well as this acting CFO will deal with matters of finance, as well as the Auditor General's uh, findings that have been raised here. And uh, I'll identify other colleagues as well. And, but broadly then I'll, I'll deal with the other issues that have been directed to me as well as the issues that colleagues will not have covered. Uh, Mr. Fezisan Pandelani, the Solicitor General. Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. Um, I do not uh, actually recall that there was a specific uh, question that was related to me, save for um, what Mr. Venile Matlangu indicated uh, during his presentation. Uh, which related to the contingent liability as the highest, highest risk um, uh, to the department. Um, you would recall that I've virtually previously, after having been invited by this uh, August committee, uh, made a high level presentation in relation to that space that impacts on the state attorneys. And I'm, I'm willing to answer any specific question. But with specific reference to the contingent liability as a risk, which is um, an aspect that we interrogated the previous time that I was here. Um, I should, in fact, indicate that, yes, indeed, that remains to be the case, that uh, contingent liability, if not properly arrested, um, actually has the potential of uh, collapsing the state. As at the moment, um, uh, Chairperson and members of the committee, um, the caseload that we are dealing with um, and uh, we are in fact manually dealing with is 328,000. And those are cases that the state is now currently dealing with. Um, um, and it is a huge risk, especially if you do not know 
what those cases relate to. So part of the annual performance plan, um, um, especially in my space, is to interrogate um, those cases uh, with a view of trying to see what is contained in there. Um, up to so far, manually, I've, I've only been able to interrogate 154,000 um, 241, which means from the 328,000 cases or caseload, half of them still have to be interrogated. It is very important to interrogate these caseloads so that you can clean the data and be able to see the exposure that the state, in fact, is facing insofar as litigation is concerned, and also to eliminate opportunistic litigation and duplication of matters. And, um, um, and these issues or interventions that one will be coming up with are intended to mitigate the risk and exposure of the state. I must add, however, that um, all these systems that are there are not responsive to one um, interrogating that space with agility. It's all manual. And I think some investment might have to be made because the repository of um, uh, contingent liability for the state is the Department of Justice, owing to the fact that both the capital claims and the costs for litigation are paid from the Department of Justice and ought to be recovered from those departments that are impacted. We have previously dealt with uh, uh, issues such as write-off of amounts because government departments themselves, uh, those that are consuming state legal services, do not find it um, 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 uh, proper to, in fact, remit whatever is due to the Department of Justice. And the exercise um, to interrogate the data that is there um, has also other limitations in the sense that the 328,000 odd cases that one is interrogating as at the moment is not a holistic picture of the matters that, in fact, ought to be looked into you still have those parallel processes for management of state litigation. Uh, and we are in fact coming up with all the policies that are violated, which are to be implemented in terms of the provisions of section three, subsection four of the State Attorney's Amendment Act, clearly to do away with parallel systems where departments themselves could also be enabled to um, uh, manage litigation um, using all so sorts of things. So, we will actually be interrupting that space. Thank you. Yes, no, I think we attempted to make another presentation. Yeah. That was not asked. Uh, maybe if there, then we, we will come back to, to, to I, I think you did clarify um, um, when you made a presentation earlier on, on some of these issues. Uh, maybe we'll come back to you when there are specific questions relating to the solicitor general. Thank you. Chair, thank you very much. I have the honor now to ask the Chief Master to respond to the Master's related questions. Thank you. Thank you, DG, Deputy Minister, Chair, and Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee. I think this is my first engagement with this committee since I rejoined the department on the 1st of uh, November 2020. And I must say as just an opening comment that indeed I came knowing that I'm coming to an environment that is not so attractive, a place that in the news, the message is not a very good one, but I came with my eyes wide open, believing and knowing that I think I can make a contribution and I can lead a team and change perhaps the environment if we together commit and implement to what we commit to. And indeed today as part of uh, the presentation of our annual performance plan, the intent was to say to the portfolio committee, this is what we intend to do going forward. And for sure what we intend to do going forward Chair, as you indicated, must really give the committee some sense of an assurance that indeed we are likely to turn the corner 
And if we have turned the corner and arrested the decline, we show some potential to indeed improve and do better than we did better before. My commitment coming into the master's branch was to say, we surely have people who can serve the people of South Africa better than we did before. I had been in the masters until around 2018 and I left, but I came back knowing that it, our challenges are there. But I agree with the director general that our challenges are not insurmountable. These are challenges that if we were to properly analyze and put our heads and really commit and get the competent people to execute things can turn for the better. Now, there were three or four questions or comments that were related or directed to the services of the masters. And I will try to take them in the order that I had recorded them as uh, the honorable members were putting their comments and questions. <clears throat> the first related to the comment by honorable Nola as to within the improvement or the transformation of the master services that he had captured somewhere that the masters are allocating large, the execution of estates that are larger to the whites and the small ones to the Africans or blacks. But properly, I think if the execution of estates we are talking about would be relating to the insolvency estates, because ordinarily in the deceased estates, we are operating under the two guidelines within the law that are speaking to, 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 to the testamentary uh, 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 administration of an estate or interstate. So largely there, it is not a question of uh, the master having any power to select or to, to direct or assign people based on any uh, 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 racial uh, 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 backgrounds, but basically people have the freedom of testation and the choice of the executors. But if the question indeed was directed to the insolvencies, we really have a challenge. And this challenge is a challenge that business South Africa must come to the party in so far as saying joining government and joining everybody in the drive to try and change the skewedness in the ownership of business and in the ownership or in, 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 in the control around the finances. Because in the insolvency space, the appointment it's largely influenced amongst others by the legislation that would then say those that are appointed are appointed on the basis of majority in number or in value and, or and in value. So that particular setup, it's not by the choice of the master, but the department has embarked and entered the, 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 the arena in trying to say, at the provisional stage, which in my view, it's a very limited and circumscribed space. And I have been saying, we are going to be faced with a situation that's going to say that in many instances, once we properly tighten, and if we had gone and succeeded with the previous policy on the appointment of uh, insolvency practitioners within the circumscribed legislation that was merely saying in the provisional stage. If we had succeeded and gone and changed and introduced and created space for those who were previously disadvantaged and those who did not have the privilege and space to can even operate there, had we succeeded, we were going to see the following, that the provisional stage was going to be actually limited to a holding up position provisionally before the final appointment. And the administration of the insolvent estates would not happen within that space of a provisional stage. So, so, so 
I think and I believe that the drive to try and say the correction of that position in the insolvency bill should try to say the government's intervention in the appointment of liquidators must rather even go beyond the provisional state, but even in the actual uh, administration of, 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 of the whole insolvent estate. So, so, so that, that question basically, um, it is not a choice of the masters or, or the department neglecting and try or failing to try to create a space for those who did not uh, uh, who could not be afforded to deal with larger estate. But I think it's this thing that our, our, our business is inclined to appoint those that either they prefer or associate with or identify with them. But that space needs to be changed. Now, the question of honorable knee vote specifically spoke to uh, uh, a specific case I am unaware of that particular case in the Guardian Swan Eye. We do monitor and look and check on the uh, uh, presidential uh, uh, questions or, or queries, ministerial queries, and queries that are going to the Office of the Director General. So I, I would rather prefer in not just guessing and giving an answer for the sake of an answer, this committee is expecting of me to be honest with it and give a correct answer if I know of the particular case. Because we came to present the plan for the year, it is perhaps uh, not uh, proper or, or right for me now to can speculate on, 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 on the answers. However, in general, the plan going forward in the Guardians Fund, and I think the Portfolio Committee was made aware of the challenge and the attempt to defraud the Guardians Fund in the Peter Marisbeck uh, a Master's Office uh, during September 2020. However, we have now gone to a point where we have received both the, 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 the reports, IT or, 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 or the reports from APSA for their IT team, as well as the departmental IT, and have learned some lessons. And during that process, and what must be commended of what was existing then was that we were not having a, a, an arrangement that would have allowed that all of that money, the attempt on the 10 million would have been taken and stripped without us identifying and only waking up when the whole of that money was, 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 was uh, taken and we could not recover part of it, no. Uh, the, 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 we have answered a question to this committee related to that, but I can indicate that uh, a part of the drives that we have or plans that we have relating to the space of the Guardians Fund is that uh, one, we have improved our relationship with the Government Employee Pensions Fund that we are finalizing and we were working on a memorandum of understanding the GEPF had given us their proposal. We interrogated, discussed, held meetings, and reverted to them with a, 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 a counter proposal. I think we are close to getting their reaction to that, and we may then sign that. But beyond that, even in the guidance fund, what we are doing is we are now embarking in this year in the changing from the purely administrative system of managing the guidance fund, but want to develop a financial system that would also be aligned to an IT system so that we, we can do better and quicker. And the planning of the two development and change is that at least we do not start the one and want to introduce the other later on without ensuring that both teams from all these sides are on board and are from the financial and from the IT come on board with us so that we can then ensure that in the years to come or in the following year, we would then manage to do the situation much better. Honorable Swart referred to two or opposed to two questions. One, 
related to when last was the 250,000 threshold uh, 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 increased to that amount uh, 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 for the uh, uh, administration of simpler estates. The last that we did was during about 2014, 2015. Uh, the, 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 the impact of uh, the adjustment of that amount and the, 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 the control around uh, people appointed on those estates, irrespective of whether the amount is less than 250,000, where there is a property that involves minor children, our arrangement with Legal Aid South Africa is that they come on board and they properly manage that estate. So, so uh, uh, but should we want to even or consider an increase, we are likely to, and we are busy looking at a model that will say specifically, the appointment in these estates of an amount of less than 250, shouldn't we be moving to a certain measure of accountability, but in a more simplified way than having to go through a process of uh, 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 the advertisements of the accounts uh, uh, in the newspapers and, and then the fully fresh liquidation and distribution account, but rather in a simplified forms that we would then issue as we issue the letter of appointment that would at least to a certain extent say to whoever is the holder of that letter of authority over that estate, there is a certain measure of accountability expected. And once we have stabilized that environment, then one would then better speak to say the, the amount of this 250, sort of the determination of the amount through the regulation is something that can be done and the adjustment thereof. But one needs to consider aspects of saying, amongst others, we were linking these amounts with even samples or, or situations where in the Guardian's Fund uh, uh, environment, the amount that is permissible that could be withdrawn over the period of the year as an interim towards the maintenance of or, 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 or the safe, uh, the maintenance of the dependent or beneficiary could be kept at that 250 so it's not only one figure that we then adjust and leave the others and do them piecemeal so so we would in the future uh, uh, and when circumstances permit have to reconsider this but this was done some with just to be precise, some five to six years ago. Now, the Not systemic sure. changes. Can we try and be concise because there are still other people who need to, an to answer questions and we still have the MPA. Thanks, Chair. My apologies. Sir. Just the other question related to the systemic uh, 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 improvements that were suggested by the SIU, most of um, uh, as we could be aware, we have not received the final report. The interim reports are touched purely on, 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 on legislation change that could inform how we change our systems. And, and we, we took note of these. And however, we are mindful of the fact that there is a process in place and backed upon to try and amend uh, the Administration of Deceased Estates Act. And then uh, 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 I think um, the, the, I align myself to the comment of um, Honorable Janji as us presenting our plan in this phase. I believe I have covered all the questions and comments that would have related to the master's plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, DJ. Chair, Chair, thank you very much, Chair. I will yield to Advocate J.B. Skosana, the DDG for Court Services, to briefly address in a concise manner the questions that have been raised relating to court services. Advocate Skosana. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, DJ. Thanks, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. I will go quickly to the, to the responses, and, and uh, please, I've noted all of them, and uh, I, I commit to provide the minerating format as well, so that we can remind ourselves as we come from time to time the committee. 
uh, what the uh, response we've given. The first one, chair, just a general overview. Uh, uh, the risk adjusted plan. I think we, we do have a risk adjusted plan, and I was a pivotal in that process. When I was, I was acting, I, I led, I coordinated the development of a plan which enabled the department to, to survive and sustain critical services during the, the, the hard lockdowns. And I still, that, that plan is still in motion. I think uh, we did not, I think the message uh, we did not wanted to indicate that it's, it's dysfunctional. Uh, perhaps we wanted to say that we have not yet reached uh, the, the, the outcomes that we have intended to reach. Uh, I can say out of that uh, just plan, we, we have been able to set up process in the courts and the deputy minister will speak to some of them, including the ones of, of trying to optimize the function of the courts uh, uh, despite the challenges that basically we still confront. Uh, Honorable Nwala raised the, pro, the, the, the questions around the, the, the NRSO in particular in the context of the GBVF chair. I want to say that following the, the, the briefing we made to the committee with SAPS uh, some few weeks ago, uh, we were directed that we need to convene a meeting and we need to look into what uh, uh, can make that research work better. I must say, we did convene that meeting chair. I, I convened that meeting, I prepared a report which I'm going to uh, and, uh, uh, to present to, to my principals, the minister and the minister and the DG. And I think it will then be en route to, to, to the chair. I can just say, just uh, generally that it was amazing that we've got three registers. We've got the Register for National uh, Child Progression Register under the, the DSD department. We've got the register as the NRSO, and we've got the register for elderly people, etc. They're all intended to focus through uh, uh, protecting the rights uh, uh, of vulnerable persons, etc. And all of them have come up with challenges, which basically have come up at the, at the kind of meeting. And we believe that our engagement uh, basically should allow not only this portfolio committee, but should allow a clear view across all these registers. So they don't put uh, systems and tools in place which do not yield the results which have been intended for the end of the day. But we reserve for that. Whether we're going to extend the, the social offense court, yes, we're going to. But what we're doing now, Chair, we say one, we have reduced the, 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 the standards for the sexual offenses court. So you can basically allow more courts and more uh, services uh, in terms of sexual offenses, uh, but not reduce the quality. Initially, the 106 sexual offenses courts were based on, on a very high standard, which was going to look into the new building infrastructure, special of, uh, sexual offenses courts, appointment of uh, 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 court preparation officers, and et cetera, and, and also the IT system in the, in the courts, et cetera. Now through the regulations, we are making sure that we provide minimum standards. They should basically be applicable in, 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 in quite a number of courts, whilst we still retain, retain the very same quality of standards. So in this financial year, we, play, we plan to, to, to designate hundreds of those courts in terms of section 65A, which should basically will be fully functional Whilst at the same time we are developing a framework which will enable us to extend to expand the current sexual offense court. We started very roughly because we were guided by infrastructure, but experience have shown us that we've got many courts which are not basically optimally utilized because we're not guided by the caseload, we're not guided by the needs on the on the ground. Uh, Honorable Mr. Jan, in President Bank Bay, for example, was two sexual offenses courts, when in fact we needed one in that court to be fully functional. So we have taken those experiences forward, and I think it will guide us in terms of adding the courts that we have, et cetera. Um, and looking into the, the online court services, yes, we are moving forward to the online court services. I must say several uh, trials on a virtual platform have happened uh, more frequently since the lockdown, and they, those have created more lessons to us, et cetera. We are already working on the, on the, on the bills to, to also expand the several trials over the, the virtual platform to a criminal space, because as you know, the Criminal uh, 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 Procedure Act is still uh, steeped in the past. It still talks about officers of court who must be before the court, they must be present, and the witness. So we're trying to work out around those legislation. While at the meantime, we continue to do what is permissible under the current legislation around the virtual platform. I must say that uh, uh, one of the actual, uh, uh, important innovation which will be coming to space very soon is the, maintain, is the online maintenance applications and inquiries. And we'll be launching uh, that program in Deben at the newest court, which the minister have, have, have just opened. Uh, and we hope that after in this year, the remainder of the month should allow us to perfect that model so you can launch it throughout, uh, throughout all the other courts. People need not go to court 
to make an application for inquiry in the same way that SARS is able, we are able to file online, even get our money paid back by SARS. We should be able to upload all the requirements for maintenance inquiries, be able to conduct inquiries, and people can only come to court, come and get orders if need be. But obviously, we want to make sure that orders are also delivered online so that, so that we basically reduce the commotion and the choose at the courts, etc. Uh, uh, one of uh, I'm just giving those which were very direct to us. Um, uh, uh, Yes, I, I, yeah, DG will talk to the issue of the LGBTI uh, 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 programs. I must say that we do have a, a vibrant programs in the department, and I think the GBVF talks to uh, uh, most around those functions. And I think uh, uh, we uh, DG have put measures in place to improve our communication aspect so that aspects such as this are basically giving the necessary uh, 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 priority in terms of our communication. Mr. Swart, Honorable Mr. Swart raised the point around CARA and uh, I must indicate that we have completed the research on the court administration model with various options that basically can be suited to South Africa's constitutional democracy. We have scheduled an engagement with the minister because the minister has asked that we prepare a submission to cabinet and we hope that that, that matter will soon uh, uh, be presented to the portfolio committee once cabinet have been gui have guided us in this process. You remember, Honorable Chair, that there was an IMC set out which was led by them, uh, uh, the, the president at the time of the president. And I think the, the, the view was that cabinet must exp uh, express its view on the broader policy framework that will basically inform legislation, and then comes to cabinet. And now we are now in the space of finalizing the policy uh, process, uh, which will lead to a bill and I think the idea is by the time we come to uh, the minister come to portfolio committee, should be able to present both uh, both scenarios, both the policy and also what the legislative imperative are going to be moving forward. The sense Kara, honourable uh, chair, must just say that Kara already provide uh, a, 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 a provide for measures that are geared to to fight crime and also to strengthen the criminal justice system. And, and the only thing is that perhaps. It, 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 we have not made it so known to this committee. And as a result, people know currently we're only supporting the, the victims of crime, et cetera. Our sexual offense, the, our national uh, 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 strategic plan on the GBVF, on the pres, uh, in, in the presidency, most of the departments, social development, around the Tuzela Care Centers, NPA, are supported through CARA funds. The Tuzela Care Centers were introduced mainly from the donor funding by, 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 by NPA in the past. And when they could not sustain them, we built in quite a lot of coverage from the caravans. So uh, uh, sexual offenses court, to the cell care centers, DST, whatever, they all get the funding. But the reality is that we don't have much from that funding. In fact, we are waiting uh, uh, anxiously to get more funds from the, from the, from the, from the, uh, 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 the ID processes out, out, out of the corruption so they can build uh, uh, quite a, a very respectable balance on the caravan so it can basically expand its, its, its mandate moving forward, et cetera. Uh, moving forward, yes, 45 sites for, yeah. Let me first acknowledge and thank Mr. Jan, Honorable Janji for having been assigned to the court, uh, uh, court services branch. And I, I, work, I look forward to working with you, uh, uh, Honorable, uh, Honorable uh, 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 Member. Uh, we, 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 let, we learned, to, uh, we've already started that process. And, and I think the meeting we've had around the Massive Commission February this year have already helped us to start, start fine tuning some of the areas where we've been very slow and, I, and I'm sure we'll, very, we'll, we'll, we'll be ex expediting our process around the space. I must just say, the 45 sites for audio visual platforms are those sites which are in the hubs, in the bigger centers. And I think that's the starting point. We want to make sure that the big court centers where we have the volumes in terms of cases, the volumes in terms of service delivery, have all the virtual platforms, they've got all the Wi-Fi, solutions, we don't we have addressed the whole issue of the network problems. And then from the 45 sites, we'll then go to the sub districts and other sites which link the 45 sites. By starting the 45 sites, we're already expanding ourselves to all the provinces. So those 45 sites are not only in Gauteng. We have looked them across all the provinces. Then the next phase will then be building them through that. And we've already started to build those phase in our BOP branch operation plan. So that by the time we, we, we come next year, in the in the in the in the APP, we are going to upload some of those so, so those sites. We should be ready by then into our APP. I, I've taken note in terms of the report from the DRGU, and I think 
uh, uh, I will deal with the, with the issue that pertains to infrastructure in particular. DG have raised the point around the infrastructure. And Chair, this has been a, 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 thorny, a, a thorny issue for many, many years with our, our relationship with public uh, services and uh, 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 public works and infrastructure. And I think DG have assigned me to develop a, a framework and I've started to write a framework. And I've, that framework will basically guide our, our interface. And because all this time I've been drafting SLAs and service level agreements, they say nothing because if people miss uh, that don't comply with the service, nothing happens. We are putting in the framework uh, uh, some of the measures that will enable us to withhold the money to give public works. We are giving money to public works on accommodation charges every year. And of the, of the largest amount of 3 billion that we spend on infrastructure, 2.1 billion goes to public works. The other ones for new infrastructure. Now we are saying we should be sent to, to public works. We will not transfer for you this amount we are expected to transfer for you unless you do one, two, three, four in terms of this framework. We know we are going too far, but I think we are coming to a point. And I think the second point is that we are, we are pursuing that they devolve more functions to us because they've got capacity problems. Everybody knows. Let's do those things. We do not want engineers, a, a, a rocket science engineering processes. Let's, let us sort out the, uh, the, 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 the leaking roof. Let us sort, sort out the ceilings. And the and the and the and the and the warning the the the, wear, the, the wearing of, of 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 the carpets whatever etc. Let them come and deal with the impact of the infrastructure from the engineering point of view. And I think we believe that, that with the with the support of the ministers, we should go very far in terms of winning some of the battles. And I think that that framework will present to Honourable Mr. Janji at some point, and then can also come to here to get some guidance moving forward etc. Mr. Janji, I must just say that we do have the massive bill. A, a, a draft in space. And I think uh, Deputy Minister is still guiding that process. And I think at the right time, we'll come uh, forward with that process. And I think we will receive better guidance from your side, etc. Uh, uh, security, our colleague will talk about the issue of security. I must say, uh, Chair, uh, I, I think I've, I've, I've dealt with much of the, of the questions that lead to court services, except those ones I will write, I will put them writing. But Chair, as I, as I, I, I conclude, allow me to say this. One, I am not certainly I'm not one of the 25 percent youth in the department. I was not sure. I was I was surprised to learn that uh, the 75 percent uh, aging is, <laughs> uh, uh, personnel in the department, and that's a clear message that we must give way to the youth to come and take over our position. And as we give way, chair, we still commit to hold the young ones by our, their hands until they come to a point where they can keep this department afloat. And we are going to do, and I can, you can hold me to that my way, DG. After I've departed, I've left this door. I will contrib contribute to the youth, go to Justice College, spend, contribute an hour or two a week, teach the youth in terms of the areas I believe can benefit them to keep this department afloat, et cetera. I'm not going to be like Bafana Bafana. I'm not going to be for a coach of 59 years of age to come and rescue the department. That's why I'm saying, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson, let, uh, we support the DG. Our DG is, is young, and it's the sixth DG. It's not the 24th coach of Bafana Bafana. It's the sixth DG in the department, which basically shows some le level of stability in the department. And I think when we come back, we come and present the annual report, we are really going to show this committee that we have listened to you in, in, in November, October, and that we have done, we have, we have moved uh, from where we are. We are not as, as, as worse as we are. But today, I think that this is being a process of presenting the plans moving forward. And I think in the process, uh, uh, we're also learning on not what are the better things we have done in the past. As a chair, with those few uh, ways, let, let me thank this opportunity and hand over the DG. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I... Yes, Chair, I will try to be, be quick with the colleagues that are remaining. I will invite now um, DDG. I for like that Bafana Bafana coach. <laughs> yes, Honorable Tola, at least here, uh, yeah, I'm not the 24th, I'm the 6th. So, so I will invite the DDG for constitutional development, Dr. Gabriela Lafoy, to deal with the matters around um, hate crimes and awareness campaign on constitutional and human rights uh, issues. Dr. Lafour, you have the floor.
Thank you, DG. Um, Honourable and good afternoon to the members of the committee. Honourable Nivaut Druchen, we share your concern about the surge of uh, hate crimes and hate speech committed against the LGBTI community. And as constitutional development, we have put in place um, a number of indicators to continue the very good work that is done in this area. The work aims to enhance and promote the rights of LGBTIQ persons by putting in place a number of interventions aimed at prevention, promotion, and protection. So um, we are only dealing with the APP indicators here, but what you can't see is our ops plan indicators, which would give you the full picture of all of the work around uh, protection and promotion and enhancement of the rights of LGBTIQ persons. And so in the coming year, we will continue with uh, awareness raising campaigns, which you can see under outcome three of the APP. The constitutional development indicators sit under outcome two, outcome three, and then again under outcome eight. And to get a complete picture, of course, there's the ops plan, which doesn't come up. But um, you'll see that we've increased the number of awareness sessions. And this really goes to prevention because we need to shift people's mindsets in order to address this, uh, this issue. Um, we have also uh, done some work towards a policy revision of the NIS, which will be relaunched this year. We are in discussions with the EU about hosting a conference or dialogue that is going to look at uh, further policy and legislative developments to enhance the protection of the rights of the LGBTI community. And then also we have a number of interventions which look at um, implementation. Uh, so the implementation and enforcement side, we do through the rapid response mechanism where we work together with SAPS and the NPA, and that work also will be continuing during this year. So um, just to sum up, um, the work of constitutional development in relation to the, pre the prevention and promotion and protection of the rights of LGBTIQ works is a priority. Uh, LGBTIQ persons is a priority area and the work which is well established is continuing this year. And we will report throughout the year to committee on the work that we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chair, with your permission, I would like to yield to Mr. Nelson Matibe, the Acting Deputy Director General for Legislative Development. Thank you, DG, uh, Deputy Minister, Chairperson, and Honorable Members of the Committee. Mr. Matibe, if you would, please uh, activate your camera so that the Honorable Members can see you. i do that, um, DG. Um, a question was raised around the delay in um, repealing and replacing apartheid era legislation. Um, honorable chairperson, I can indicate that as far as, as, as long back as 2004, the South African Law Reform Commission um, conducted a provisional audit of national legislation on the statute book uh, since 1910. And it established that roughly 2,800 individual national statute existed on the statute book. Now the methodology that was adopted in the investigation was that uh, in order to review the statute book, uh, one, they needed to, it needed to be done in a systemic way, systematic way uh, by uh, national government, uh, statute administered by national government uh, department. The law commission identified the department reviewed national legislation administered by the department but only for equality and redundancy. It set out its preliminary findings and proposals in a consultation paper 
and consult consulted with the department to verify the commission's preliminary findings and proposals. The next step was to then um, develop a discussion paper in respect to the legislation of the department consent. And upon approval by the commission, the discussion paper was published for general information and comment. Finally, the commission developed a report in respect to the legislation of the department consent and reflected the comments and comments made by respondents. And uh, then the report was compiled. Uh, out of this process, all legislation administered by government departments were uh, then were, 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 were where, where then you know the, the reports were compiled and submitted to the departments. Um, however, it was left to the departments to promote the uh, recommendations made by the uh, Law Reform Commission. Um, some departments um, accepted our recommendations and they. Um, they then uh, promoted legislation uh, through their various uh, portfolio committees. However, because the, what we call the Project 25, um, the statutory law revision was very limited in its approach. Now we are looking at um, uh, reviewing um, Apartheid, apartheid era legislation, the project is ongoing. There was a, a request by uh, one of the members that we provide a written report. Uh, there's, a, there's a report uh, ready for the project 25, which we could make available. It's however a, a pretty long report of about uh, 130 pages we can um, shorten it for the convenience of the committee. I think uh, uh, that's all I can say, Chairperson, thank you. Chair, thank you very much. I will now yield the floor to the DDG for Corporate Services, Ms. Connie Mamecha. Ms. Mamecha, you have Thank you, DG to the Deputy Minister, the Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Members, and the DG, good afternoon. I will deal with the questions that related to the modernization, the SMS vacancies, and the inability to manage the COVID um, risk-adjusted plan, the intents, and um, as well as the legal ombuds office. Um, and the long our long term in terms of uh, modernization um, relating to the audio visual um, remand systems. Um, indeed, Chairperson, we are building on our modernization program. We, we have completed and tested various online services and those services would include the maintenance online um, the deceased estate online, which we are definitely piloting uh, this month. And we are also piloting in this month, the trust services online. Um, we have already finalized the business requirements and signed off on the protection order online. Um, in relation to the expungement of criminal services records, uh, of records, we have already completed the development of that software. Um, and we are at the moment finalizing the National Register of Sexual Offenders via digital channels. Um, the business requirements for the specification for that um, is, 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 is ongoing. Now, Chairperson, we have also finalized and implemented SMS notification relating to maintenance payment through our Moja Pay system. 
um, as well as um, the domestic uh, violence and family advocate um, um, information. Chairperson, we have also in our quest to modernize our courts, we have also implemented um, and um, um, yes, we have also implemented the cashless courts by deploying at least in 25 courts uh, POS devices, which is point of sale devices, and this will assist our court chairperson in terms of payment of bail monies um, via those point of sale um, devices. Our plan in, in terms of this new APP is that we will be rolling out in 400 courts um, in terms of that cashless courts um, devices. Um, we are also rolling out Wi-Fi in various courts, um, Chairperson, to enable those uh, modernization um, initiatives. Uh, 43 of those courts have already been rolled out with the Wi-Fi systems. Um, in terms of the judiciary e-workspace, Chairperson, we are at the testing stage. Um, and there was also a question that related to what is our plan going forward in our, in our outer for a three-year period in terms of the AVR and the court audiovisual um, um, system or solution. We, we have planned, Chairperson, that in this financial year, we will be rolling out about 45, in 45 courts, and in 2022, 2023, we will be rolling out um, about 55. And in 2022, 2024, we'll be rolling out for uh, about 70 courts. And just yesterday, Chairperson, we were at the, north, at the Northwest, we were in interaction with the, um, the regional court president who also indicated that in the Northern, in the Northwest, all their costs have already been um, been connected. Um, I will also deal with the issue of the MS vacancy rate. Indeed, the last time we appeared in the portfolio committee, our SMS vacancy rate was very high. Um, it was at um, more than 22.5 percent. We more than 24 percent. We are now sitting at 22.5 percent. We have out of the the 38 vacancies that we have at SMS level, 23 of those vacancies have been advertised, and we are in the process of filling them. Um, and we are also mindful of the fact that there are budget cuts. So we are looking at um, accommodating them in the remaining 114 million that we have. Um, and, and the remainder of that would always, always obviously go to, to deal with the vacancies at a lower level, more especially in the courts, in the masters and in the family advocate space. Um, Ms. The advocate, advocate J.P. Skosana has actually dealt much with the issue of the COVID risk adjusted plan, um, how we're managing it in terms of our risk, as it, as it has been identified as uh, one of our top risks in the risk register. Uh, just, just to say also, just to indicate also, Chairperson, that um, we have in terms of implementing our RAP, our risk adjusted plan, we have established various governance um, committees from the national level to the provincial level and, and the local level. We've got what we call COVID steering committees, um, justice operational steering committees, JOSC. At the regional level, we've got ROSC and we've got um, ROSC, which is ROSC at the local level. So we are managing those and making sure that we monitor that each and every employee adhere to the health protocols in terms of our, our risk adjusted plan. Um, Chairperson, going to the um, issue of the interns that we, we have, um, additional to the existing ones that we had in the financial, last financial year, we have also 
employed about 254 um, uh, new interns, and we have just signed an MOU with uh, SACITA for additional 30 graduate interns and 87 candidate attorneys that we will be employing in this financial year. And our aim there is also to look at the ages between 18 and 35, so that we also consider the fact that we need to increase our youth uh, complement in the in the organization. We in terms of the the office of the legal ombudsman. Um, yes, we we ha we have um, began the the process of operationalizing the office. A team of officials with an acting director have been seconded to the office um, from the department, and they are currently busy with uh, looking at finding an office space where they can operate from. Um, a meeting between the, the judge, Judge Desai, and the team has been scheduled for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to brainstorm on how they, they are going to be operationalizing it. But in the meantime, Chairperson, we, while they are still looking for an office space, we have dedicated two cell phones that will have a number that will be advertising for those that would want to, to, to submit their, their queries via cell phones in the meantime. So that number on Monday will be given to Judge Desai and, and for the team to publicize it for the community. Um, I think I have dealt with almost everything that I needed to deal with. Um, on that note, Chairperson, I would like to thank you. Chair, thank you very much. With your permission, I would like to yield the floor to the Acting Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Ntlantlam Tembo, who is with Mr. Joanne Jensen, to deal with the issues around uh, gender-based budgeting, as well as the reduction of wasteful and irregular expenditure by, 60, by 70 and 55 percent. Mr. Mtembo, I yield the floor to you. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, uh, DG uh, and Chairperson, uh, committee members and colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm not too sure, DG, whether you can see my face. Certainly we can. Yes, we you, can. You, you just remove the video. Oh, yes. okay. No thank, no, thank you very much, DG. Um, there was a question posed uh, regarding the uh, 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 by the chairperson regarding the target set for irregular expenditure and 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 and, and full dress and wasteful expenditure that the targets are low. And 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 I want to 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 in a way uh, 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 concur with the chairperson, but provide this context that chairperson this relates to historical irregular and with full expenditure that you want to push in dealing with them to make sure that they are indeed, you know, dealt with and eliminated so that at least our balance will continuously reduce. That is one aspect. But the second aspect is that uh, in our operational plan, we are sitting with also a similar target where we are saying for current financial year, our target is that uh, uh, if there's any, you know, uh, 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 irregular or fruitless and wasteful expenditure cases that could be uh, picked up in one way or the other, that they do not exceed, uh, you know, 5% uh, of our total expenditure for the current financial year. But with regard to historic cases, we are working hard to make sure that those cases indeed are, are, are dealt with. And, and, and that's the balances are, are indeed reduced. Um, with regard to gender-based budgeting, gender-based budgeting is, though it may not appear in, 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 in various targets of 
the APP, but it, it already sitting in all our cost items uh, of, of, of the budget. For example, as part of our recruitment drive, in particular at SS, SMS level, a middle management level, and all other 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 other, other levels. Um, uh, the department is working hard to make sure that at least there's gender balance. At SMS level, already most of the positions that you want to fill are targeting women, in particular even in the finance space. Similarly with middle management level as well as, 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 as many other levels below that. But we are also dealing with this. Uh, you have seen, Chairperson, that in our APP, we had included one indicator that is specifically dealing the, with procurement that will be targeted towards a, a female, you know, a, a, a supplier, uh, which is about 10%. And that's what we are as a department, we are also doing in response to a, 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 a promoting a, 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 a women participation in, 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 in all of our procurement activities. With regards to um, um, uh, uh, our current expenditure, uh, Chairperson, you you when you were raising your, your, your or you were making a comment, you used our December reported expenditure pertains as point of reference. And indeed, our expenditure was not promising at the time. It was sitting at about just over 60%. And I want to confirm that uh, Chairperson, uh, during the fourth quarter, our expenditure moved by 30, over 30% uh, to an extent that by the end of the financial year, our total expenditure performance was sitting at 95% uh, against our uh, budget, budget allocation. 95%. Yes, it may not be the most desired uh, uh, expenditure performance, uh, but 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 indeed there was a huge improvement in the last quarter uh, in terms of our expenditure performance. I want to also to confirm that a lot of um, uh, positions had been advertised, which some of them had already been uh, filled uh, both in the department, uh, in the NPA, and in the magistrate in the magistrate commission which definitely will then see our expenditure performance in the current financial year improving, improving. About 60% or just under 60% of our budget is on compensation of employees. And, and, and the more we fill our positions, uh, 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 the more our expenditure patterns will improve, but that will also have indirect you know, implications for our goods and services budget because it means that we will also be having more people to be able to help the department to move uh, all the projects and programs that are budgeted under our goods and services, which in turn will improve our expenditure performance. Um, we have done, uh, we have also looked into our procurement processes uh, to see how best we can really a, 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 a use them to assist, assist the department expenditure performance. And, 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 and chairperson and committee members, we have put in a system that will ensure that one, that all our uh, 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 procurement initiatives are awarded uh, for, uh, before uh, existing contracts uh, expire, two months before the expiry of the existing contracts. That is one initiative that we have put in place. And this will also have you know, a positive you know, uh, impact in terms of us also uh, drastically reducing any opportunities of, 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 of contract extensions, but any opportunities for any you know, a, a, a contracts that will continue post the, the end of the contract that's resulting to irregular expenditure. So that, that, that what we have put in place, I want to confirm that um, uh, uh, SM positions uh, 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 are being advertised and are being filled. Uh, uh, the DT contract uh, management position, um, uh, uh, each shortlisting uh, has happened uh, uh, in this week, which will also make a positive contribution 
uh, in the improvement of our contract management processes. And I want to believe that the two directors, uh, uh, strategic um, sourcing and contract management, as well as acquisition and logistic management, would be in the advert uh, in this weekend, which would also assist in making sure that uh, we have stability in our SEM uh, processes. And our target is to make sure that within six weeks or, or within two months, all those positions would have been filled. Um, audit has already started uh, and, 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 and uh, 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 it's in both national office and, uh, and in the regions. Uh, I know that this week they were in uh, Houghton region and uh, I think they're completing their work uh, this week and next week is going to be Eastern Cape and uh, we are having an audit steering committee meeting on a weekly basis which I chair and so far uh, uh, committee members uh, we have not uh, received uh, any uh, matters that, 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 that are concerning at this stage. You will see as they go to all the other regions and state attorney offices and all other service points what we pick up from there. I think I would want to uh, uh, pause here, uh, Chairperson, and I'm sure that uh, matters pertaining to uh, state capture funding as well as the uh, 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 issues around Bosasa, I'm sure that the DG will be able to handle that. Thank you. Um, sorry, Mr. Mtembo. Are you saying that you have targeted 10% of procurement to go to women businesses, is that correct? It, it, it is correct, uh, Chair, uh, at this stage, just 200% uh, owned businesses owned by, 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 by females in terms of our own, uh, uh, discretionary procurement, meaning tenders. Uh, because yes, uh, in the past, there would be a, a, a procurement that where women would be benefiting, but to find that they are director, they are direct, they are partners in those companies. But this 10% is basically targeting 100% owned, you know, a, a, a business. We have been allocating business to a, a female, you know, a companies, but when one was checking at the our performance, it was under five percent for me, which was not a, a, a a good performance there. So we'll be having targeted, you know, interventions to make sure that at least we do achieve that 10%. But if you perform more than that 10%, it would be better. But because we are still starting to target those 100% uh, female old companies, we said we'll set the target at 10%, which will be increasing uh, uh, in, in future in future years. That's true. But you are aware that there is a cabinet approved policy of 40%. Oh, now Chairperson, then I, um, uh, 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 I may have missed that. We will, we will then uh, 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 amend accordingly with, uh, the opportunity that you'll get. But what we'll then do is that in terms of our own uh, operational plan, we will amend accordingly so that we sit with 40%, but maybe at the, at the uh, when the opportunity to review our APP, uh, we will then amend this uh, target accordingly, uh, 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 obviously with the permission of the DG and the Deputy Minister. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, teacher. Chair, just for your comfort on this matter, I have instructed the colleagues in strategy to make sure that the branch operational plan uh, which uh, Mr. Mtembo is responsible for, must raise that number to even more than 40%. So, so whilst this 10% is a base, the requirement is uh, more than 40%. So I'll still monitor it from the branch operational plan. And even when we report, I'll make sure that uh, we don't run away and focus on the 10%, but we'll focus on the cabinet required 40%. I think as you are still here, I think there's one issue that we did not pick up. If you can just respond to it or somebody responds to it. Um, from, the pro, from, the, uh, from the APPs, 
It seems that a target of 3% of people living with disability was removed. Is that correct? Was it removed, like 3%? Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, that target is, is managed at, uh, at the business operational plan. It's not removed, but it's managed at the BOP. For our own monitoring uh, uh, purposes, we must be able to see what we monitor. So if something is hidden somewhere, we can't, then we can't be, we can't, we can't be able to monitor it. It's like that um, budgeting for the women, in fact, the gender-based budgeting. The more you explain it, we won't be able to see it. And then for us, it will remain as, as if it's not there. So I think there will be a greater transparency. We'll, we'll do that, uh, Chairperson. But I also need to mention that in the previous financial year, Chairperson, this target was achieved. So that is the reason why actually we moved it there. But I think we hear what you're saying, and I think it's going to be important that we actually, uh, as we report, we inform the committee about it as well. Thank you very much. Okay. I see that there. Sorry, teacher. I, I think there are members who want to make follow-ups. Uh, sorry, teacher. Uh, okay. Honorable Nivold Trushant and Honorable Janji. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm not sure if I missed the response uh, to my question with regard to the universal access for people with disabilities. And I would like to add to um, the, the strategy, the national strategy um, on the universal access of people with disabilities. I just want an update to that, but I wanted to know, you know, a more detailed breakdown of the interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Janji. Uh, no, thank you, Chair. My apology for interfering in your in, in your chairing. I I was I just got curious on the and and I decided not to wait until the end so that the DM when he comes and the DG can speak to that as well. But uh, I'm not expecting a response today. It's on the issue that you raised, the gender-based budgeting. I am happy with the response that has come in so far, but it's limited because the response is important in the sense that it speaks about how they prioritize it, women appointment. That is important. But I want, I want them to, to do more homework, to go beyond that because gender-based budgeting is, is not confined to women uh, in terms of appointment uh, as women. Um, they, 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 they need to just do work and clarify that because, for example, when J.P. Skosana uh, says they are prioritizing the issue of maintenance court as virtual, that speaks to that. So if, if you're prioritizing your kind of gender base in those kind of things, your issues of sexual court, so want to see that in the other plans, how the plans themselves, because we're mainstreaming, this is the issue here. You are mainstreaming the gender based so so that it goes beyond just the, us seeing a, a, a woman in a particular position. It's how the services are responding. I guess that that's that's what you're looking for. And I'm saying I don't necessarily need them to respond to that, but that's something that they need to go back and work on so that they lift up those issues. And I'm saying I'm, I'm picking up one or two already that, in my view, is responding to issue of gender-based prioritization uh, and, and budgeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Janji. Uh, Chair? Chair, thank you very much. I think uh, I mean, the, the leaf of wisdom just ca that came from Honorable Janji is very helpful. And, and I think uh, it helps us to, to be broad in terms of what we understand to be gender-based uh, uh, budgeting. And indeed, when we come back, we'll be reflecting on those I would uh, request um, Mr. Mashangu for under two minutes to deal with the issues around uh, the apex risk and the specified mitigating factors. Mr. Mashangu. Uh, thanks, DG. Honorable Chair, uh, 
with the issue of the risk number eight that deals with COVID, uh, I think uh, DDG Corporate Services uh, responded partly to it. I just want to add a few things on that uh, risk. We are currently having courts in the department that are being upgraded. Um, we are temporarily using structures that are mobile offices that are not necessarily compliant to the all the controls uh, because of their size to an extent that uh, public needs to get the services from those uh, offices. And beyond the what we're trying to do to save our officials together with the public from the pandemic, beyond the mask, we have provided our officials with some visors to ensure that uh, we minimize the risks. However, we're also speeding the process of turnaround in relation to the specific services that the public comes uh, come to those offices so as to ensure that they don't spend much time in that. Uh, two, we've got officials with comorbidities. And in this case, some of those officials, our function, it's mainly to service the public and some of them are our court clerks uh, whose function is solely in the courtroom. So we find it, we find it difficult as a department to relocate such officials, uh, much that we are trying our best to ensure that we keep the safe distance, but we cannot remove them most of the time from, from their, their, their service points due to, 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 to the function that they are charged with. Uh, lastly, Chairperson, I think the from time to time when we get the regulations from the NCCC, in some cases we find ourselves whereby we are to reduce capacity at our service points and not necessarily operate, operate 100%. And uh, at our small courts, whereby you find only two officials are charged with a certain responsibility. And we, uh, to, 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 to address the issue of uh, uh, not having 100% capacity at the courts, we uh, implement rotation. And when one official is on rotation, officially so, and one is on duty physically at work, then should the person that uh, is at work uh, fall sick, then we try to recall the person who's on rotation, but it takes time. At that point in time, uh, service delivery is uh, compromised. Now, coming to the mitigation plans, the colleague, the DDGs that has already made submissions, starting from the Solicitor General, some of the mitigation plans that uh, are in place, they've already talked to I, uh, I remember I also indicated the issue of the contract management as to what is in place. And uh, Advocate DG Corporate Services has al already indicated as to what the department is doing in, uh, in addition to what I said earlier on, in making sure that the vacancies uh, at the strategic level are being addressed. Uh, I think, uh, Honorable Chair, for now, that's what I, I have to share with the, the portfolio committee. Thanks, not unless there are other issues that needs to be attended to. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, Chair, with your permission, I would like to invite Advocate Skosana to deal with the question on universal uh, access that was raised by Honorable uh, Velmani Vodbrachen in a follow-up. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm trying to put my camera on here. It's not responding positively. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, two, two aspects have been attended uh, in terms of that. Firstly, our, our model of, 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 of sexual offenses courts already include within it the whole element of universal access, uh, 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 access to just for people uh, with vulnerable with disabilities. And what we have done in terms of that chair, one, we, we, we put in the, the development of a minimum standards that should basically cut across all the courts. We're using the sexual offenses courts 
simply because the infrastructure there is already um, a, a, a compliant or amenable or, or kind of a, a more improved towards addressing those kind of challenges. And part of the minimum standards that we are putting in the document talks to matters like your, your own access in terms of physical uh, access to the courts, as well as aspects that pertaining to, to, to sign languages, for example, uh, if, if uh, Ms. Pile was uh, should share uh, that uh, the, the, the introduction of the amendment uh, to your constitution that includes the, 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 the sign language as one of the official languages is part of our APP in this financial year. And not only have we started to wait for legislation, we've already put in place programs uh, uh, that start uh, building in this kind of service at our courts. Who are in liaison with the, with the with the with the NGOs that basically should help us build a pool of 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 of, of those service providers so that by the time the legislation comes to space, uh, the department have put in forward uh, uh, measures in place to meet that kind of constitutional obligation. Because when it gets enacted, it will basically be a matter of the constitution, and any non-compliance will basically expose government. To, to, to a myriad of litigation matters, whatever. So we're running parallel with the process, but I think we will be able to share with, with, with the committee the, 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 the minimum standards we are developing as part of meeting the, the, the basic needs of persons with disabilities and we're expanding them through all the courts as we move forward. Thanks, uh, thanks DG, I hope I've covered uh, part of uh, the questions as asked, thanks. Thank you. Chair, with your permission, I'll briefly speak to some issues that uh, colleagues have left out uh, for me. The, the first one relates to consequence management uh, as part of what has been identified by the Auditor General in, in the report of the previous financial year. We, we have started efforts to rebuild the Labor Relations Unit, which had over the years had challenges that led to a collapse. But we also have committed ourselves to getting an external capacity in a short-term contracts to come and address all the backlog in so far as grievances are concerned and disciplinary processes are concerned. And our plan as the executive, I mean, a senior management is that by the end of the first quarter, which is end of June, we'll want to reduce all grievances or disciplinary matters to under 5%. Now, Part, part of what as well I have, uh, I have tried to implement uh, or I'm implementing is uh, we have what contributes a great deal to our irregular expenditure is contracts that expire and then there's a request for them to be extended. I have told the acting CFO that any request that he makes to me to extend expired contracts must be accompanied by a plan on consequence management to say who was responsible for the expire. Because for the few weeks that I've been in office, I have had to deal with many contracts that have expired. And of course, part of what we're doing as an intervention is to fill those vacancies in contract management. And we currently have a challenge, we, we as you will know, in relation to those forensic reports that were presented the chief financial officer, the chief director supply chain, uh, and, and the other senior managers are currently undergoing disciplinary processes. As I said, during the minister's overview, our plan really is that in the next 30 days, these cases must be concluded. There have been delays since last year, COVID was used as an excuse, but also as part of the strategies of defense, they have been deploying all strategies that have led to these delays. So we have impressed on our representatives to make sure that uh, these cases are concluded in the next 30 days. Now, the, the, the issue of vacancies, yeah, we will try and deal with them as well in the next, uh, in this current quarter to make sure that those other vacancies, the director of contract management and the deputy director and the other uh, senior management related uh, posts in that space are also filled. The second part uh, relating to the SMS vacancy rate, I, I think we, we have sort of crossed the 50% mark in terms of dealing with what were vacancies last year. In, in the executive management committee, which I chair, you will note that some few months ago, the director general was acting 
the chief master was acting, the DDG for corporate services was acting, and so on and so forth. And there was also an acting for constitutional development. So half of Exco now has newly appointed um, or, or, or newly assigned uh, members. And at that level, I think um, we are only left with a chief state law advisor, which process some advice as well will be concluded by the end of this quarter, which is end of June. And linked to that, of course, um, the acting of the Solicitor General is not the same as the other actings. It's a, it's a so generous situation because the act specifically makes mention of the fact that the minister can appoint an acting Solicitor General. However, I will engage with the minister and the deputy minister to move the process forward for stabilizing that space so that we move away from having an active Solicitor General to a long-term uh, Solicitor General. There was an issue about uh, what we are doing to build capacity to deal with attrition and so on and so forth. I have asked the DDG for corporate services to work on a talent management, career pathing and succession plan. So they have a clear instruction in that respect that by the end of this quarter, we should be having that plan so that uh, the experienced colleagues, before we lose them, they should start exposing and training uh, the, the, the new breed that will take over the baton. And we are grateful to people like DDG Advocates Kosana, who really indeed has availed himself and is assisting us a great deal in terms of seeking to build that capacity, to build that new cadership that will manage this department into the future. And he continues to avail, you know, his experience and skills to all of us in Exco and, and really is assisting us. We we have just, like the DDG has said, we got extra uh, assistance funding from SACITA and we'll be able to absorb over and above the 250 interns that we have, uh, 30 uh, non-candidate tennis uh, interns and 87 interns that will be placed all over the country in the offices of state attorneys. But what we are doing as well, we're trying to develop a framework on internship that will lead in some way to identification of the best, the brightest and cream de la cream that will absorb into the department. Part of what I've discovered since I came in and, uh, and I'm interacting with the department, I faced a very terrifying reality that in the core branches, you, you, you don't have entry level to the, there's no pipeline that allows people to come in into the area of masters, come in into the area of legislative development, to come in into the area of court services and constitutional development. So what you see is a capacity in the support related areas and, and this shocked me, but, but I, I didn't stop from being shocked. I have told the DDG corporate services that we need a clear plan that will make sure that we build capacity and reopen those entry points for the pipeline because it can't be that the Department of Justice doesn't have posted at the junior level to absorb the newly qualified young lawyers who are, you know, who are out there and would want to be trained and be exposed to the strategic management of the Department of Justice so that when all of us leave, we can comfortably hand over to them. The, the issue of hate speech and the LGBTIQ plus community and the, the spike in violence and incidences of, you know, murder that we have seen, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Nibo Drachen. I must say shamefully, I must admit that as a department, we dropped the ball on this matter. And, and, and we, 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 we are aware of, of that. We have allowed structures like the national task team, the provincial task team to, to collapse. And we are taking drastic steps to address the situation. Two days ago, the minister, the deputy minister and myself met with the community and they have unambiguously presented their concerns about the non-availability of the Department of Justice in addressing these issues. And we have committed ourselves, we have given the next 21 days that on my part, administratively, I'll make sure that we address the challenges in the department, but the minister and the deputy minister at their level will address the high level issues. I'm sure the DM will speak to some of those issues. So it's a matter that I'm prioritizing to build this capacity so that 
even in the programs that we are talking about, in the operational plan of the branches, we will want this issue of the LGBTIQ plus community prominently reflected and we'll monitor it and we'll be willing when we come back here to give an account of what indeed we'll have done. The, the funding of the State Capture Commission, Minister has spoken about the 75 million. The 75 million was a deficit that the commission incurred between January and March. Now we approach Treasury and Treasury explain to us the challenges and the constraints they had because the budgeting process was finalized. So the department was asked to scrape around and see if we could find money. And indeed we managed to find the 75 million to fund the deficit of January to March. As honorable members know, the commission's term has, has been extended by court for the first, from the 1st of April to the end of June. And we have asked the secretary to give to us a projected budget. And they told us that they will require about 90 million. We, we have approached treasure and impressed on treasury that the state capture commission is not a department of justice commission, despite the fact that we are the custodian of the commission's act. But the funding thereof, it will be unfair to say must come from the baseline of the department of justice. We have in the previous financial years as a department come forward to rescue the commission by money that we had that was coming from our under expenditure. But our commitment was that this financial year, our expenditure has to be up somewhere in the region of 99.9%. And with the capacity we have, I'm confident that we should be able to fund. So I'm in discussion with the Director General of Treasure to find ways and means, including possibility of the rollover of the budget of the department that was not expended last year into this financial year so that we can fund the 90 million that the commission requires. For now, what we have done for the month of April is to avail 4.4 million that just pays for the salaries of the commission staff and uh, the miscellaneous services, including communication. So the discussion continues between me and the director general, and we hope that soon uh, through the rollover, we should be able to find that required 90 million. And we can only hope and hope that it won't be more than that 90 million and that 90 million will assist the commission to conclude its work by the end of, uh, of June. The, the audit committee, uh, Honorable Chair, we, we have extended the current committee because their term came to an end at the end of the financial year, but the audit period continues until end of June. So we have extended them, but we have done an advertisement and members of public have responded. So in the meantime, we'll run a process to ensure that by 15th of August, we have a new committee. We met with the committee already and uh, yesterday there was an induction of the two new members, but we're also taking them through the plans as an entire, an entire committee. And we're planning that the committee will be able to brief the minister and the deputy minister sometimes next week. And I think when we come for the BRR, we hope that we'll have an opportunity to come with them because they shared some of the concerns that the portfolio committee has shared uh, throughout the whole of last year. And, and, and they are assisting us a great deal to attend to some of the issues and nip in the bud the challenges that the department is facing. To towards closure, maybe chair, the, the, the question and then a fundamental question that Honorable Janche had raised about whether the plans that we have respond to the request that this committee has made. We, 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 upon my appointment, the second week, I met with the chairperson of the Public Service Commission, who told me that uh, he heard that the, com the committee was considering having us placed under administration under the Public Service Commission. I then invited him to come and meet the entire senior management of the department, and he made this presentation and he raised this concern. Collectively, as the senior management, we made a plea to him we said you must give us 100 days, starting from the 1st of April, which will end by the end of June, which is the first quarter of the performance year. That you must allow us to implement the turnaround plans that we have. 
And we said to him, if in 100 days we are not turning the corner, we are inviting him to come and put us under administration. So this is the commitment that we as the senior management of the department have made. And, and the answer to what uh, Honorable Janshi was raising about whether these plans indeed respond to that call, the answer is in the affirmative that indeed this plan that the senior management of the department has come up with was responding to the concerns that the, the, the portfolio committee had, 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 had raised. And when we look at the performance of the last quarter, January to end of March, the light at the end of the tunnel is beginning to be getting brighter because the performance in the last quarter indicates that we've broken through the psychological threshold of 60%. You'll recall that 2019, 2020, the records show that the department was performing in the low 50s. And we think that this indicates that we have arrested the unabated downward spiral and regression. And this could be an uh, encouraging news that indeed the department is about to turn the corner. In conclusion, Chair, there are just key eight points that as senior management we have identified. They may not be coming out clearly and prominently in the, in, in the plans, but that are embedded in the plans as part of our turnaround. There are these eight points. One was to have us make sure that our threat plan and our APPs are clear and concise and follow the SMART principles and were clear about the 77 objectives and under which programs they have to be identified. Over and above that, we are institutionalizing, having branches have operational plans that seek to expand on those plans, including our regional offices have been directed to develop operational plans that directly speak to the APP and have them cascaded down to the court and area uh, court management level. And over and above that, we have agreed that the senior managers, their performance agreements will clearly reflect the plans as contains in the APP and in the strike plan. So we will know who is responsible for each outcome. And even when we come before this committee, each of the senior members will bear responsibility for none or for poor performance in their areas that they are responsible for. Second, the structure of the department, which has to follow the strategy that we have. We are finalizing it, making sure that people are placed in the right places in terms of the structure. Third, human development, capacity building. We have finalized the strategy for the repositioning of the Justice College that will make strategic interventions in terms of developing skills for, for, for the officials. As a result, this month we will be conducting skills audits to determine the skills that people lack in the department. And linked to that as well, we have agreed to conduct culture and climate survey this quarter in order to get a sense of what the officials think about the department and make sure that we address those challenges. So in this respect, we are reviewing the departmental service delivery improvement plan, which was in place over the past five years, and we commit to finalize it by the end of this quarter. And, and seven, the issue of compliance has been a major concern from GPSA that this department has not been in the habit of complying with laws, regulation, prescripts, and directives. We have agreed that the performance agreements of every senior manager will have to reflect, reflect this aspect so that whenever we identify non-compliance, consequence, consequences will follow that particular action. And eight, lastly, Chair, is the audit turnaround that historical matters that the Auditor General had raised with us, until we deal with them, we will not be able to get the department out of qualification. So we have agreed that we have set, put a place, I mean, in place an audit plan, a turnaround plan, which the Chief Internal Audit Executive has to help us implement to make sure that uh, we, we, we get out of uh, qualifications. Now, if I was a football coach, taking an analogy of football, I was going to say what we plan to do this year is not to win the league, but to move out of relegation into top eight with the hope that we'll win the top eight competition. So we have said that by next year, the department has to be unqualified. 
And in the medium term, which is in 36 months, we aim to have the department receive a clean audit. So this is the vision we have impressed on all the colleagues in senior management. But together with uh, DDG Skosana, who's currently responsible for operations of our regions, we are moving around the country in the cold phase of service delivery to meet with the officials of the department to understand really where they are, what the department from head office should be doing to assist them with capacity, to clarify the vision and, and, and assist them in terms of making sure that we improve the services that we provide to the people of this country. So we, we hope that uh, by the time we're done with the last uh, uh, province, which will be in the first six months of this current year, we'll have a clear picture, but we'll also have assisted all the officials of the department to appreciate what the department is going through in terms of trying to turn around. We are getting services of experts to come in and assist us with change management because we don't necessarily have the skills ourselves, but we said we'll get expertise from other state entities and even from the private sector to come and assist us so that by the end of this performance cycle, we must be presenting a report that can clearly account for how we have expended on the resources that have been entrusted to us. With this few words, uh, Honorable Chair, I would like to yield to the Deputy Minister. Okay, okay. Uh, do you? Sorry, uh, just trying to get the, 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 the iPad was charging. Uh, thanks very much, DG, and, and thanks very much, um, Chairperson and members of the committee. This is largely the, uh, the department's exercise um, in that when the DG came in, a lot of work was put into the strategic plan and the annual performance plan. Um, so it's, it's, more, um, it's more their document, and I'm glad that, that the officials have, have um, been engaging with the committee uh, on this. Um, as the DG has said, he's, he's, um, we haven't had a DG for some time. Um, the acting DGs had done their best, but it's, it's more difficult when, you, uh, when you're acting. So we're really hopeful that, that he will uh, bring substantial changes to the department. Uh, maybe just a couple of issues, though. Um, there's the, the issue of um, the court optimization plan or committee which um, we set up, it's in the, I think it's in the strategic plan or the annual performance plan to, to try and address the backlogs in the magistrates courts, um, uh, the district courts and the regional courts. Um, from the statistics we have, and we can come and do a specific presentation if need be, the court optimization committee is, is sort of involving all the stakeholders, um, the, the magistrates, uh, the chief magistrates, the regional court presidents, um, the, the uh, court services officials from Department of Justice, MPA, it's, it's Advocate de Kock that sits there, Correctional Services, SAPS, etc. Uh, we, had, we had a bit of a teething problem with, I think, some of the senior officials of the department not seeing this as a priority, but I think that's been addressed. We're currently having a problem with the regional court presidents uh, not wanting to attend because they feel it impinges on the uh, indep their independence. Um, the chief magistrates are, are, um, have, don't have those problems. I have challenged the regional court presidents as to give us examples of when they've been told what to do. Uh, as they claim, they haven't come back to me. I've referred the matter to the chairperson of the magistrates uh, commission uh, at, at Judge Ledwaba, um, so I'm hopeful he will address those problems, but that's sort of one, one element. That issue throws up in, interesting issues on um, the, the, the issue of an independent court administration. And as I think Advocate Skosana had spoken, it's an area that, that is still work in progress. And it's something I think that even the portfolio committee needs to be in, engaged in. If the judiciary administer the courts, then who do they account to uh, when things go wrong? They can't as judiciary account, I think, to parliament uh, because there's a separation of, of well, they, they, they definitely can't on judicial functions. 
uh, would there be confusion if they've got to start accounting on court administrative functions? I mean, currently we're implementing the Superior Courts Act, which sets out the judicial functions, exclusive judicial functions, and court administration in terms of that act at the Superior Courts level is, 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 basically, um, is basically shared. So um, I, I think to Honorable Swat, I think it's something that, that we all need to be engaged on, on more. How is this going to work in practice? Um, uh, particularly when it comes to accountability. Um, and then there's other issues of, of if the judiciary is appointing uh, staff members, uh, who's going to deal with the disputes, um, the labor disputes? I mean, currently in the Superior Courts Act, it's the minister appoints uh, with the concurrence of the head of court. So the minister gets, gets taken to court. But if it's the judiciary appointing a staff, um, which court is going to adjudicate on, on, on those disputes? Um, the constitution does anyway refer to a member of cabinet responsible for the administration of justice. Uh, so that would probably, if one, yeah. Anyway, th those are all issues I think we need to debate more. Um, I just want to raise the DG had, had um, said yes, the department had, had um, not performed as it should have um, on the LGBTI issues. Uh, and as he'd said, there was a meeting with uh, the minister, myself and himself and civil society organizations in that sector. Uh, I'm, it's something I'm extremely unhappy with the department and the department and the DG know this um, with the issue of, of um, the structures, um, the national task team and the rapid response team uh, not functioning properly. But hopefully those issues we will be uh, will be addressed. And then just on the issue of, of I think Advocate Skosana had mentioned it, the issue of the sign language interpretation um, uh, that, that uh, sorry, of, of sign language as an official language um, that has gone a bit slower than we had hoped. Uh, but the, um, the, the legislation for the inclusion as the president had announced of sign language uh, as an official language would be going to, to cabinet um, shortly um, uh, in terms of it, it's a constitutional amendment. So there's a specific procedure that has to be followed of the bill being uh, published first, sent to provincial legislatures, etc. So uh, look, in short though, I, I think that um, we've got a new director general um, he's bringing stability and accountability to, to the position. And let's, let's, um, let's hope that, that and, and definitely from the executive, we will be uh, looking at, at supporting him, but also monitoring the work of the department uh, to, to ensure that it's, it's better functioning and better addresses uh, the issue of bringing access to justice to the people of South Africa. Thanks, Chairperson. No, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, thank you to the DG and the team. Uh, we are looking forward to be engaging you uh, when you come back um, for the quarterly reports. Um, because um, I think from what you are saying, uh, there, is, there is a lot of work that has been done and a lot that has, is on the pipeline. And we think that if everything you say can be implemented, we will be in a position to see a new and a better Department of Justice. Um, one of the issues that you might think of looking at is this issue of the infrastructure. Um, because when you engage with the judiciary, there are things that are more of an irritation, the leaking roofs, um, those things that can be dealt with easily by, by artisans. Um, I know the process of engaging with the Department of Infrastructure and Public Works is a complicated one. But I do think that you must also think about issues of shared services. At some point, uh, Advocate Skosana did a um, report on an innovative program that they used in, I think, in one of the high courts in Middleburg, 
where they even used uh, some some of the inmates uh, to do some work in that court. Because I think the situation that we are in now with the um, economy performing very badly, revenue being very, uh, in fact, we are not, um, uh, we don't have money as a state. What is needed is more innovation from managers and from politicians as to how do we ensure that we get more, we achieve more with less. Um, you have um, um, the Department of Correctional Services, for instance, they said that to deal with infrastructure issues they have on their part appointed engineers and quantity surveyors. So one of the issues that you should be looking at, why can't that be a shared service uh, with yourself and the Department of Correctional Services? You have artisans from the SOCs, especially from Transnet, uh, ESCOM, and DINEL. And uh, a lot of them, over 4,000 of them, that can be used to deal with issues relating to plumbing, electricity in courts, so that we can be able to deal with issues that are not major infrastructure, but that are more of an irritation, but also that can uh, bring a quick um, um, interventions to some of the irritating problems that are the lack of water, lack of electricity and all of those issues. So I, I would, uh, I would uh, uh, recommend to you Titi, that maybe you, you can also meet with the National Commissioner, you can also meet with the DG uh, Public Enterprises to look at what type of immediate relief to those innovative uh, programs we can bring to, to, to the lower judiciary, especially to the magistrate courts. Even to some of the courts, for instance, uh, I think there are problems in Pumalang and Bombela High Court. And some of them, um, I'm told that uh, they are relating to plumbing services. The artisans that are being trained by ESCOM and, uh, and DINEL are the best in the country and no uh, FET produces better artisans than those artisans. But most of them, they have been trained by the state, paid for by the state. The state must use their services to try and uh, alleviate the challenges that we are faced with currently. But I do think that um, um, uh, from what we have heard, the plans that you have as the department, um, we will be able to test them when you come back for quarterly reports uh, and even for a B triple R and the test will be in the pudding then. And um, uh, I will, we will not comment uh, with regard to your, your engagement with public uh, service with the chairperson of public service and administration. Uh, we will not comment because uh, it's a, it's now a resolution of the house, um, but we will engage with it when we come when you come back for a triple R reports. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister. Thank you for availing yourself, and thank you to the department and uh, members. I think uh, let's have a stretch break until two o'clock because it's already half past so that we can start with the, with the NPA. Uh, thanks, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chairperson, we're honored. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. So, committee secretary, must we switch off? Uh, must we move out of the or we must just uh, wait until two o'clock?
area that we see. The first one is the co-location of investigators, the DPCI investigators, um, and the uh, together in the NPA regional offices. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, but Chair, this is a huge deal. Um, the the, the co-located model of the NPA AFU staff, as well as the DPCI investigators, was a very successful model. Um, you know, about between uh, six and ten years ago. Um, but for some reason, that, that model was dismantled. And so Advocate Rabaji has been, and even myself initially, had discussions with General De Beer. And, and there's been an agreement now that the, the financial investigation capabilities within the DPCI are now going to be co-located with the asset forfeiture professionals in the AFU. And this chair will make a huge difference. And so we are very excited about this development. And, and um, you know, we've had, I, I can, in fact, um, Advocate Rabaji can already talk to some of the successes that have already been, been streaming through in, in this particular space. Um, and, and I want to say, Chair, you know, we often talk about asset forfeiture only in the context of, or primarily in the context of high level corruption. But when you look at, some of the cases recently that the asset forfeiture unit has been dealing with, there is even the potential for asset forfeiture in, in gender-based violence and femicide cases. There was a particular case um, where there was a vehicle in Polokwane that was stopped and searched by the police, and they were found in, in the head of a young woman was found in this car. And they were then linked to the killing of a 17-year-old young child and you know, in Tabi Singh Mosomane. And in this particular case, the asset forfeiture unit acted and seized the, the motor vehicle. Um, and and you know, it was then forfeited to the state, although it was an amount of only 15,000 rands at the end of the day that the that came into Kara. But it shows that we were able to, asset forfeiture is an instrument that can be used in so many different contexts. I'm not gonna go into too much of detail on this, but there've been other really good recent um, asset forfeiture um, cases with regard to environmental crimes, with regard to illicit financial flows. And, and I can certainly say that under the leadership of Advocate Rabaji, together now with her able lieutenant in Advocate Priya Baseswa, two competent women, asset forfeiture is certainly going to show a lot more results in the near future least because there was no collaboration. It was they were working in silos and the prosecutors had no ideas what the what the asset forfeiture staff were doing. The asset forfeiture didn't know what was going on with the prosecutions. And as we know, with the with the with the uh, conf with the criminal with the chapter five confiscations, which is uh, conviction based, you need the cases to move quicker so that the money can be recovered. So that relationship between the NPS um, and, and the AFU is hugely strengthened. And, and that is also going to, and together with the SCCU, and that's going to make a huge difference um, in terms of moving forward. Um, Chair, there's a, the AFU has been on, on a massive uh, capacity drive. Um, and so, you know, bringing uh, on board forensic uh, capabilities, project managers, and we're also looking at bringing on board um, aspirant advocates um, that will actually young young aspirant advocates and, and ensuring that we contribute to transformation and that we bring on board uh, young legal professionals that can actually assist with as asset recovery. Um, the, the management of curators is a big deal, Chair, and this has, the, the poor management of curators has resulted in an, a lot of costs for the organization. And, and Advocate Rabaji has really uh, put in place measures to ensure that we, moving forward, we effectively manage curators and that we are not wasting money that should be going into CARA by paying curators unnecessarily, uh, unnecessarily high fees or fees that they are not entitled to. Chair, there are others, examples of, I would, you know, the, they, are, they are what we hope would be, would be game changers. These are, these are initiatives that we are working on um, the community prosecution initiative um, is a really important um, initiative in that 
Um, it, is, it is about prosecutors really um, working more with our partners, including with the, with the community, to ensure that we, we proactively deal with crime in certain high crime areas. There was a pilot project in the NPA some 10 years ago. And so in order to ensure that we are more accessible to the people of South Africa, together with our partners, including the police primarily, but in fact, primarily the community, we want to ensure that prosecutors work towards finding solutions with the community to certain high levels of crime in certain identified areas. Um, I mentioned housebreaking. Um, we are, you know, we want to engage with our with our partners. The the statistics have shown that housebreaking is 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 continuously on the rise, and it is one crime. Um, the 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 um, that instills the most fear in South Africans. And so we are looking to see how we can become more strategic in terms of how we deal with specific crimes so that we're not all over the place and not making any impact, but together with our partners, we prioritize and we focus on certain crime types so that we can make impacts on the lives of ordinary South, Af South Africans. Um, the issue of, of building a forensic capability for government is a huge, is is in fact potentially a massive game changer in terms of dealing with, with corruption and, and dealing with, with asset forfeiture as well moving forward. This is something that is being, um, has been identified as one of the um, legacy projects, let's put it, of the uh, economic recovery strategy of the JCPS. Um, so the ACTT is coordinating. So this is a joint initiative by the relevant key role players within law enforcement. And so there, are, there is a task team that's working on this. And so we're certainly hoping that, that you know, the wheels in this regard will, will be, they are certainly turning, but, and this is not a short term uh, project, but we are certainly hoping that in, in, you know, the not too distant future, we will have a forensic capability for government because government spends a fortune on, on, all of these forensic reports that we need and and it's time that we actually invested in that capacity in government. Um, the increased use of information technology and, and digitization. Um, Chair, in this regard, the, the uh, minister also talked about uh, modernization. And so this is a huge part of our strategy. Um, we are looking at, at, at we've already, um, um, you know, we want to capacitate prosecutors with the tools that they need to ensure that they are able to be fully on board with the with the modernization projects. Um, and so, I, um, if there's questions on this, we'll certainly there's a, there's a project, there's a change management process uh, to get prosecutors more on board with this. And so, this is a huge priority moving forward. Um, recruiting, training, and retaining of the right staff. Um, you know, there's been no, um, we are looking at really trying to be innovative in how we recruit, train the right staff. So, you know, building certain capabilities in the NPA that in the past were perhaps not, a, you know, uh, normally uh, capabilities that one would have. So we are really looking at capacitating and the asset forfeiture unit is a classic example of really getting other capabilities, the ID similarly, but we're also looking at project management capabilities. So we are, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that's going on to in terms of the skills development and training of staff. Um, and share the final, the final um, you know, priority that I talked about was staff wellness and ensuring that, that we have a, a motivated and, 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 you know, inspired workforce. Chair, maybe I'll just deal with the fact you, you mentioned, and one of the issues that, that is on our table with regard to staff wellness issues or motivated staff is the issue of the LP10 um, situation where you, you mentioned that the, um, you know, the deputy directors are, are, as supervisors are earning less money than those that they supervise at the LP9 level. Um, this is, is something that is of huge concern to the organization. The matter is, 
in the Supreme Court of Appeal at the moment. So we are, we are waiting for that decision, which we hope will be out soon. But in the meantime, we are preparing in the organization for different scenarios that could emerge so that we are able to address this, this disparity um, in, in with regard to the, to the salaries of, of the deputies, as well as the chief prosecutors and those that they supervise. Chair, the, the issue of the, the uh, sexual and gender-based crimes has, has always been a, a priority for, for the um, organization. Uh, it remains a priority and, and with the appointment of the new special director, um, you know, I want to thank Advocate Pierre Smith who acted in that position for a number of years and did an, an amazing work, uh, did amazing work in that sphere. Um, now we have Advocate Bonnie Curry, uh, Gamo who comes with, with, with um, a new energy. I think it's always good to have change. It comes in with a new energy. And so she is really looking at, we are, we are doing an evaluation of all the Tutuzela care centers. We know that some of them are not as efficient as others. So we want to make sure that that blueprint for service in the Tutuzela care center is in fact one that is the same across, that is in fact in place, that the services that we are, that are in place with all our partners um, is uniform across, across the country and that where there are gaps, they are addressed. So that is a, a big part of the drive. And so, you know, we, we want to make sure um, that, you know, there's, we also looking chair at a national, a national capacity to, 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 to coordinate the, the work of the Tutuzela care centers. That, is, that has been a bit challenging because some of the departments don't have, you know, are, are the provincial departments as opposed to the national ones. But we're certainly working with our partners to see how there can be better coordination um, in the Tutuzela care centers. Chair, I, all that I've said, uh, these are all linked to the high level strategic outcomes that we've set up um, that are in our, uh, our five year strategic plan. And, and just to recall these, Chair, these are, these are really very uh, lofty ideals. I mean, we, we don't just want to achieve high conviction rates. We do want to increase feelings of safety and security. We don't just want to have high conviction rates in, in, in corruption and other, and, and other uh, commercial crime cases. We want to improve investor confidence um, in, the, in the country. And finally, we want to ensure that the people of South Africa have better, better access to the NPA services. Chair, some of the key um, um, interventions uh, moving forward this year is, is the setting up firstly, I, I mentioned earlier, Chair, the importance of ha having staff members, not just prosecutors, but we have, you know, we have um, administrative capabilities, we have other professionals in the organizations. We want to ensure that across the board, no matter what you do, we have people of the highest standards of, of integrity and ethics. And so the, the, the NPA Act provides for the setting up of such a capability. And, and we are in the process of doing this. We are setting up an Office of Complaints and Ethics. Um, that's the working title for now, Chair. But we certainly hope that um, within that by the end of this year, this office will be will be set up and that it would in fact be operational uh, in the early part of, of next year. Um, Chair, this particular um, intervention talks to priority number four, which is related to, to staff wellness and morale. Chair, another important uh, intervention uh, that, we, that we initiated um, already last year, um, that is still an important part of, of the capacitation of the NPA with new fresh blood, so to speak, Chair, is the Aspirin Prosecutor Program. And, and here where, you know, this particular program has the ability to really change the lives and prospects of young South Africans. And, and last year, we uh, took on board 425 um, you know, young South Africans. And, and in this regard, it also helps us to, to, to contribute in some way towards youth unemployment in this country and to really give um, young South Africans opportunities within uh, the National Prosecuting Authority. 
as you can see, the average age of aspirin prosecutors is 28. And we've set out the, the breakdown of the intake um, last year in terms of the, 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 the gender and other diversity issues, Chair. So now coming to the, 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 the compliance part of the annual performance plan, Chair, um, this has been, um, the presentation has been uh, shared with the committee. I, I'm not going to go into too much of detail on this. We'd be happy to take questions on it. But as you can see, Chair, uh, with regard to the first sub outcome, which is uh, increased feelings of safety and security, um, the conviction rates in the high court, regional court and district court are all there and the targets are set out. Uh, we've added conviction rate in cable theft. And, and this is a new indicator, Chair. And, and the reason why we've actually put this in is because this was brought in as an indicator at the MTSF level. And, and although in the, in the past, this was being measured at, us, at the lower level of the National Prosecuting Service operational plan, we've now elevated it to the NPA plan. And it's also you know, a matter of national interest uh, it's a matter that has uh, an impact on our economy. So this matter has now been elevated and it's not just about the conviction rate, but there's also the asset forfeiture uh, possibilities that would go along uh, with cases of that nature. Uh, and then the last um, indicator uh, relates to um, witness protection and uh, the number of witnesses that are threatened, harmed, killed uh, whilst on witness protection. And of course, we certainly want that number to remain zero. Um, Chair, sub outcome two, which is improved investor confidence in South Africa through high impact prosecutions. Um, this deals with uh, complex commercial crimes. And there you can see the, the indicators in terms of the conviction rates, the number of persons that are convicted in the, of private sector corruption and the number of government officials convicted. And continuing with sub outcome two, Chair, dealing with fraud and corruption. Uh, money laundering is an important, is a really important issue. Um, it's, it's an issue that also talks to our international obligations. It talks to illicit financial flows. And so um, we are really focusing on, because even in corruption cases, Chair, we found that we, we are dealing, we have money laundering as additional charges, but we'll know, we all know that, that there are entities like banks, like accountants, like insurance agencies, like lawyers that played a big role in, in actually in laundering money. Um, and so we really need to be looking at focusing on these entities that have also been uh, played a big role um, in corruption in this country. Um, and then the asset forfeiture uh, targets chair, um, the value of freezing orders obtained and the value of recovers, recoveries obtained um, are set out in this slide chair. And the final sub outcome is improve access to NPA services for all. Um, we, we want to ensure a, a victim centric services. And so the, the um, measures or indicators here relate to the operational TCCs um, and then to conviction rate in sexual offenses. And, and chair here again, I must say, you know, the, the conviction rate in sexual offenses has always been consistently high. Uh, with regard to the cases that come to the National Prosecuting Authority. But when one compares this to the number of reported cases, it's actually a very, very small percentage. And this is a hugely important issue. Um, you know, we and, and my colleagues on, online, I mean, if we have questions, but we've got numbers of the very, very high sentences, life over 20 years that the courts are meeting out, the high conviction rates. But the reality is we, we're not addressing this scourge. And the point I make, Jay, is that it's got to go beyond the criminal justice system if we really want to, as a country, deal with the scourge of sexual and gender-based violence. And the last in indicator in this regard, Chair, relates to public awareness sessions. Um, the NPA wants to engage more with the communities and to be out there um, in terms of, of, of making people, uh, making, making the citizens of this country aware of what we do and how they can better access our services in particular, Chair. 
Um, Chair, that brings me to the end of my part. I'm going to now hand you over to Teboho Setabella, who's going to be doing the budget overview, Chair. So I'm going to have to swap chairs with him. So if you'll just give us one moment while we make sure we deal with, we are still in a mute, muted, Karen. Um, thank you. Just a moment, Chair. I'm going to move over. So maybe I can just turn that towards you and then I will, won't have to swap chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, NDPP afternoon chair and committee members. Um, thank you, NDPP. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Just as a, as a way of uh, starting, Chair, this is the slide relating to our pre, uh, previous financial year expenditure. This is unaudited figures as the Auditor General is still busy with the audit for the financial year. But just as an overall, Chair, you realize that the NPA overall in terms of the budget, we have spent 98.36% of our budget. The expenditure, I'm gonna just go through to the items per economic classification. Compensation of employees, we have spent share 97%. This is the area we, where we had over just about 100 million in underspending. This was, uh, the, the, the underspending was just as a way of recruitment and due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown that disturbed our recruitment process. But as we speak, our recruitment process is still underway. Um, we, we continue to that. When we get to the goods and services chair, we have an overspending of about 29 million rent where we are over 106%. And the other line item where we're overspending on it is the transfer and subsidiaries. The goods and services chair, generally what happens is with because of the, it was relating to the equipment that we bought for the new intake of our prosecutors. But however, the expense was absorbed by the Department of Justice, which came in and assisted us with the overspending, which we are very grateful of it um, with relating to that. As we, we proceed with, uh, with their expenses relating to the, the other ones is on, that is uh, overspending, it's on machinery and equipment that's relating to the laptops. The transfers just basically relates to the leave gratuity and SACITA agencies that we are paying. If I proceed chair on to your next slide, this is our allocation for the 2021-22. Um, in terms of the A&E uh, allocation, you will notice that chair, our budget is just around 3.8 billion. However, you will notice over the OMTF uh, allocation, our budget has not much really grown. It's over 2%, which is way below the inflation rate. Mm. Our biggest concern chair at this point in time is our budget around the goods and services. As the NPA is busy recruiting and intaking number, we're having a challenge, particularly under the machinery and equipment where it's our the equipment in terms of IT laptops for our prosecutors where we, our budget is quite significantly very low. We are very concerned about that because over the years, our budget keeps on depreciating and we will face a situation where we are unable to provide our prosecutors and overall employees with the tools of trade to be able to do the job. However, even though the NPA has sufficient budget within the compensation of employees over the outer years, we remain very much optimistic that we'll be able to do the recruitment and fill the vacant post. As you can see, Chair, this is the progress that we've been doing throughout, as it's also planned for this financial year to have another intake of the aspirant prosecutor program that we're pursuing. The other classification that we have is the transfers and subsidies. That's a budget which we are not necessarily much worried about. But as I said, the biggest concern that we would like to highlight to the committee particularly relating to the initiatives that the, the NPA is taking, that the goods and services will remain a challenge, even though we're monitoring, but it will remain a challenge. And we'd like to highlight that, that this is the biggest problem for us, particularly under the capital. We don't have much of the capital budget um, around that. And we anticipate that we might have a challenge, but this will also be canvassed with our Department of Justice to try and assist with regard to those, those issues. I think, Chair, these are most likely the, the, the high level of it. Um, if there's much more details that is required, we're willing to, to provide. Thank you, Chair. So 
sorry, Chair, just a moment, just making sure we comply with all these protocols. Um, so, Chair, that is the budget overview. And I, I really want to, to emphasize the point that Tebojo Setabella just made um, with regard to the, 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 the goods and services budget. Um, we really have a lot of work to do, and 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 we want to ensure that you know we we have you know inspired uh, prosecutors who have you know are properly capacitated that we we have you know we talked about modernization, and and we really want to be a cutting edge prosecution service that can deliver on the challenges of the 20th, 21st century, and so in order to do that, it, it's great. We're very grateful for for the funding that we've got that has allowed us to really bring on board a number of more staff members, but there's still a lot of hard work, um, you know, that's needed in order for us to, to ensure that we're able to deliver. And so with a budget increase of, if you really look at it, we've got money, but it's only a 2% increase over, over the, the period. And so that is a very, very small increase. And so we, we know that we are working on, on huge, in hugely fi financially uh, constrained uh, times, we know that there's there's very little money, um, but the NPA is is poised to in fact be a to deliver a good return on the investment. Let me put it that way. And so, Chair, I think the NPA is is an entity that if we are able to do our work properly, and we're able to recover the money, we're able to properly prosecute and get people behind bars, we will increase investor confidence. We will be able to recover. Um, you know, the lost assets, and we will be able to make an impact on the economy, which will benefit the country as a whole. So I really, I think that the goods and services budget is, is of huge concern to us. And so um, I, I, we just, as Teboko said, we want to highlight that. But I also want to make the point, Chair, that in order for us to deliver, we got to look at capacitating our key partner, and that is the SAPs in particular, the, the DPCI. And, and it's hugely important that they are able to deliver quality investigations to our to the NPA. And they also support us in asset forfeiture mm -hmm. investigations. So it's really important that the DPCI is gets the necessary resources um, so that we can properly deal with, with the South Africa's crime problems. And so Chair, that is the presentation um, of the NPA. Um, I thank you and we stand ready to take questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, NTPP, and to your team. Um, can you remove the slide? I'm going to stop sharing now, Chair, in a moment, and I'm going to just deal with the mute myself so that we're not echoing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can I note hands from members? I have Honorable Glennis Breitenbach, Honorable Jelle, Honorable Swart, Honorable Nevot Dragens, in that order, Honorable Janji. Honorable Breitenbach. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And just now, my dog just asked to make a noise. Just one second. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I think that dog needs food. <laughs> that dog. <laughs> He's about as round as you are, Richard. He doesn't need food. He needs exercise. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to be quiet for heaven's sake. Just, I'm going to smack you. Uh, I'd like to know, first of all, about the... Um, uh, the NDPP mentioned the LP, first I'm going to move you, the LP10 um, issue. So it is two years and two months, as you correctly point out. Since <laughs> it um, and nothing has happened, Prisco, nothing has happened on that, uh, on that score. Honorable Bredenbach, yes. maybe we we'll give you a minute or so. And no, no, it's fine. The dog is gone now. Okay. My neighbor's dogs are in his garden, and so my dog's barking at them. So nothing has happened on that score. Uh, you've taken the matter on appeal, and you're awaiting an outcome in the Supreme Court of Appeal. So what effectively happened is that the 
the de deputy directors won their matter and when they won it, you took it on appeal. That doesn't uh, do a lot for building morale, in my view. Uh, it doesn't do a lot for um, building up corporate goodwill, in my view. Uh, I don't know what the reasons are for your taking it on appeal. Um, I must say, it strikes me as odd. But be that as it may, I know that you're waiting for the, uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal. I know that in the Labour Court uh, they lost. Not sure why. I haven't seen a judgment. Uh, but I do know that they've been granted leave to appeal in the Labour Court and they're going to appeal. So what we have is the deputy directors, uh, the, the, the main body of your senior management, uh, at odds with you. It's, it's not good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. Uh, it certainly doesn't make them feel good. And what's happening at the moment is, of course, you're appointing senior state advocates to, to deputy director posts as they get promoted, quite correctly. But they come off an LP10. And so they're already earning more than the job they're applying for. And so what you're doing is you're appointing them at the top scale of deputy director because they're already earning that money. And so they earn, as, a, as, a, as we used to say, a blowout, a baby deputy director is earning more currently than uh, deputy directors who've been there for 10 and 20 years. I, I don't know how that can be described as fair. I don't know how that can be described as acceptable. I, 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 I don't lack the words to describe it. I just can't say them on this platform. So please, can you help me with it? I don't understand. And could you please help me with that? Uh, then the Office of Innovation is a, is a new thing. Sounds good on paper. Has it been, has it in fact been created? Uh, is it doing anything? And if so, what? Uh, there were a number of uh, COVID-related corruption matters that were enrolled. There were a couple being well, a lot being considered, uh, a couple enrolled, some uh, thrown out. What is the progress with the prosecution of those matters? And then I'd like to know the current um, total number of prosecutors in the MPA, if you have that information to hand. And if you don't, you can answer this in writing. And um, and then the current conviction rate per prosecutor. Also, if you don't have that to hand, you can answer it in writing. It's absolutely fine. I noticed that there is a growing number of cases being finalized by way of informal mediation. Uh, I'm not too sure what that is. Um, if, upon reflection, it certainly would have potential benefits for everybody, I agree. But uh, what does it entail precisely and what kind of oversight supervision is there of the matters that are being dealt with in that fashion? Does somebody check the outcomes? Uh, is there some sort of uh, control over that process? Could we have an update on the uh, progress of the life SED mini inquest, please? And then high profile matters such as the uh, Basasa case, the Steinhoff case, there's really little to no movement there. Uh, could we have an update on the progress, please? And then the, the Fusion Center, the um, anti corruption task team, much vaunted, uh, very, little, very little action. They appear to be non-functional. Um, can we have an update on progress there, please? Then there have been, as you mentioned, some really uh, encouraging results with regards to, um, to asset forfeiture, to extraditions, to people being arrested abroad. And all that's good. Yes, it does look like there's light at the end of the tunnel. You say you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I hope it's not an oncoming train. Um, so yeah, it's, it is looking better. 
it is looking better, uh, for, which is very, very gratifying. Um, I think I understand the magnitude of the, the job that you've had to do, so well done. Um, there is progress. Um, then finally, I would like an update on the Bobroff matter. Mr. Bobroff Sr., well, they were annihilated in the uh, asset forfeiture issue, and that's made gave everybody warm and fuzzy feelings. But when are they coming back to face justice? Mr. Bobroff sits in Australia and has a lot to say about uh, the criminal justice system in South Africa, about uh, personalities in the criminal justice system in South Africa, tries to get people not appointed as judges in South Africa while he's cowering under a rock somewhere in Australia. It's time he came back to face the music. I'd like, to know, I'd like an update on the Bob Ross, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Jala. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just to, to pick it back on what, uh, oh, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Batoy and the beautiful look also. You know, they always say that women don't see that. We do, huh? <laughs> you are really, you know, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback on that one of uh, Mr. Bob uh, coming home and all that, but I'll come uh, uh, with the anger uh, advocate, but Toy of saying, Maybe we also have to be given a, a, a light as to the criteria that uh, the ID uses in choosing these cases, so that at least we know exactly. Uh, but we know that last time when they were here reporting, they were saying some of the cases indeed are difficult. Uh, there are so many issues that they still have, have to consider. But if we can get light as to uh, when you choose at the end, uh, what is it that you are looking for? But uh, also, we appreciate indeed the work that you have already done. Uh, the reports and also the, the, the atmosphere uh, gives us assurance that indeed there is something happening in, in, your, your, <clears throat> in your, your, your institution uh, with your team. Um, oh, but I also want to uplaw the work of the AFU. But we want them to add, eh? uh, to make sure that they bring back that money. We want that money. Our country needs the money so much. So we are saying, let them do more in order to make sure that uh, that money comes back so that we can be able to augment and use it in other places. And then the other one that I want to also uh, comment on is on the issues of the Tutuzela centers. Uh, yes, we, 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 we really, at the moment, uh, it's quiet, you know, uh, in terms of the complaints that we, we used to get a lot of them about these centers. But now I can see that even the community is, we are getting there. But also let me say, if we can get a report from uh, uh, your team as to the impact that uh, 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 that these tutuzelas have uh, in our communities up to this far. If you can get a little uh, uh, detail on that one. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, the new indicators that you are coming up with. In fact, we are happy. This is what we are encouraging, that uh, you need to come with uh, innovatives, new and innovatives, so that we can see that this car is moving. So when you talk about now we are putting, for example, the one that uh, the indicator on the cable theft, that one is, is, is very important. But I see that you have put 74%. So maybe you can also uh, give us light as to why 74%. I was going to say, why not 80 or 90? <laughs> because of the magnitude of the problems that we have in this area. Maybe if you can just share with us, uh, how did you come to the 74%? <clears throat> and then the last two ones that I have, I think this one of them, uh, I was going to say, if we can get more details also on the issue of the com uh, community prosecutions initiatives, just a little bit, 
uh, uh, information also on that one. Lastly, uh, Advocate Patoy would be on the, can we also get explanations uh, on the reasons behind the removal of the level, uh, the, the, this indicator, the level of quality prosecu uh, for uh, prosecution as a performance indicator. Yeah, that one, that is the last one, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Swart. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the NDPP, Advocate Butohi, for uh, your presentation. I want to share the sentiments of Advocate Breitenbach that things are definitely looking better, and I want to commend you for the work that you and all your staff are doing under very, very difficult conditions. I understand the complexity of a lot of the matters that you're dealing with, but I do see progress, and I also would like to encourage you that the light at the end of the tunnel is not necessarily a coming train. Let's hope it's not the portfolio committee that is watching you very closely. But we do want to commend you. I missed a bit of the initial input. So if, I, if you did raise the issue of the impact, um, I just want to do the, the impact of uh, mutual legal assistance and extraditions. Chair, I'm not sure if that was covered earlier, if it was, um, but I, I'm particularly interested in having sat on the ESCOM inquiry uh, when we had all these uh, Guptas, Salim Essa sitting in South Africa, and we even issued, as Parliament issued a subpoena for them to appear, and they didn't. It's, it's disgraceful that they are now sitting overseas, and I would like to ask you about your cooperation in that regard to get them back to South Africa. And of course, we see the UK, the Minister of Justice welcomed the steps of the UK when it came to freezing of assets relating to that in particular. So I'd like um, you to give us more, more details. If you have covered it, I, I, I understand that. I do commend the issue, um, the asset fourth unit. And this morning, if you had have heard me, I made an impassioned plea earlier that it makes no sense to me to decrease the funding of the SIU, SIU National Prosecuting Authority, Asset Fourth Unit, the ID, the Hawks, and the department that are running the courts when billions can be collected, when investor confidence can be improved. And when people can feel safer in their homes, businesses, and public places, it makes no logical sense to me. And so, Chair, I do recall the Minister of Finance indicating he'd heard me from the ACDP pleading for more finances. More finances were given, but now we see budget cuts um, for the SIU, and this cannot be supported by this committee. But I just want to commend the asset fourth unit. What I would like to specifically ask is relating to the game changers, relating to, and we welcome those. We welcome the, the, the belated cooperation with other law entities, um, Intelligence Center, um, the SA Reserve Bank. The question rises, how could all these billions of rands left the country when there are so many, if I want to send uh, 10,000 rand overseas, there are so many forms I have to fill in. How do all these funds, how did they leave the country? But that's historical. We're looking now to the present and the cooperation with the Auditor General. And I'd like to specifically focus in on the cooperation with the South African Revenue Services. We know that one of the greatest gangsters in history, Al Capone, was eventually jailed on tax evasion. None other of the gang. And they've got quick wins. They've got so many powers. So I'd like you to unpack your cooperation with SARS. They've got as much as um, you've got asset forfeiture unit. SARS has got, they can immediately issue a Section 88 notice where they appoint a bank as an agent for a delinquent taxpayer. So I would ask you that cooperation because they indicated the, the um, Commissioner for Inland Revenue, a SARS Commissioner this week, told Scopa 
that they're working on seven state capture related projects. They have got 500 active cases in that project, up to 4 billion rand, um, 85 civil matters, 58 criminal matters, and they've handed 27 criminal cases to the NPA. So that was this week, and I presume you could give us an update of the prosecuting prosecution that would be on tax evasion in terms of their legislation. Now, to what degree does Section 4, I think, of the revenue of the Tax Act uh, prohibit you from using that tax-related information in criminal courts? Surely not. Surely not. But I would expect that you were able, you'd be able to use that those powers as well somehow to recover those taxes that uh, people have evaded taxes when we see it. And I must say, looking at the newspapers almost on a daily basis, one does become discouraged when you see the levels of corruption. You made some very broad comments last year about this, the broad corruption. We see now with the Turkish power ship proposed tender of a 20-year tender, we see that sitting in the high court with litigation already, allegations of corruption. We see that um, in a civil matter. We see that there are um, allegations against government officials in the Mineral Resources Center that are saying, this is the system. Get with the system, i.e. get with the corrupt system. That is how we operate. And clearly, this will take some time to change that systemic corruption that you have referred to that we all are deeply concerned about. And, that, and it will change when we have some high-level prosecutions which are we understand are taking place and we commend you for that understanding the forensics is obviously the big issue on that particular issue i'm not sure if you're able to comment on the steinhoff matter and the usage of steinhoff the company funding forensic investigation um, into certain previous ceos understanding and that's a hawks issue uh, if you if you don't want to comment on that, I appreciate that. But it does illustrate the difficulty that Hawks has with forensic capacities. In that particular case, it's a large amount. It's a, it's a couple of hundred million for the um, for the funding of a forensic investigation. And I understand the Hawks indicating that if they are not able to have that company funding their audit and forensics, they will not be able to prosecute that matter or, or investigate it properly. But it does lead to a possible conflict of interest and it indicates how difficult these matters are. I think you also made a very um, pertinent uh, comment about the role of the private sector in a lot of this corruption. I think that is something we need to bear very much in mind. And the auditors, the lawyers, we had more than enough evidence in our parliamentary ESCOM inquiry, which was a lot of that evidence has now been handed over to the Zondo Commission. So that is a whole nother issue that, we, that I'm sure you're investigating as well. The last issue, which I would like um, to, to just unpack with you is the issue of, oh, it's just escaped me now, but the issue of the, Zondo Commission and the regulations in terms of the Zondo Commission, which the advocate Cronier indicated was a game changer. Now, it's a bit of a concern to me that there's still a discussion ongoing with National Treasury where they've given an undertaking to locate cyber technology of the Zondo Commission in the NPA. That's according to your slide five. Um, can we be of assistance in that regard from an oversight perspective? Because we don't want that technology, those, uh, the Zonda Commission comes to an end in June. What is going to happen to all that technology immediately? What's going to happen to all those investigators? Are they going to go across to the Hawks or to the NPA? Is there funding for that? Because we know that from the Minister of Finance's perspective, no more funding to the Zonda Commission. So what's going to happen there? We need to be proactive in looking for those additional resources. We don't want to lose 
or that capacity that's been built up over years. And so, Chair, from my perspective, I'm, I'm, um, I'm deeply interested at what the Zonda Commission is finished in June, what happens? Thank you very much. You Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to be a bit more broad and expansive. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, NDPP and your team. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, and I would like to start with the cable theft. I'm very happy that you've added cable theft and congratulate you on all the successes in terms of that, but also with regard to cable theft relating to the burning of, of trains. I live close to the railway line um, that goes to town, and I'm quite concerned about the burning of trains as well because it's the heartbeat of the economy and economic development, especially in Cape Town. People need transport and they need the trains to travel to work. So if cable theft happens, the trains stop, there's no power and many things happen because of that. So I'm just curious with regard to what you're, um, what you're doing with regard to that. Then on slide 16, I see... Uh, with regards to recovery of money and assets. I see that there was an audit in 2019-20, but I see there's another few years after that, it was less, it was 1.4. Why the reduction? Um, why is it not kept at 3.5, you know, over the years? Um, why is there a reduction? And then I would also like to know the DNA testing, the backlog of DNA testing. How is the NPA assisting or what is the NPA doing to assist to reduce the backlog of the DNA testing? Because that links to most of the gender-based violence um, prosecutions as well. Uh, and, and the testing needs to be available for that as evidence. So, so what is happening with regard to the backlog? What is being done? Then Honourable Jele did mention with regard to the Tutuzela care centres. Um, I was very impressed when I visited one. You know, I thought all of them are the same throughout uh, and I thought it was standard. But as you said, it needs to be reviewed because then not all of them are the same. So can you give an example of why they are not standardized, why they are not the same, um, and, and, and what is not the same? And I see, I saw somewhere the expenses on COVID. Uh, I mean, all the things that we need to prevent COVID from spreading. What has been the, the, the cost and the expenses with regard to COVID? Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much, Honorable Judge. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me also uh, thank the two and a half years old baby. Um, I think we're traveling this journey with her, you know, when she was nine months old, we were, were very hard on her uh, <laughs> before she was born. So. Now. <laughs> <Come> on. <laughs> Thank you. What is um, no, ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> ignore him. I'm just saying it, 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 it's been very hectic two years because it's uh, we correctly had to put a lot of pressure on on you given where the country was and I think this time around, we're not just looking at documents, we're meeting with you and we're able to, to, to reflect on actions that the entire nation can see. That makes a difference. So the light at the end of the tunnel is not, would not only come from the documents we read or what you present, we're able to make that assessment um, given the, the movement that is there. So I really appreciate 
what uh, you have just presented. Um, and, and I must indicate, Chair, uh, that I am very happy with the way the, the plans are evolving and they're getting better all the time. Um, so, but I think there are a few things that I want to raise which um, might make you even more worried, uh, uh, Advocate Batoy. Uh, and I, in terms of those four priorities that you have, which I support all of them, let, let me take uh, priority number three, um, which is an issue for me now because it does constitute a risk going forward. It's about capacitating the organization. Um, you, 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 you have a, a risk of uh, losing what you're building. And I want you, the first question I want you to, to give to you as a homework, don't need to, to respond today. I want to propose before I make this point, Chair, that uh, the NPA must develop an attractive retention strategy. You've got to, 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 to build that. You need an, an attractive retention strategy that makes NPA to be a place where people want to be. And let me give you an example why I'm making that point. I am a member of the Magistrate Commission. I'm a commissioner there in the Appointments Committee. We have just com concluded the process which took us about three months where we're interviewing four, 476 uh, applicants, potential magistrate for the district courts. And out of that, 166 prosecutors and advocates came to us in that interview. We interviewed 166. We're looking for 167 new magistrate. I'm not going to give you the number because there's no announcement yet, but I can tell you more than 30% of that will be coming from you. I'm giving you the, that bad news that what you have built in, because when they came through us, we could see stars, the, the level of performance, and, and they were ready to be in the bench. Uh, and I was conflicted because I'm responsible for NPA, the Magistrate Commission at the same time in that sector. But there's no way that in that panel I could have let go of a star that is coming from the NPA that wants to be a magistrate. So here is an indication to you as you put these plans, was the, my question is, what are the capacity risk that you would have put in place? And I'm telling you that's one of those already. In the next month or so, you are going to get uh, something not less than 50 or so. Uh, and that is, a put, hence the, the point is made of, how do you build this attractive retention strategy? Because if you don't do that, you will always become a necessary to the other sister institutions. And so that becomes a, a, a big threat. And I thought that it's, it, it's important that you, you think about that. I am also very much in, in support, like uh, Valma was saying, on this issue of cable theft. In fact, it's a it's supposed to be correctly defined as economic sabotage. That's what it is. Just goes beyond crime. It's economic sabotage and therefore the, the, the response in terms of how we act on it has got to, to, to come close uh, to, to, to that. I think Chair, just as a comment, I also agree uh, with the NDPP that we've got more societal serious work to do because when she, she says conviction on the sexual offenses is low vis-a-vis -vis the reported cases, it says to us the solution is not in the courts, it's not in prosecution. The solution is in the mindset, is in, in how as society we need to deal with these issues. So 
I I I want to support that, and 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 being uh, very happy so far. I, I don't want to go any further, Chair. I I, I thought I must just uh, share and raise this issue of the capacity risk that she's facing and 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 how they urgently need to put up a retention strategy because you have become a very good school for other institutions, um, and, and and so if you don't do that you only going to be a conduit as they go on into their own further ambitions. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Janche. Um, Honorable Ngola. No, no Chair, I'm, I'm covered, I'm covered. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, just a few things, uh, MTPP and your team. Uh, first of all, I must say you know, the, the, the APP is well uh, written. Um, and it, I think it gives hope and confidence that things are changing. Um, if we can go back to the asset for future unit. Um, on the target you have set, I think it's about 2.4 billion that you want to recover. I think my question is based on what? What is the assessment of the illicit industry generally in South Africa? And based on the assessment of the illicit industry, how much do you think you want to recover? Because I think between now and 2014, 2.4 billion is too low. Um, but I think it would be important that if it can be based on some scientific study of the industry, what is the illicit industry generally in South Africa? Uh, secondly, um, you have correctly pointed to the issue of uh, violent crimes and um, um, as one of your as one of your main priorities. Um, to what an extent are you putting in place a capacity to possibly deal with terrorism, which will be part of the violent crimes. Um, I think I think it's covered there, but I, I'm more interested in putting, uh, in understanding what capacities are you putting in place to be able to deal with terrorism. You have made mention of organized crime money laundering, which in most, in some instances are elements of terrorism because terrorists also use terrorist financing, which is laundered through the banks and through the various means that we have alluded to. But I think you will agree with me that we don't have to wait until South Africa is attacked. Um, already terrorists are in the north, in north of Mozambique in Cabo Delgado. So it's important that we must try as a country to try and mobilize uh, capacities around our own uh, law enforcement agencies to be able to deal with uh, that uh, eventuality should it happen. But to what an extent is the NPA ready for that? Uh, over to you, um, NTPP. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, honorable members for your uh, inputs and, and questions. Um, I'm going to first hand over to my colleagues online to deal with uh, questions relevant to their particular portfolios and colleagues that are here with me in our boardroom. And then when they are done, um, I will then deal with questions that may not have been covered. So firstly, I'm going to ask Advocate de Kock, um, who is joining from Cape Town. I think your, your colleagues are online as well, um, if you could deal with questions that um, fall within the NPS portfolio, please. 
and I think you have Pierce, advocate Pierce Smith as well online for sexual and gender-based violence questions. Um, advocate de Kock, can we? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, NDPP. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson of the committee and honorable members. Uh, thank you very much uh, once again for the opportunity for us to come and talk about our work. Um, and please guide me. I, I may have missed some of the questions relevant uh, to myself. Um, on the question regarding life acidemini, um, a decision has been made by the Director of Public Prosecutions, South Gauteng, that this matter uh, be referred to an inquest. Uh, the inquest is, is, is set to start during June uh, 21 of, 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 of this year. Um, in relation to the question uh, dealing with the, uh, the matters of the, of the fusion center, the fusion center is still uh, actively uh, working um, as we speak. It's a multidisciplinary approach to deal with all matters relating to corruption in, the, uh, in relation to funds uh, that was earmarked uh, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Fusion Center has to report on a monthly basis to the principals of all the, all the relevant law enforcement agencies, including the head of the MPA, the head of the DPCI, the head of the SIU, um, the head of the FIC, where the Fusion Center is located. And so there's a strong leadership uh, direction given to the work of the Fusion Center. Regarding the matters that are currently uh, in the Fusion Center, uh, there were 288 matters um, that were looked at in the Fusion Center. Of that, uh, 71 matters, prosecutors have made decisions where those matters have been investigated. Uh, 49 of those matters uh, were uh, decisions were made not to proceed with the prosecution. And there are currently 22 cases uh, on our court rolls with a number of accused appearing before the courts. Uh, that's in relation to the Fusion Center uh, matters. Um, I'm just going through uh, my notes just to find- uh, the There was other... a question on, Advocate Dukok, there was a question on informal mediation and the numbers yes. are going high. Just uh, maybe you can comment on that. Correct. Um, so the, the informal mediation um, has been uh, part and parcel of the work of the prosecution in our courts for a number of years. And it was also in part a response uh, to looking at alternative ways to resolve uh, prosecutions. So it is not always a requirement that all matters that are referred to the criminal justice system must be prosecuted. Sometimes it's in the interest of justice to look at alternative ways of resolving a prosecution. So this is what we call the informal mediations or the alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. And sometimes within communities, that is the best way to deal with the matter or between parties, that is the best way to deal with matters where it is not necessary to take up valuable court time in, the, in respect of certain cases. So the informal, what we call the informal mediation is mediation that happens by consent between the complainant um, and an accused. And of course, the prosecutor is central to how to deal with those cases. There is a policy framework that has been put in place in the prosecution to deal with these matters. And directors of public prosecutions in the various divisions through their senior public prosecutors are required to ensure that the policy of the MPA is adhered to and that there is strict compliance with the way in which these matters have been managed. Now, about two years ago, the MPA uh, did some research in terms of how these matters are dealt with, just to ensure that we are dealing with it in a consistent and in a uniform way, and what the challenges are with regard to the way in which prosecutors are dealing with these cases. So just recently, we understand through the Department of Justice that the South African Law Commission 
um, has been mandated to start looking at this question of, of, of mediation in relation to criminal matters. And this is one of the recommendations that we made uh, when we started to look at the informal mediations within the prosecution service to say that we need a legal framework going forward as to how these matters are going to be dealt with. So the MPA is welcoming, welcoming the work of the, of the commission. Um, and I just communicated with the commission in the week to say the MPA is prepared to share all the research it has and all its information with the commission. And we are waiting for the commission to call us to a meeting so that we can discuss the matter. But just to make the, the point in conclusion, that this is an important process for us going forward. As we look at backlogs in our courts, it's not all matters that we want to prosecute, but we must make sure that there's a proper regulatory environment within which this work takes place. But ultimately we would welcome this legal framework because then there will be certainty um, and it will also provide protection for prosecutors who often are in a difficult position because of the number of cases they have to deal with and the onerous decision-making that we have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so Chair, that's just, um, if, if I haven't covered the point adequately, uh, then I'm happy to respond further. But that's just to give some context uh, to the work in relation to informal uh, mediations. Um, as far as the, the question around the uh, Barbara of extradition. I have asked my colleagues um, online just to follow up with the relevant director of public prosecutions regarding the, the actual status. With your permission, Chair, if we don't have that information available today, we will be happy to provide a, a, a written report uh, to the Commission. And I think it would be better and more safer for us to do it that way than just to give a verbal um, response in an open platform of this nature. Uh, the matter, of course, has been ongoing for some time. There are legal challenges that are being addressed. And I would really prefer that we give a proper uh, written response as to a verbal input at this stage. But I'll be guided by you, Chair. Um, the indicator regarding the cable theft the reason why that indicator is set at 74%, it's aligned to the conviction rate in our regional courts, which is 74%. But we are doing much better than that. Um, currently, we are achieving a conviction rate of 88% um, in relation to cable theft. So it is a matter that we take very, very seriously within the prosecution, and that is why we've now elevated it from the prosecution services annual plan to the MPA annual plan. And then the question that is linked to that in relation to rail safety and the burning of trains is also a very, very important um, a matter for the MPA. And so we have placed those responsibilities in our organized crime components. And we've developed a strategy with law enforcement and the Department of Transport as a response uh, to rail safety, um, including the question of the burning of trains. So it's a broader response, not just about infrastructure, uh, but also about safety of our communities and safety of the public on the trains. And we have said that the National Department of Transport must take the lead in terms of this response. And so the department has committed also to provide additional security uh, on the rail lines um, and also to pro provide additional security on platforms, et cetera. But it is a very important issue to law enforcement generally in the country and a growing concern of the lawlessness that happens on our rail services. And so this is something we, we certainly need the whole of society to be involved in so that we can turn around this issue. Um, and it's obvious that it does impact on the, on the success of the economy. Chair. Um, Chair, I think they... they I think but I, yes, think you, I think you will agree with us that uh, you can't have a performance of 84% the real performance, and then you have 74% on the 
annual performance plan. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Chair. You can't set a target that is so low that uh, you don't have to lift a finger to us. Yes, yes. So, so I, I think that point is well made, and that is something that we uh, will certainly have to take into account. But unfortunately, the way it's written over the NTSF period, um, and we often are told by our strategy colleagues that sometimes it's difficult to change those numbers, but I agree. And so certainly from a, a divisional point of view where the work happens, we, we monitor very carefully when there's a drop in performance. So, so within the annual plans, we ensure that they keep up with, with whatever they've achieved before. But we take the point that that is something we need to look at so that we can adjust it a, a, accordingly to, to what it should be. Um, there was a question in relation to uh, what are we doing about uh, terrorism. Um, the, the MPA through our Priority Crimes Litigation Unit is very much involved with other law enforcement agencies to respond uh, to the issues around terrorism and to the crisis that we currently are seeing in Mozambique. We're actively involved there. In terms of the building of our capacities, the strategy that we've put in place is to, is to utilize once again our organized crime components within our directors of public prosecutions offices. And so we have put in place uh, special training programs for certain identified prosecutors in those organized crime components um, so that when cases arise, we are ready to deal with matters. But at the national level, at the head office level, our colleagues are actively involved in identifying the threats with our intelligence agencies and other law enforcement agencies and to try and stay on top of issues so that we are able to respond. Uh, but I will assure the committee that we are actively involved in, in dealing with, with that threat to the country. Um, in the PP, I'm not sure whether uh, there are any other questions. If the colleagues can just uh, alert me. I think there was a question on the community prosecutions. Yes, Ronnie, um, um, if your people can deal, you or your people, it's on the community prosecutions. Um, there was a question on a couple of questions on the Tutuzela care centers, which I think uh, colleagues can deal with that. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, there were questions relating to the tax, uh, um, tax related matters. Yes. Um, I can deal with the collaborations with SARS, but there were some specific questions relating to that. Um, if, yeah, colleagues can deal with those issues. And then I think that's the NPS part done. Yes. So um, our colleague, uh, the special director of the uh, Sexual Offences and Community Affairs Unit chairperson has joined. Uh, she indicated she would be joining um, but then there was a challenge with the, uh, with the connectivity. Um, so I'll just check if she is online, if the colleagues can just assist me whether she's joined us now. Otherwise, I would re request a deputy advocate, Pierre Smith, uh, just, to, just to respond to the questions uh, regarding the Tutuzela centers, and then also to the question regarding uh, the community uh, prosecutions. So I think Mr. Smith, if you can come in. Yeah. Advocate Smith, Pierre, are you online? Good afternoon, colleagues um, um, and honorable chairperson and honorable members. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, NDPP and Advocate Cock. I will deal with the two sets of questions in relation to the, to the Zella case centers and also the community prosecution initiative. In relation to the Jutuzela care centers, I think it's a well-known fact that it's a, a one-stop center to specifically focus on a victim-centered approach in dealing with victims. And just in a short reflection that when we started this process in 2000, at that stage, the conviction rate of those cases stood at 48%. Collectively, with our other stakeholders and with our prosecutors and NPS, we managed to increase that to the current process of where we stood at a 75% conviction rate. But the, the essence of the, the Tutuzela Care Center when we, we, when we talk about the victim-centered approach is specifically on how to assist victims that are coming through these centers. 
And for the past five years, I did just a short calculation. We dealt with approximately 160,000 victims that reported matters at 55 sites. Albeit, it must be noted that in the previous financial year, due to the COVID pandemic, it had a negative influence in the number of matters reported, where it was 5,876 or 16.6 percent less matters reported than the previous financial year, but the quality of services was still delivered. Um, what is also relevant in that regard to note is that with our stakeholders and also because of the emphasis on the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide, which was sort of like a run out of the, uh, the, the presidential summit, which we had in 2018, we've noted that there was in the past two years a considerable increase in more severe sentences being imposed by specifically the regional court in relation to rape matters that went through the TCC centers. To that extent, I can note that that increase was an increase of about 4% in the previous financial years when we look at the number of life imprisonment sentences specifically imposed. Last year, there were 141 of the 779 accused in TCC cases that receive life imprisonment sentences. And in the previous year, it was 267. Once again, the reason would be for the slight drop is obviously because of the impact that less cases were finalized due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So that in relation, I think is a crucial aspect about the TCCs. Um, honorable members were recalled that previously I reported that with the card of funding that we received, that we focusing on six sites to be established. Some of them should have been established, three actually, by the end of March this year, but also once again, to the unavailability of crucial service providers. We could not proceed with that, but we're targeting six sites, which is actually one more than what the business proposal for the Carter funding um, expected of us, for that to be established within this financial year. In other words, by the end of March, 2022. However, out of the six sites, we managed to kickstart or commence with services at two sites. That is the Craddock site in the Eastern Cape and the Paul site in the Western Cape. I think that will cover the, the questions in relation to the TCCs, except Honorable Nivo Drachen, our appreciation is extended for your good self to take the time and visit one of our sites. And yes, you raised a very crucial question when you ask. What about the process as your expectation was that the site services are standardized? Yes, they should be standardized. And we want to focus specifically on the uniformity and equality of service. That's why we currently kickstarted with the new um, SDPP advocate, Bonnie Karigamu, that was appointed. We kickstarted an efficacy review of all the sites to determine what are the shortfalls and also to determine what the NDPP previously stated. Unfortunately, we were also um, confronted with staff shortages, which will obviously have an unfortunate negative impact on service delivery. But that is part of the process that we're looking on at to ensure that we have an excellent efficacy review and the implementation of the solutions that we will get out of that to have a standardized process in place. If I'm not mistaken, that covers the question specifically on the TCCs. I will move over to the question that was asked by Honorable Jele in relation to the Community Prosecution Initiative. This is an initiative that has been recently um, revived, so to speak, by the NPA. And um, I'm, I'm quite pleased to say that in the previous financial year, the expectation of the NPA was to have 22 sites or initiatives identified in the 11 divisions um, of the DPP offices. All of them identified two sites, equaling uh, hence 22 sites. And nine of these sites are specifically focusing on gender-based violence irritants in the community. As the NDPP correctly reflected, this is the time for the prosecutors where we go out to the community to identify community irritants and what can actually collectively be implemented or addressed to ensure that those irritants are being removed or that there's a better process put in place. 
So as I indicated, nine of the 22 initiatives are specifically focusing on gender-based violence related matters or domestic violence as a huge problem in our society, but also it specifically looks also at substance and drug abuse in, in, in the communities, but specifically at schools. And honorable members will recall that recently we picked up in the schools the issue specifically in relation to bullying that's a huge crisis at the moment. So we are also going to have a concerted effort from the TCC side, but also from soccer side and the community prosecution initiative to have public awareness campaigns in the communities, but specifically at schools to address those bullying and to see what we can do collectively to remove that as the irritant in the communities as well. What we also did in addition to the um, community prosecution initiative is to develop a comprehensive framework or guideline reporting method where we will have a monitoring and evaluation process in place. We've got um, experienced prosecutors appointed to assist with the rollout and implementation of this initiative. And they are all on SPP, in other words, senior public prosecutor or senior state advocate level because of the seriousness of this initiative and to ensure that it will be successfully implemented. I think to that extent, that covers the two aspects that falls within my mandate and I'm done. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Yeah, so there was one other question before you go. Sorry, Chair. Um, on the DNA uh, backlogs, um, uh, I don't know if you heard that question, but I know a lot is being done with SAPS. It's predominantly a SAPS issue which is affecting us really badly. And we have been raising this. If you could just talk to that very quickly. Um, I will do so, NDPP. Thank you for reminding me. I must just apologize. I missed that question. That is indeed so. The DNA sexual offenses backlog is a huge challenge at the moment. That's why the ND, um, NPA reached out to our colleagues at SAP, specifically the Forensic Science Laboratories. As honorable members will recall, they resort under SAPS. So therefore, the DNA forensic analysis report is a huge issue for us because it unfortunately at this stage causes a massive backlog of those cases at courts. Now, since we have kickstarted this process, the NPA collated 1,847 cases that are long outstanding on a DNA sexual offenses backlog. We have received a number of 482 DNA reports due to our intervention with SAPS and FSL in this regard. And I must say recently, um, within this week, I received additional analysis reports that were done by the FSL, which is submitted to us at head office so that we can also control strategically the management and the submission of those reports to our colleagues in, in the DPP divisions. Those additional ones that are received this week will also be distributed to colleagues as well. We are also in the process of developing a specific action plan with SAPS to address it step by step, because what we've picked up also um, is that unfortunately in some instances, or rather let me put it in some divisions, there are a low number of these reports that are coming from FSL. Those divisions are KZ in Eastern Cape and Western Cape. We've addressed it with our FSL colleagues from SAPS. There will be a concerted effort to focus on those provinces and that divisions. Mupa Malanga was very fortunate because a predominant number of their long outstanding cases with, where the DNA was requested have been dealt with or that we received reports in that regard. But in this meeting that I've just spoken about, about the action plan to be developed, will be on this coming Monday that has been scheduled for two o'clock in the afternoon, where we and SAPS will deal with this action plan to collectively have a process in place to address this on an urgent matter. Thank you, NDPP. I think that covers that question as well from my side. Yes, thank you. Um, um, Advocate de Kock, is there anything else from the NPS side? If not, we can um, yes. move over. Yes. Sorry, please go ahead. Thank you, NDPP, and thank you, Chairperson, through, with your permission. The tax, the question on the tax, our understanding of the question was whether we can be using the provisions of the, of the tax legislation to bring criminals to book, and the answer to that question is yes. Um, we, of course, have uh, uh, 
dedicated tax prosecutors in all our respective DPP offices. Uh, currently, the MPA has uh, 69. Um, is, currently, the MPA has a, has a pool of tax prosecutors in all divisions, and we are also building capacity in those divisions that do not have uh, the tax capacity. So just recently, to give an example um, of, of, of a matter involving one of a very notorious organized crime uh, figure within the province, a particular province, we are now preparing documentation uh, that will uh, use the provisions of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act to prosecute based on investigations uh, that, are, that are done through our uh, SARS investigators. So uh, the model that we use is that those dedicated prosecutors only do tax related matters. And we are refining this to ensure that it's only complex uh, tax related matters uh, involving fraud um, and, and of course uh, defrauding the receiver of revenue, particularly in VAT related claims. Um, and then they work very closely with the SARS compliance units and the investigations. And the model that we adopt is that the prosecutors will guide those investigations as well. So Chair, we are doing a lot of work in this space and just next week, the NDPP and the commissioner uh, will be meeting in, in Cape Town with the colleagues from the prosecution and the, and the SARS investigators to cement our relationship uh, in terms of the work that we do. Um, there's a question. I think we've answered the Barbara, the Barbara question, uh, Chair, with your permission, if we can give a written report on that. And then can I just ask that the special director of the Specialized Commercial Crimes Court, with your permission, Chair, um, gives a, a brief update on the Steinoff uh, matter. There was a question in relation to the Steinoff matter. Um, thank you, Advocate Cock. Is Advocate Baloy on? Yes, I see you. Please go ahead. No, I don't see Advocate Baloy. Level. There you go. Yeah, NDPP. Um, thank you very much, NDPP. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Chair. And good afternoon to, to all the members. Now, the, the question relating to um, the Steinhoff investigation, um, more particularly that relating to the, the, the Steinhoff um, company paying for the forensic investigations, um, and this likely um, leading to a conflict of interest as, as, as they are um, the ones that are paying for their own the investigation against the, their own company. Um, I wish to point out that although um, uh, um, the, the forensic um, investigators um, is being paid for, um, although, um, um, although Steinhoff is paying for the forensic investigation, um, I wish to point out that the DPCI are the ones who sourced um, uh, the, 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 the forensic investigation. Um, they are the ones who, who appointed um, the forensic investigators in this matter, although they were paid for by, by the Steinhoff. Um, sorry about that. Um, now the NPA, um, although the, the Steinhoff invest, the the the, deep, the, P, the P, although the DPCI are the ones who appointed the P, the Steinhoff to to pay for for the investigations, the NPA supported the appointment by the DPCI of PWC for the following reasons. Um, the PWC had accumulated significant knowledge of the Steinhoff matter over the two year. They were directly contracted by Steinhoff to investigate the accounting irregularities prior to the initiation of the criminal investigation on the matter, and therefore had in-depth knowledge of the modus operandi applied by the suspects to perpetrate the offenses and of the complicated facts of the investigations. Now, although the format of their report then, prior to the initiation of the criminal investigation, did not primarily focus on criminality, and the criminal court processes. They compiled a comprehensive forensic audit report 
dealing extensively with the accounting irregularities which allegedly took place over a long period of time um, to which 2009 until 2017. They were therefore in an ideal position to produce a forensic audit report for the purpose of the criminal investigation and the prosecution within a reasonable time span, notwithstanding what might be perceived as a conflict. Now, the following disadvantages were also considered. Um, should PwC not be appointed as auditors to the forensic investigation of the matter? The forensic investigation of this complex matter would, for all practical purposes, have to start afresh by the new forensic firm. It will also take years for the new forensic firm to obtain all relevant documents and to familiarize itself with the facts of the matter. Now, a colossal number of documents would inter alia be the subject of the new forensic investigation. And all those documents were, however, already in possession and under the control of the PwC. It would thus have proved cumbersome to procure all the necessary documents for the newly appointed forensic firm. The investigation proved Lebo, to be very- Sorry, in sorry to interrupt, Lebo. I think maybe what you can for the, for the, for the sorry to interrupt, but for the, for the committee, I think it might just be good if you just focus uh, just very quickly on what, um, what measures were put in place to manage any perceived conflict of interest. I just highlight those issues. Thank you, Thank you very much, NDPP. Thank you very much. Um, now, with a view to properly managing the perceived conflict of interest in the appointment of PwC as forensic auditors in the investigation of the matter, the following measures were put in place. PwC had to sign a certificate in terms of Section 4 of the Protection of Information Act. This is providing protection against any unlawful disclosures of any confidential information or documentation during the forensic investigation. All the implicated persons have been removed from Steinhoff structures, including the executive and or board positions. PW's findings will be supported by an independent objective evidence, such as bank statements, journals, ledgers, databases, emails, memos, and contractual agreements. PwC also agreed and taking into consideration the consequences of a section four information certificate that no evidence obtained during the criminal investigation would be divulged to Steinhoff, even for the purpose of civil litigation. And in conclusion, it's important to note that in practice, it is neither irregular nor uncommon for a complainant, which is Steinhoff in this instance, to direct a forensic investigation into the company's financial affairs, and that same forensic investigation, the same forensic report is later used with success during the criminal trial. Thank you very much, NDPP. Uh, thank you, um, Lebo. Um, um, Honorable Chair, I believe Edward Cronier has joined us. There were, uh, I think, three questions relating to the ID. Uh, Hermian, are you online? Edward Cronier? But does she know the uh, questions? Yes. yes, they have been communicated to her, Chair. Um, okay, whilst we're waiting to see if she is online, let's just deal with some of the other questions. Um, perhaps um, the AFU questions. Um, oh, I see. I can hear. I can hear Advocate de Kock saying she, uh, Advocate Cronier saying she's here. But we can't hear her very vaguely, very faint. Hermione, can you put your video on maybe? We can't see you or hear you. Can we move to the All right, next? All right, so we'll, we'll move to the next. Sorry, Chair. We'll move to the AFU advocate, um, Rabaji. Um, let me just get the move. If maybe you can come here and I'll just turn this. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, am I on? Yes. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Uh, there was a question from Honourable Jelly and Honourable Swart on, um, I think, sorry, from the Chairperson on the one four billion target. Why is it low now? Previously, it was three billion, and then 
um, it, it, it was then reduced to 1 billion. Chairperson, um, this reduction was done uh, during the five year MTEF process. We've had discussion on this matter internally, and we are going to reduce the target back to, to yes, to what it was. We'll just follow the process in terms of how you change targets midway the five year uh, uh, term. Uh, Chairperson, we, we are really um, ready for the challenge of bringing back the stolen money. So we are confident that we'll be able to to, to deliver, yes, and to exceed this target. You you have seen recently in the media, the recovery of 1.4 billion for, for the uh, ESCOM Kusela matter, as well as the 100 million from um, the Bob Ref matter. So, so we will then increase the target back. Then Chairperson, you asked a, a question regarding uh, the financial, illicit financial flows. And, and the fact that it's, it's got to be scientific. Now, the scientific amount is 4 billion and, and it's, it's, it, it comes from a research that is done for, by the, interne, um, the Financial Inter Intelligence Center. So, so the, the Financial uh, Intelligence Center is leading what is called an interagency working group, which has got Reserve Bank, AFU, NPA, prosecution, um, SARS and, and, and many agencies. Now, all of us are responsible for playing a part in, in, in recovering uh, the 4 billion from illicit financial flows. We've prioritized 10 cases and we meet periodically to assess how we are doing in terms of um, recovering this money back. Um, so it's not only AFU that's responsible for, for the entire amount. Uh, this is one of uh, the obligations that we, we report on to FATF, uh, just in terms of the impact and the seriousness in terms whereof, as a country, we take uh, seriously the issue of illicit international uh, flows. Now, also in AFU, we do... Um, prioritize matters of, of this nature. In fact, since I've come in, we've done three matters. Um, we have already forfeited 55 million of, um, of cases that, that were of the nature of illicit international flows and were in the process of um, finalizing um, 100 million uh, as well in this category. So. It's, it's, it's a matter that we, we take seriously in NPA, AFU, as well as the, the interagency working group on, on international financial flows. Thank you very much. Chair, sorry. Oh, is that Hermione? Yes. yes, I'm here. Oh, you, okay. Chair, sorry, we'll deal with the ID issues. Go ahead, Hermione. Uh, afternoon, Chair. My apologies. The network in the NPA building in the Western Cape has been down. Um, Chair, because uh, in the interest of time, I'll kick off. Um, the questions as I have it is, uh, firstly, what uh, selection criteria does the ID use to, in its um, decision making? Um, Chairperson, the Act um, requires that uh, provides for three ways in which matters can be taken cognizance of by the ID. Um, the first is any member of the public can refer matter to the ID uh, in terms of section seven, 27 of the NPA Act. What the person needs to do is to um, under oath make an allegation that um, uh, one of uh, an offense has been committed and that that offense is an offense that falls within the ambit of the ID's proclamation. So the ID's proclamation um, says that the ID is set up to deal with serious, uh, complex and high profile corruption cases and it sets out a number of uh, corruption related um, statutory and common law offenses that the ID can take cognizance of. The proclamation also specifically makes reference to 
the State Capture Commission, uh, the SARS Commission, and the PIC commissions, and um, requires the ID to investigate uh, uh, criminal activity identified um, in the reports from those commissions. Um, so any member of the public can refer matter, but they have to set out uh, on affidavit reasonable grounds, a, reason, a reasonable suspicion that a specified offense, which is a, an offense in terms of the, um, the regulation has, the proclamation has been committed and that there is reasonable grounds to believe um, that that offense was committed. So any member of the public, the national director can refer a, a matter for the ID to investigate and the ID must then investigate and the investigating director uh, myself in this case, ultimately makes a decision about what matters the ID will um, consider. And um, uh, Chairperson, uh, one of the biggest, I can go through the selection criteria that we have developed for the ID internally, but ultimately, um, everyone knows there's no shortage of cases for the ID to take cognizance of, but it's really res resources, it's really capacity that dictates what, what we can take on. Um, by and large, the cases that the ID um, have taken on, and, and I've been here before setting out the three broad focus areas that we have um, divided the cases that we've taken on into, um, the 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 security sector where we're looking at um, offenses in the high, um, higher ranks of SAPs, uh, the NPA, um, the SSA, um, crime intelligence, um, and then the SOEs, we've, we've looked at um, Transnet um, and ESCOM primarily. Um, I have on my desk a um, um, request to authorize further investigations um, in SAA and in PRASA, but you know, until until there's capacity to do this work, it makes no sense to authorize investigation. And and how we get capacity is determined in the Act by Section Seven. We go and knock on doors for investigative resources in other parts of government. Um, we we try and uh, relocate prosecutors. We've, on a, we've advertised for three-year contract prosecutors and, and we've just appointed 21 investigators. Um, they, the, the 21 investigators start on the, started on the 1st of December, um, but they, they have to be equipped and they have to have tools of the trade to do their work. Um, they have a building um, that they need to reside in. So... So there are a lot of logistical constraints and a lot of capacity constraints that, that dictate what the ID is working on. So that's why we have focused um, on doing only cases where we believe we are dealing with those most responsible. So we have not um, dealt with cases that um, are low level officials um, or junior um, um, officials in a government department or junior members of private organizations. We, we focus at the level of the most senior members of organizations. And obviously those investigations are, are much more difficult, they're complex, they're hard. Um, I think I, I can go through the criteria, but I can also forward to the, the committee a memo that I sent out to all DPPs right in the beginning saying, these are the criteria that we will use um, to take on cases for investigation in the ID, um, if that will assist. That, that will be good, Hamian. So then if I can move on to um, the second question, uh, which I understand relates to the migration of the, the Zonda Commission resources. Um, and it's related to the question of, of um, the regulation and what's happening with implementation of the regulation. Um, Chair, one of the big issues that, that um, I think impact on, on um, the migration of the Zondo uh, for in, digital forensic capability is the fact that the commission is still busy doing its work as we speak. We've had a, a migration plan in place, um, but twice now we've had to 
extend uh, the delivery dates on the plan because the Commission's work has been extended. Um, there is an in-principle agreement that the capability will be made available to the ID. So the capability consists of, of three components. There's a hardware infrastructure component um, that is available to the ID. There's a software component um, and, and the software consists of licenses that have to be renewed on an ongoing basis. And then thirdly, there's the, the question of the data that is available. And so at the moment, uh, what we have is an arrangement in, the, in place in relation to the data. We make a, a request in terms of our uh, agreed protocol with the commission, we motivate uh, for a particular piece of evidence or you know, um, a, a particular data set. And we say why we, we are entitled to, to have sight of that evidence for purposes of a criminal investigation and the commission makes that available to us. Um, and so that has been happening on an ongoing basis. Um, where we are challenged right now is the 21 investigators that we employed have not um, been able to access um, the, the, the software, the, the tools of the trade, the analytical tools that, that the Commission has, and our prosecutors have not yet been able to use the e-discovery uh, platform that is available to discover our dockets. And so it's something that we're spending today um, trying to resolve because there are, are matters that we are ready to enroll, but we have taken a position that we will only enroll a matter when we are ready to hand over a complete indictment and a, a complete uh, docket. And we are hamstrung in hang, handing over complete dockets because they consist of vast sets of, of um, digital material, cell phone records, email accounts, the, um, bank records. And so, Today we are uh, meeting with the commission and, and um, we've met with the treasury officials who are overseeing this process to ensure that we can place into our dockets these, this digital material and then be in a position to make the digital material available to all the accused persons when we arrest them. So we, we've had a, a number of challenges in smoothing that process over. Um, the, 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 the aspect around um, the hardware and the software is that both of those are managed by um, experts, uh, digital forensics experts. We have got a deviation in place to onboard some of those resources on an ad hoc basis, but our migration and our transition plan needs to make longer term provision for this capability uh, to be available on a more secure basis, a more long term basis, and on an affordable basis. So uh, our migration plan is, is in place, but it has had to um, change a few times. And there's a component of our migration plan that deals with long-term um, stability and availability and accessibility. Um, I'm very conscious of time. I mean, um, there was a question about um, impact of MLA and extraditions. Um, and particularly there was a mention of of, of the Gupta and, and extradition. Maybe you want to, I don't know if you can deal with that. Um, Chairperson, uh, we, we, um, it, it, uh, we, I think we, there will be an announcement um, um, shortly about what we are able to communicate about progress on, on this front. But obviously um, we, we are dealing with accused persons um, and, uh, what I can confirm is that they are not yet in South Africa. Um, you know, other than that, our efforts um, to secure their presence in South Africa are certainly ongoing. We've certainly not um, relented. Um, and um, uh, we are getting cooperation from a number of countries, um, a number of counterparts. So really, um, we, we certainly haven't given up. Um, and, and I think that, um, yeah, I, that's as much as I can say, I think, at the moment. Um, then there was a, um, sorry, I, I got a list of the questions here. Um, uh, the cooperation. 
I just wanted to answer the question about cooperation with other agencies and the question around SARS powers to restrain and how we work with SARS and, and the powers that SARS investigators um, and tax collectors have at their disposal. Um, Chairperson, we collaborate closely with, with um, investigators within SARS. Um, SARS have two uh, enforcement arms, a criminal enforcement and a civil enforcement. We have a very close working relationship with the criminal enforcement um, leg and um, the SARS commissioner, I think when he addressed parliament talked about the collaboration and, um, between the two units and the way in which we are targeting um, uh, suspects, either with tax offenses or with, with other uh, common law and statutory offenses that fall within the, and, uh, the ID's proclamation. Even in the context of asset recovery, a good example is the, the, the seizure that happened of, of um, I think, 2.4 billion rand um, uh, held by the Reserve Bank to the credit of one of the um, original um, equipment manufacturers in the 1064 contract. Um, SARS was successful in obtaining a preservation order over those funds. Um, we, we were in communication with SARS throughout and we were collaborating to the extent that the law allows us to collaborate and share information. Um, in that case, SARS was in a much better position um, and much sooner able to bring a, a court application to seize those funds. And we agreed that we will then proceed on that basis. It does not preclude um, the ID from at a later stage and when further funds become available, also going after those funds. Um, and I, I may as well also address the question of, of um, uh, how the, the criminal economy and what is this 2.5 billion based on this target for recovery uh, Chairperson, um, as someone who worked for the Stolen Assets Recovery Initiative um, that's attached to the World Bank, there are lots of studies around uh, the value of the criminal economy. And by and large, countries around the world who have very effective um, asset recovery programs and anti-corruption programs rarely ever, if they're looking at that figure, recover more than 1% of that figure. And so we, we I think, haven't, have decided not to spend too much time on, on that figure. What we've looked at is the Financial Intelligence Center, when I, when I started, had done a presentation on what their assessment of the illicit financial flows from state capture has been. Um, I understand the Zondo Commission is going to present similar evidence about exactly what money do we attribute to um, illicit proceeds from state capture? And we have based our recovery efforts on those um, financial flows and are over the five year MTF period looking at um, recovering a, um, a proportion of that figure. But what we've also done um, is in relation to looking at SOEs and deciding where to prioritize our attention we took the SOEs where there was the biggest um, uh, outflow um, or illicit outflow of funds. So Transnet and ESCOM have the biggest bad budget um, of, among all SOEs, and they also have had the biggest infrastructure projects where looting um, took place. Um, and we have, in our prioritization, ensured that we stay focused on the most significant ones and that we look at recovering in those spaces. Um, uh, Chairperson, I think I have covered... I think you've covered all, Hermine. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Hermine. Uh, Chair, I'm going to ask Advocate uh, Anton Duplessis to deal with one or two matters that falls under his uh, portfolio. Anton? Good afternoon, Chair and colleagues, and thank you for the warm welcome uh, uh, earlier. It, it's really an honor to be part of this team, and uh, 
Thank you also, also for the constructive and positive feedback. We are truly working uh, hard at the NPA. And as the NDPP said, we are incredibly positive that we're now in good shape to really deliver on the expectations that South Africans uh, rightly have of us. And, um, and hopefully this is, uh, is the beginning of a more positive conversation that we'll be having with the Portfolio Committee moving forward. Chair, I'm going to be very brief and deal just with three quick issues. The first one was just on the numbers that was asked. What are the numbers of, of prosecutors that we have? At the moment, we stand at 3,550 prosecutors, uh, which is up a total of about seven, just over 700 prosecutors from one year ago. And that's largely due, due to the uh, successful aspirin prosecutors program that the NDPP briefed on. So again, that's 3,550 prosecutors and we were at 2,833 uh, 2,833 at the end of the last financial year. <clears throat> the other uh, issue that came up that was the question of the Innovation Policy and Support Office. I think uh, my colleague Brayton, uh, Dennis Breitenbach asked that question. Uh, yes, it is very much up and running. It is uh, not something which is a necessarily a standalone capacity. It's a cross-cutting capacity within the organization that was originally established in the office of the national director. Um, and this capacity infuses innovation and research into all the work that we've been speaking about today. It is aligned to the, the structures of the organization. We are still in the process of, of staffing it. It's a small unit, but it basically speaks to the issue of our need to make sure that everything we do is driven by evidence. Everything is driven um, by the latest research so that we're not necessarily um, scrambling to, to come up with solutions without having evidence to, to drive those solutions. So yes, IPSO is very much a part of the organization. We're hoping to grow it, uh, as I say, and institutionalize it within the organization. And we are basing it on international best practices where many other leading prosecution authorities have these dedicated research and innovation units. So we're finding it to be uh, as, as effective as we'd hoped for. And then the final issue just deals with the question of retention of staff. Uh, a colleague has rightfully pointed out that as one of our priorities over the next six months, and this will certainly not end uh, in six months, it's about capacitating uh, the organization to deal with the challenges that we face at the moment, but also the challenges we know we're going to face moving forward. And that's particularly linked to the minister's focus on modernization and digitization, but also the changing nature of crime and knowing that we are going to be dealing with a whole range of significantly more complex cyber criminality over the coming years. So what we are doing is, is a, a, there are a range of initiatives and I won't go into them now, but all of these initiatives are linked into getting the NPA back to being that employer of choice, uh, which young people and dynamic uh, lawyers and others uh, want to be in the organization. And once they get into the organization, of course, it's important that we capacitate them, train them and develop them so that they want to stay in the organization. And the NDPP mentioned our cultural enhancement initiative, which is also part of this, which is linked to staff morale. And of course, it's been a difficult time with COVID, but we're, uh, we're really excited about the prospects of that um, for, for this year and moving forward. And, and, and to our colleague uh, about the, the, the prosecutors going to the magistracy I, know, magistracy, I know it's homework for us, so I won't go into detail, but sometimes we are working within a broader system and uh, it's not necessarily always a bad thing. It is part of the career development uh, prospect. So, uh, so we will take that into account, but uh, yeah, in general, uh, just to say thank you again to the chair for for inviting uh, for 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 welcoming me and um, look forward to the next briefing. Thanks, Edip. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, there's just one or two questions that were not covered. Um, I'll just quickly deal with those. The first one is uh, um, Advocate Breitenbach um, and the issue of the LP10. Um, um, I know I, I know this is a matter that the chair has also raised. I touched on it in my presentation, and I've answered this question that Advocate Breitenbach has asked me at several other in, uh, engagements with this portfolio committee. And I thought I had explained myself quite well about, about the difficulty that I find myself in as a national director, potentially you know, engaging in litigation with her key um, and, and very valued staff members, and I've spoken to them. Um, it's it's an, the issue of the LP10 um, uh, implementation is, is um, you know, one that has been, you know, various other NDPPs have dealt with it, and regrettably it was dealt with very badly. And so we are, I've always said my position is not 
not to implement the LP10. We want to implement the LP10 in the manner in which it was envisaged across government. This is not just an NPA issue. It, it, it affects legal professionals across government. And so we must, we must implement it in the correct way. So we are planning for implementation of the LP10. And so, you know, we are, we are, it's not like whilst the, the matter is before the Supreme Court, we are not uh, looking at options and scenarios because I agree completely, it is an untenable situation that our, our supervisors and our, our very valued staff members, and I'm not saying those that are not in LP10 are not valued. They are, we, they're all very valuable staff members, you know, at LP9, uh, you know, and it's just the, the, those that actually created the OSD, I think 15 years ago, didn't realize there was this tsunami that was gonna hit us 15 years later and create this terrible imbalance in government. It was really short-sighted. And now here we are sitting with this when it's cross crashed on shore and we're scrambling around trying to figure out how to deal with this. So it's a very complicated scenario. We are having a meeting um, next week, um, the state attorney and um, Advocate Mohatla from the Legal Affairs Division in my office uh, is leading this process together with the DPSA uh, Treasury, the DG of Justice, uh, to look at, you know, collectively what the solutions are. So, you know, I certainly hope that we are still doing enough to keep our really valued staff motivated. But it's, I mean, it's not, I was four days in, in office when this matter was before court. And so it was not a very, very, it was really a, what do they say, induction by fire, so to speak, when you are in conflict, so to speak, with your own people. But it's it's a it's an untenable situation, and and I agree, Advocate Breitenbach, even the seniors that are now appearing, uh, applying for deputy positions, you can't have a situation where you're going to go into a more senior position, but earning less than you were, in a less, it's just it's a total mess. So bottom line is, chair, we're working very hard with HR to try to deal with that. Um, the, the other issue, Chair, very quickly, um, the Fusion Center, uh, Advocate de Kock gave um, an outline of what is happening with regard to the COVID-related corruption cases. Um, I want to say that a lot of good work is happening in the Fusion Center, but I also want to say that th there's, you know, the, 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 the lack of resources in other, in, in the SAPs, uh, particularly detectives, um, is causing some, you know, we, cases are not moving as fast as we would like. And we've had a, we had a session in the Fusion Center just, I think it was in February, early March, I'm not sure, to look at what were these risks and how we could deal with those issues in terms of ensuring that the Fusion Center is able to deliver cases with the original intention of speedy prosecutions when it comes to COVID-related corruption matters. And share the issue of terrorism that you raised hugely important. We had a meeting with uh, General Libya, but I want to emphasize, Chair, in as much as we are having a meeting with, with, with the SAPs and trying to deal with this, this is a matter of national security. And it's really a matter that I raised at the, at the last JCPS meeting to say this has never been on the JCPS agenda. What is the country's plan to deal with you know, a prosecutor, we can put a group of prosecutors together, we can get a group of investigators, but you need a high level security plan, probably led by state security. And, and I understand, and I do believe, not I do believe, there is a task team that was set up some time ago, an interagency task team that hasn't sat for a long time. And I had a chat with, with, with Mr. McBride some, uh, to say to him, you know, this, this team needs to sit, and I, I know SSA is looking into it, but it needs to be, a government strategy to deal with this very, very serious potential threat that our company, our country is facing. So I want to make that point, Chair. Um, but we stand ready to 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 do what the NPA needs on SARS collaboration. Um, yes, as Advocate de Kock said, um, our teams are, are meeting um, uh, the SARS investigation capacities. Our our tax unit prosecutors, the heads, are meeting in Cape Town. Uh, Commissioner Kiesvetter and myself will be there to open the session just to give an indication of the really important, um, um, the importance that we put to dealing with tax matters in a more e efficient way. And, and yes, fully cognizant of the, of the Al Capone strategy. Uh, we, we are fully aware of that. Chair, I think that covers all the questions. Um, uh, quality uh, prosecutions is one that was, was asked and why that was 
removed from this uh, from the APP? That's a very good question. Um, there was a very um, ambitious target that we set. It still sits in the NPS operational plan because we believe that this is a really important indicator of, of improving our services. So we're collecting a lot of data and what had happened, this was the first time we had put in this indicator and, and part of collection of data meant we needed to be engaging with other partners to, to um, get their um, you know, uh, views on, on the quality of cross, like magistrates, the police, etc. And last year with COVID, it was very difficult to, to move with this. So we put it in the NPS plan, but we're collecting a lot of data. And I'm glad the portfolio committee has got its eye on this. And so we're going to look at how we could uh, elevate this again. But once we organize ourselves, so we're better able to, to measure this, which is a really important part of our work. Thank you, Chair. I think, I think that covers everything. If there's anything that we haven't, except for those that we said we will um, respond in writing to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, members, are there any follow-ups? None. Oh, uh, okay. No, Honorable Nyehoi Trichen. Honorable Trichen. Let's but please be very brief. Yes, but... Honorable Swart. Okay. I, I... Char, it's it. Uh, who's uh, first? Honorable Swart. Um, Chair, just very briefly on the Steinhoff matter, I just appreciate the explanation. Um, I do understand that there were concerns expressed about um, possible conflicts of interest, but I think it, it just indicates to me the the severity of the funding constraints. I think it was a figure of 30 million rand um, that is given by the complainant company. So that's purely from my perspective, I'm not passing judgment or criticizing it. I understand the financial constraints. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, perhaps I missed the response. COVID-related expenses so far. Um, it's just that one update, uh, follow-up. I'm not sure, maybe I missed the response. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm told by my colleagues that it was 5.1 million. Is that correct? Yes. Mm. To, date. to date. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the... A uh, good APP uh, that you have presented. I think you will take into account the comments we have made um, to to try and relook at some of the issues, especially some of the figures. Um, uh, but I think it's a very good strategy. We are very uh, pleased with the progress that has been made. Um, Honorable Janji raised the point that uh, when you were nine months old, uh, the committee was very harsh. Uh, now you are two years, two months. It is. Uh, uh, She's a grown up. She's a grown up. It is less. It is less harsh. Uh, we can see the way that uh, you are. You are growing up uh, very nicely. Um, but I think it would be also important that uh, both yourselves and the NPA, uh, you need to work very closely on a bill that is going to deal with the independence of the NPA. Um, we, are, we are not in favor of uh, policies that are on the pipeline because uh, we would want to leave a fully independent NPA uh, when we finish our term of office. Um, so it would be good that we can have uh, that bill uh, prioritized. We are aware that we have to deal with uh, some three or four big bills uh, that, um, that are long overdue. Um, uh, the NPA, the independence of the NPA would be one of them. We will still have to work on the, on, on to, uh, to realign the public protector uh, 
act to be in line to be aligned to the constitution so we would want uh, uh, in fact we want to appeal to you and the npa to prioritize uh, that, that, that that bill because it's one of the issues that we would want to leave behind a fully independent and work towards a fully capacitated uh, npa um, because it's true that um, uh, within the justice uh, family, we have two entities that can raise uh, uh, money, uh, especially during this difficult economic period for the mm -hmm. state. That is the NPA, through your asset for future and others. And the and and the SIU. So it would be important that uh, those are fully capacitated because one of the challenges that uh, prosecutors all over the world are now faced with is that they are fighting criminals that are much more capacitated than them in terms of resources. That is one of the biggest challenges that uh, that, that uh, you are you that, that uh, prosecutors are faced with uh, uh, globally, uh, and those uh, those uh, criminals also include terrorists, who who have a lot of money that is going through the banking system. Now you would need to have highly capacitated prosecution services to be able to deal with those. Um, I think um, um, the issue that was raised by Honorable Janji that you are seen to be a transitional career as NPA, um, it could be seen both sides. Uh, I think we should also be very proud that uh, you are fitting into the system Yes. Um, two of the chief justices that we have had are mm. former prosecutors, including the current chief justice. Yes. Um, quite a number of judges are former prosecutors and quite a number of senior counsel in the private sector. So it's a, it's a I think it's a good transition. Uh, you will not be able to keep everybody I think, but you must try, and I'm happy that you are focusing on the wellness program, because I think uh, Honorable Breitenbach would also uh, bear with me that uh, one of the issues that we were grappling with when we were interviewing judges is the high stress in the profession. And it is not reserved only for judges, but even for prosecutors, it's a, high, it's a highly stressed uh, uh, environment. So your focus on the wellness program uh, is quite encouraging, but also it will also need resources um, because you need counseling services. We need quite a number of things to have a proper functioning wellness program that you can say it will alleviate uh, stress and also not uh, forced people to leave the profession. Or if they don't leave, they, they they, they start embarking on other tendencies that are counterproductive. So we are quite uh, we are quite uh, pleased generally with uh, with uh, with what we are seeing, and that uh, also you have almost your top management in terms of your deputy national directors and your special directors. It's quite stable now. Uh, that 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 is. Um, um, that is highly welcome, um, but we still think that uh, you are going. You might have to uh, move with speed to fill, for instance, the position of the director of public prosecution in the northwest. Um, um, we have seen in the last few weeks that there are quite a number of of your prosecutors who have been charged for for illegal activities. Um, we think that, that you are going to move with speed to start the processes to discipline them, um, but we are we are quite uh, pleased with the progress that you that you are making. Um, but we will be able to see most of it when we deal with the with the triple B 
be triple Rs, where you would be now accounting on the performance, on the performance of the last uh, financial year. Uh, but uh, I, we think that uh, your, your APPs, I think they are fit for purpose. Um, thank you very much. We don't want to overpromise on what we can do in terms of fighting for resources. It's not an easy fight. It's becoming more difficult every year. Um, but you, you know that uh, in principle, we do support uh, that mm -hmm. uh, you should, the, your budget should not be tempered with and the growth of your budget should also correspond to the responsibilities that you have. Mm -hmm. um, but that is what we, we, we will be taking forward as a fight on your behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and, and to the committee. Uh, firstly, Chair, we take all your points on board. Your point about the independence of the NPA is crucially important. And I'm pleased that the committee um, is aligned with our objective of, of leaving behind a, 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 f an, a truly independent NPA. So we look forward in, in further engagements with the committee to present our roadmaps, perhaps, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, achieving these, these uh, objectives. Um, Advocate Duplessy is engaging with the DG of Justice, who, as you know, is the accounting officer. And, and there's a lot. This is a very complex process, uh, but we're working very hard at, at trying to ensure that, that we are able to, to ensure a truly independent NPA when we, when we are no longer here and a protected NPA with the right frameworks in place and, and a very clear understanding of the role of the executive vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the NPA. So, so we look forward, we appreciate that support, Chair. Um, firstly, I want to thank my team uh, for all the good work that they've done. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm, ge I'm getting an Oscar award yet, uh, but uh, we, we are still in as much as we are on the right path, we are fully cognizant of the fact is that we are, we still demand so much more from ourselves. We are not, we are on the right track, but we know we have a lot more to deliver before we can say we have, we have achieved what we want to achieve. So there's a lot more um, that, you know, uh, pressure that we're putting on ourselves to deliver because we know how important this is. And finally, I want to thank the committee chair for, for the oversight and guidance. And, and we certainly look forward to, to more constructive engagements. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be writing to you soon. You remember we have an outstanding meeting to discuss that issue of uh, prosecutors who have complained uh, from the Eastern Cape in particular, uh, but we want that to be a, a standalone item so that we can discuss it in full. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, very Thank you much. honorable members. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. I think it was a very long day. Um, can we meet again on Tuesday? Uh, we will try and work uh, through the weekend to ensure that by Tuesday, we present the draft revised program. Thank you very much, members. Thank and you. To, and to everybody on the platform and to those who are watching, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I was trying to multitask here. I have an assignment due this afternoon. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chair. Have a good weekend.